Good morning. John is not with us today, but I am back. Good to see everybody. Give it a second while everybody comes in and we will get right to the trial. Good morning, everyone. We have uh, folks on the stand. So uh, let me get that pulled up right away. John will be with us uh, later on today. Coming up. Here we go. Well, that means that I take care of anybody that presents to the ER at Parkland. Parkland is the single busiest emergency department in the entire country. And it's, it's also known for where JFK was taken when he was shot. Oh, and so when I'm wearing my attending position, Hat in the ER. I am taking care of heart attacks or strokes or overdoses or trauma or snake bites, lacerations, anything that comes into the emergency department. Is Parkland Hospital a teaching hospital? It is. And who is it associated with? It is associated with the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. So do you work for Parkland Hospital or do you work for the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center? I am employed by the University of Texas Southwestern. Southwestern. And um, what do you do for the University of Texas Southwestern? I'm an associate professor. What does that mean? Class is it similar to what um, is in Milwaukee with Freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin? I believe so, yes. Um, so your duties at the University of Texas Southwest um, include being an associate professor? Yes. 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 And does it also include something as it relates to Parkland Hospital? Yes. The faculty that are University of Texas Southwestern faculty are the the physicians that staff Parkland. And the students that you teach, do they also work at the Parkland Hospital? Yes, the medical students, which are actually part of the university, will do rotations at Parkland. I wanna to talk to you about the education you needed in order to become an emergency room physician. Can you tell this jury a little bit about what that education was? I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, where I received my Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. I didn't get to watch much followed of by much going of to the Medical I did watch College some, of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia, where they play the Masters to get my MD degree. And then I went back to Dallas, Texas, where I did my three-year residency in emergency medicine, followed by a two-year fellowship in medical toxicology. Dr. Hill, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 111. I hear you. And uh, I mean, if you got to go watch Murdoch, I totally understand. Um, John and I just committed to watching the whole trial. We don't want to leave those. Want to... Dr. Hill, do you recognize that document? Hang it. Yes. And what is that? This is my CV. Now, when you introduced yourself and the work that you do to the jury, you said something about being board certified. Um, can you explain to us what board certified means? Yes, in order to be board certified in a certain specialty, you have to first do a residency. So that is following medical school. And then once you complete that residency, at least for emergency medicine, for me was three years, you have to pass a written test. 
and then you have to pass an oral board examination. And then you have to do that every 10 years with milestones along the way that you have to complete. And I think on your CV, it actually talks about your most recent um, board certification in emergency medicine. Yes, we have to renew that every 10 years. Now, I think you also said that you were board certified in medical toxicology. Yes. Explain to me how you're board certified in both emergency medicine and medical toxicology. Yes, I think that's kind of confusing for some people to grasp that. But just like a cardiologist might do a fellowship after internal medicine to specialize in hearts, or a neurologist can go on and do further specialty, or uh, a, a renal doctor can do a fellowship in kidneys, one of the fellowships that's available after emergency medicine is in medical toxicology. And toxicology is the study of poisons, but uh, as a medical toxicologist, I'm not working She's in a She's a pretty good witness setting. so far. She's good at Medical toxicologists explaining. specifically treat and manages poisoned patients. And because most poisonings are acute because they're emergencies and they frequently present to the emergency department setting, it is frequent that medical toxicologists will do an emergency medicine residency first. Now, you cannot go from medical school and do a medical toxicology fellowship. You actually have to do a residency in something first. So in order to become a medical toxicologist, you have to take um, an additional step in your education. Correct. And, and then you have to become board certified? Yes. Is board certification for medical toxicology the same as the emergency department? No, it's an additional certification, and it's a written test. That I think I'm just keeping it simple in terms of name for my chat. It's the trial junkies. Test to pass. Do you have to um, renew that every 10 years like you have to do in the other certification? Yes. Now, outside of the work that you do with the university and... For those just coming in, John should be joining us uh, soon. He had to... Well, some as stuff a medical morning, toxicologist, but the good news is I have all my stuff cleared Texas. up, so I'll be here for the rest of the trial. Um, John should be here for the rest of the trial, so you're going to get as both a medical of us, toxicologist. We work out of the North Texas Poison Center, which is associated with Parkland Hospital. And when you say the North Texas um, Poison Center, can you tell us what work you do for them? I think that a lot of people are familiar with poison centers. And probably in the sense, like, if you're a parent and your child drinks bleach under the sink or something like that, that um, you can call the Poison Center for advice. Yeah, maybe I need to the put some thought into that. The Poison Center is not staffed by telephone operators. They are actually staffed by what are called SPIs. Good morning, Carol. Which stand for Specialists of Poison Information. Hey, you so guys remember, I have... Um... And I have the full back end, so anybody that calls super chats, I can definitely pull up. Poisoning. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't understand make sure you hit that like button. is that make sure you share this out. We, call a poison we, got, some, as a we got another trial we're competing with now, region, so uh, you can any help we can get in the elder room is um, with a medical toxicologist such as myself super helpful. over the phone, and that happens every day. I do have Our Cash App. It is. Actually call just, it's, the Poison uh, Center the cash app for peg is just advice trial junkie. on the specific management uh, so I guess of a poisoned like patient. Cash tag. And how often just do learning you do it, that? But every the, other uh, month. Hashtag is trial and junkie. As part of I also learned that you have to actually accept payments um, others in a timely manner. <laughs> while you're working at the Poison Control Center? Yes. Every day except for Thursdays, we have what's called um, Poison Center Rounds. And we have medical students. We have emergency medicine residents that are on their toxicology rotation. We have some pediatric residents, some psychiatry residents, pharmacy students. And we even have individuals that come to train from other states. And so every morning during toxicology rounds, the cases that were called in to the poison center get discussed so that we can talk about how to appropriately manage these cases. Then it's followed by some classroom lectures and discussions, and it's a round table type of setting. So just so I'm clear, you're a physician for Parkland Hospital. Yes. 
And you're an adjunct professor for the university. An associate professor. An associate professor. You also work with the Poison Center of Texas. The North Texas Poison Center. Thank you. Um, <laughs> She's not getting As it relates right. to medical toxicology, do you do any work at the university as it relates to medical toxicology? Well, that's through the Poison Center. Now, going back to your board certifications, how many physicians are board certified in emergency medicine? Thousands. And how many um, physicians are board certified in medical toxicology? Far fewer, and don't hold me to the exact number today, but the last time I looked into it, it was somewhere over 300. And it's fair to say that some people may retire and then new people might be board Couldn't certified. Couldn't somewhere over 300 yes. be that's a that million? Might fluctuate? Yes. Have you ever testified in court as an expert in medical toxicology before? Yes. And do you know about how many times you've testified? Uh, so on Monday, that was my 34th time to testify in federal court. And I believe this is my 15th time to testify in state court. And that's as an expert in medical toxicology. And emergency medicine. Thank you. How many um, of those cases were criminal cases? Uh, most of them. And in the criminal cases you testified, how many times have you testified for the prosecution or the federal government? Many times. Most of the time, my... Yeah, my, I totally um, get it, Jane Michael. I was just kind of making what... The uh, Department of Justice for with regards lack to of federal drug crime. And I speech. Uh, most frequently have testified for the prosecution. As a medical toxicologist, when you're retained as an expert to review a case, are you paid? Yes. And when you're an expert for the government or the prosecution, are you paid? Yes. And in this particular case, um, are you getting paid for your time? I am. And when we say getting paid for your time, what does that include? Is it just testifying? No, it is anything that I'm doing that takes time so that includes reviewing case materials, writing a report, discussing the case with attorneys, travel time, uh, testifying in court, anything that takes time pertaining to the case, including research. And that would be true in the cases you've testified for. Hey, the thanks for the donation, Stephanie. Mr. Jensen's case. Yes. Dr. Hale, I want to go back to your um, curriculum vitae. Um, have you correct? Have you ever conducted any trainings? Yes, I have over time been involved in teaching assistant U.S. attorneys, FBI agents, DEA agents um, around the country, like at Quantico, Virginia, uh, tra training law enforcement officers about toxicology and drugs. And when you say training um, law enforcement officers on toxicology, toxicology and drugs, what specifically have you trained them on? Well, mainly to understand that any drug overde overdose death, that scene is a crime scene. And that the kinds of things that I, as a medical toxicologist and as a physician, would look for in rendering a toxicologic cause of death opinion and trying to help law enforcement to understand what kinds of things would be important to me. Because I, I think a lot of law enfor for enforcement for a number of years felt like cause of death was based on just a post-mortem drug level. And there's more to it than that. And so things at the scene that are important and to gather that information uh, is part of what I teach them. And have you done that in drug cases? In drug cases, yes. Um, have you done that in any tox toxin cases, poisons? Well, I, I guess technically drugs are poisons, so Fair. yes. Um, Dr. Hale, this jury heard that Dr. Mary Mainlin is a forensic patho pathologist, and you've told us that you are a medical um, toxicologist. What's the difference? Well, a forensic pathologist is specifically trained in the field of pathology. I like it. And her. so pathology involves looking under the microscope at different tissues and determining if now something I just is can't cancerous wait to hear what or looking has at stay. blood smears and determining if the blood counts are normal. 
And then they go on to do a fellowship in being a medical examiner, and that's specifically to perform autopsies. And that is not what I do. I am not a forensic pathologist. I don't do autopsies. I manage living poisoned patients. And my job is to make sure that my patients don't meet the medical examiner. And um, do you need a forensic pathologist or medical examiner to determine a cause of death every time a patient dies? No, most of the time death certificates are, are signed by a patient's primary care physician or a nursing home physician. Any physician can render a cause of death opinion because a cause of death opinion is after all a medical diagnosis. However, there are certain laws around certain types of cases that require a medical examiner to perform an autopsy, but the vast majority of deaths don't require that. And everybody gets a death certificate and it must be signed by a physician, but it's not always a medical examiner. Right. Dr. Hill, as a um, physician in the emergency department, as well as a medical toxicologist, how many ethylene glycol poisoning patients have you treated? I knew you were going to ask me that, and I really don't have any way to give an exact number, but I would have to say over the course of my career, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20. And those patients that you have treated, do you know um, how they came to consume ethylene glycol? Most of them are either accidental or suicidal, and there was one that I believe was homicidal. How do you treat a patient Less than 30 with minutes. glycol poisoning? Do they all die? John Boy no, will go crazy don't. soon and enough. How do you treat them? Well, we have a very specific antidote that is called famepazole. And I think we'll talk about this more later, but it is it is a specific antidote to treat an ethylene glycol poisoning. And then we also can treat them with hemodialysis. So as it relates to your work as a medical toxicologist, which is what you're here for today, have you testified in previous drug overdose cases? Yes. And have you testified in previous ethylene glycol poisoning cases? Yes. And do you know how many times you've testified in ethylene glycol cases? Twice before today. Interesting. So she's actually Dr. testified. Kelly, I want to talk to you about the work that, that you did in the Anti freeze cases. Case. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 112. Thank you. Dr. Hale, do you recognize that exhibit? I do. And what is that? This is my report that I prepared in this case. I want to talk to you about some of the information in the report that you prepared in this case. And one of the things I want to talk to you about is the methodology you use when you receive a case file um, and the work that you do in order to come up with um, an opinion. Can you tell us a little bit about that methodology? Guys, I'm going to bring up the quality well, real quick. It might be a when I'm second, asked but it's to going to be worth it. a toxicology-related case, I'm being asked a death, death a pin. And even though I am a medical toxicologist, I am first and foremost an emergency physician. So I don't approach the, the cause of death just with toxicology blinders on. I first rule out traumatic causes of death, which is important in any death case. Secondly, looking for natural causes of death, including what someone's underlying medical history is, which is of course important, followed by the findings on the autopsy. Thirdly, considering an arrhythmia. An arrhythmia is an abnormal heart rhythm. And once somebody dies, there's nothing you can see on autopsy that says an arrhythmia occurred. So in medicine, we call it a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you don't find anything else on the autopsy. And so looking at the circumstances may lead you to believe an arrhythmia occurred. And then finally, looking at the toxicology causes of death, 
which includes, of course, looking at what is in the post-mortem toxicology testing, but not hanging your hat on the exact number because you have to correlate the findings in the toxicology test post-mortem with perimortem circumstances. And do you review any um, police reports or discovery? Yes, it's important to review police reports, the obviously the autopsy report, the toxicology testing, and scene photos, and of course nowadays looking at cell phone footage, cell phone text messages, social media accounts, everything goes into that methodology. And in Mr. Jensen's case, did you review all those materials you just discussed with the jury? Hey, big shout out to all Minus of you who are here. I know there's another big trial going on. Pre we appreciate you all being your report, here. Your review Make sure you your, hit the like button. Um, explanation of um, those things. Yes. I know John thought that so he might not be alive this morning um, because he, glycol. Is where I was at was up toxic? in the air. So uh, make sure you hit that like in button. In and of so itself, it is not. Know, uh, and as a medical live. toxicologist who also teaches um, as an adjunct professor, I think you might be in the best position to teach this jury a little bit about how ethylene glycol becomes toxic. Yes. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to give you a my handheld microphone um, and ask you to tell us the stages in which ethylene glycol turns into a toxin. Okay. Okay. I feel like we already did this with other experts, but maybe she's going to say it happens differently. Or maybe she's just, I guess she's just going to show that she can She's building trust, building rapport with the jury here. Is this working? Yes. Oh, man. All right. Okay, so it's first important to understand the... This is going to be awkward. Now, this is not me being condescending. This is exactly how we teach our doctors in training at the Poison Center. So first, what I want you to understand. Hey, Jay Michael, if you can respond to that. And have that would be awesome. Is, talk, is a toxicologist a subset of a pathologist? That substance is ethanol. My gut is yes, but let's see if Jay Michael can answer that better for us. After you drink ethanol, an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which I'm going to abbreviate as ADH. See, my gut was completely wrong. It is not a substance. Metabolizes ethanol it's a totally to acid aldehyde. I guess that would make sense. It's She kind of explained that. I just didn't think through it. And Take then it an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. which I'm going to abbreviate as ALDH, metabolizes this aldehyde to acetate, which is also known as acetic acid, which is the chemical in vinegar. Now, our bodies are specifically trained or designed to take that substance off and detoxify it through something called the Krebs cycle, which is not important. But just so you know, this is what makes ethanol not toxic to humans. Now, let's talk ethylene glycol. Now, the reason why I underlined the OL is because that's the chemistry way of knowing that something is an alcohol. So with ethylene glycol, it must go through the enzyme ADH. This is the 
Tonight. A toxicologist and for the uh, that defense. makes a compound called glycoaldehyde. And now glycoaldehyde goes through aldehyde dehydrogenase, and it ultimately makes yes, glycolic acid. This is a this is a good witness just from like glyoxylic acid. I'm sure if we're all like wanting this info, the jury does too. And oxalic acid. And, and it's a good thing for Not the defense to be bringing this, on. But it's critical in understanding. So, just as ethanol causes somebody to become drunk, that is what ethylene glycol does. Is it because it's an alcohol? will cause you to become drunk. What is she waiting for? So when we're talking about glycolic acid, glyoxylic acid, glyoxylic acid and oxalic acid, why is it important to understand that ethylene glycol becomes those three acids? So what's critical to understand here is our Krebs cycle does not siphon away these acids out of our body. And so it is the accumulation of these acids in our body that make ethylene glycol to be known as a toxic alcohol. This is a uh, defense witness, a toxicologist for the defense. What's even more important to understand is these are enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase. These are the enzymes that make ethylene oh, glycol. I've seen more ginger snaps so come on in. So make sure we're hitting that like button. Tell everybody we're here. I know there was a little bit of a question if we would be here this morning that or not. Harms please, our body. Please, please hit that like and button so and tell everybody These enzymes that we're here. are different in different people. Some work faster in some people. Also, make sure. Sure, you have notifications slower. turned on on Jiro Bang La, so that when things get a little Asians weird, we don't know if we're going to be here. You alcohol? have a notification to let you know that we are That's here. That's because they have an issue with their aldehyde dehydrogenase. So this gets stuck back here, and it accumulates, and that causes them to flush more. This is also the compound that makes somebody feel a hangover. So... This is the rate-determining step. If any of you ever took chemistry, even high school chemistry, you might remember the rate-determining step. And so it's not like you can drink a bunch of ethylene glycol and drop dead all of a sudden, or even in a short period of time, because you have to wait for this alcohol dehydrogenase to do its first step. Now, people may ask, Interesting. and they do, how long does that take? And the answer is, it's different in different people. Give us Because a we are all not range. the same. But it can take up to several hours. And so this whole process takes time. This is why ethylene is in the not a death. Good morning, everyone coming in. Good to see you all. So, Dr. Hale, if Thanks I for being a here. big amount, 30, 50 milliliters of ethylene glycol, I wouldn't immediately die? No. Why not? Because of these steps that have to happen, you have to wait in line as an ethylene glycol molecule for the attention of alcohol dehydrogenase to convert you to something toxic. And the interesting thing, just so you understand this concept of alcohol dehydrogenase, is in the olden days, before there was this antidote for ethylene glycol poisoning called femepazole, we treated ethylene glycol poisoning with ethanol, with the hope that it would compete for the attention of alcohol dehydrogenase. I've heard that. And so 
believe it or not, back in the olden days, if somebody accidentally drank ethylene glycol, perfect first aid would get them to be drinking whiskey on the way to the emergency department because it competes for this molecule, this enzyme. It actually kind of worked from what I understand. Dr. Hill, you talked a little bit about this medication that is used to treat ethylene glycol. Uh, poisoning, right? Yes. And what is that called again? Bamepazole. Bamepazole. Is that F-O-M-E-P-I-Z-O-L-E? -E? Yes, bamepazole. Works right here. Dr. Hill, we heard from Dr. Mainland that if someone gets medical intervention, it would mean that the amount of ethylene glycol in their blood would decrease. Is that consistent with the information you know? That is incorrect. And can you tell us what bimepazole does as it relates to ethylene glycol poisoning and why that would be incorrect? Sure. So as I have pointed out, this is the rate determining step for this conversion. Bimepazole blocks ADH. So this is good info, but I still kind of have a question where the defense it. goes with it. So her. as you can imagine, if you block this, you're keeping all of the Because right now glycol you could be looking at this as, as a, ethylene as, glycol. Okay, so this is so how it is completely the poison that Mark Jensen intuitive gave his wife killed her. And wrong that giving bimepazole we need to see where they go the ethylene with glycol this. level it actually makes the ethylene glycol stick around longer. In fact, if you went out to drink at a bar and you happened to take Femepazole before you went, you would stay intoxicated a lot longer because the ethanol would stick around a lot longer. Now that would be a very expensive night because Femepazole can be $1,000 to $2,000 <laughs> a vial. But still. She ruined my plan real quick. So if Femepazole works <laughs> She here, read my mind on that one. <laughs> at the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme, it keeps ethylene glycol as ethylene glycol. And it makes this stay around longer because we don't care that it's there. And even though... This transformation generally happens in the liver. A good percentage of ethylene glycol, maybe let's say 20%, but of course that can vary, will go into the urine as ethylene glycol. And so giving femepazole helps shunt this pathway of ethylene glycol going out in your pee as opposed to going through ADH to turn into these toxic acids. So the medication actually keeps the ethylene glycol in your system. You all think she's right. going to say, it, well, uh, it. it actually keeps it. Thank you for attending my TED, TED talk at the end of this. And that's in hopes of keeping totally it from feels becoming like a the acid. Exactly. And is that because the acid is the toxin? Exactly. So someone who is given the medication is actually going to have ethylene glycol in their system longer. It's not going to be less ethylene glycol. Correct. But it's going to force it to not, the other for thing, lack of a better way of saying it, metabolize. Talk about, um, is the acids that we have, when they become toxins, um, we heard Dr. Mainland talk about um, a body being acidic. Is this that point? Yes. And so I know that you guys have probably heard about the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. And I want you to understand that the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning are theoretical boundaries. Why, okay. why do you say they're theoretical boundaries? Because if you kind of think about, I think a good example is for those of you who have may maybe studied history, and they talk about certain ages in historical time, it's not like you go from medieval times or the Middle Ages Good analogy. and boom, on December There's 13th, overlap. 1453, it turns into the Renaissance or something like that, okay? They are designed to help understand what was going on. The same is true in these stages. 
And so the first stage. She could straight up lecture at university. She's pretty good at that part. I don't. Is when this ethylene glycol is just floating good. around as ethylene Fence glycol. This or not yet. And so this not is doing where bad. we get drunk. Now, drunk is not a medical term. So we would call this central nervous system intoxication. Now, it's not like all the ethylene glycol went away and stage one is over. And now, yeah, good point, Jay Michael. I think she four, did. She we are going into stage university. two. Clearly, she does. She's good. Now, stage two, name called the respiratory phase. Um, I like to think of it more as the acid phase. And I don't know that John Boy has to cross her on this part. In their blood, what I'm curious is what she's going to actually an say in favor of the defense. And so None the this first helps the defense really. I don't think any of this is actually in dispute. Is this glycolic acid? And this is what starts contributing to the acidosis. And this glycolic acid can stick around for a long time, but it also gets transformed to these other acids. So in this stage, as you become more acidotic for any reason in medicine, like if you've ever heard of diabetic ketoacidosis, mm -hmm. your pH, which is normally 7.4, will start going down and in severe diabetics with acidosis, I've seen them go down to 6.9. And the same thing can happen in ethylene glycol. And if you know anything about chemistry, you might think this is not a huge change, but it is. Every time you go from 7.4 to 7.3 to 7.2, it has profound effects on your body. Interesting. And one of the things that our body likes to do to breathe off an acid is breathe faster. So you're going to hyperventilate. To try to breathe off this acid. It sounds like I missed an interesting day for John Boy yesterday. And then finally. You start but developing the being distracted acid. allowed me to uh, get stuff in order so I can be here with you all for the future. So I guess it was worth it. Guys, and I'm not pulling up as many chats. I am reading them. My system's a little bit unstable right now. Um, in our body, I'll keep sending them with the actuals. I'm definitely still reading them calcium. and we'll still respond to them verbally. Um, Oxalate. Super chats come in. I will make sure that they come Crystals. up. Uh, despite the little bit of unstable and these go connection. everywhere, okay? But where you hear it most about depositing would be in the kidneys. So, Dr. Hill, I have a couple questions as we're going through the stages. You just said that, like, when we transform, you know, to different eras in history, um, it's not like four hours, eight hours, 12 hours. How come we don't know exactly when someone is out of stage one and in stage two? Good or question. Out of stage two and in stage three. Well, first of all, it comes down to how fast somebody's alcohol dehydrogenase works for them. There are genetic variations, there are differences in sex. And so there are reasons why this can vary from person to person. The other thing is that. In a living person, there are labs that we can send that help us know which stage somebody is in. And we have some post-mortem labs on Julie Jensen, but many of the labs that I would look at when I'm treating a living patient are not able to be done in a dead patient. And so it makes it a little bit harder to discern exactly which stage we're in. And as I'll explain in a moment, 
It's not like all of a sudden you go from one to the next. These are gonna have some overlap. And there are times when I have individuals that still have a lot of ethylene glycol in their blood, but they, they are already developing an acidosis and they may have calcium oxalate in their kidneys. So it's fair to say from what you just explained to us that the stages can overlap. Absolutely. Are there studies? I still don't know what they're um, going to try to prove with this. The stages in super interesting. I think I would still say super relevant. No. I'm just super One curious. One of the problems with medical toxicology see where they go with this. is the ethical issues with doing studies in patients. So I would not be allowed to administer ethylene glycol to all of you and then start drawing blood. That would be frowned upon. And so we don't do that in medicine. So it's very, very difficult to define what is an exact lethal dose. Uh, we, we can look at past studies and past ingestions, but there are no studies that truly help define that. So I want to get to what you were talking about in stage two when the oxalic acid teams with calcium. And you said it's at that point that we get these crystals. Cha, is anyone hearing anything yes. that she and says that contradicts that what either ME said? So bad for the human body. In my mind, no, but you well, guys have such good attention. Throw anything out that if you electrolyte or mineral hear, in our body. Think of anything that and is contradictory. There are a lot of enzymes in our body kind of like alcohol dehydrogenase is an enzyme, we have many others that depend on calcium. Our heart beating depends on calcium. Our muscles moving depend on calcium. And so as I would this absolutely take a class from her. Sink, she's a, up she's the good. Calcium body. And that is going to make the calcium circulating in our blood and in our body go really low. And this can precipitate things like seizures and abnormal heart rhythm. Okay, rhythms. we're of the same mind. And if you develop an abnormal heart rhythm. Not, not contradictory, but she's definitely more nuanced. And um, is and it called arrhythmia? And arrhythmia. Better at explaining things. So when the oxalic acid teams up with calcium, well, bet, mommy, it's basically. The ME really didn't know what they're the talking about. I'll give body. you that. Yes. I think that's very fair. And it's that taking the calcium from our body that we need need from these seizures or arrhythmia yes and what happens if you get an arrhythmia you can drop dead now after stage two um and i know there's no set time or and these stages can overlap the inpatients this is the most common stage for people to die in if untreated but if you make it to stage three, this is called the renal yep, We have phase. a brilliant chat. You guys are all on the exact same page as me. And this is Not where contradictory, the much more clear calcium much more oxalate nuanced. crystals that have deposited in the kidneys. Now, I already told you these crystals can deposit everywhere. They can go to the brain, they can go to the heart but specifically in the kidneys, straight to the heart. they can deposit and cause destruction. Now, I know that you guys saw a pathological slide of the renal tubules with those crystals in them. Those crystals are like kidney stones in a way. Ugh. If you've ever had a kidney stone and it's ripping apart in, in your collecting duct system, it's causing bleeding, it's causing destruction. This is happening at a more microscopic level. And so it I had my first kidney stone at these very critical renal old. tubules. And Terrible. you get renal failure. Once you're in both of these stages, Femepazole doesn't do much good anymore. Because you're past. Are we having quality issues on the video? I'm not seeing anything, but. And once you're here, you have dialysis. 
Dr. Oh, Hill, no. have you treated? Yeah, I'm going to drop um, down quality just a little bit again. Um, we might spin. Yes, and again, remember I just wasn't seeing any issues. Sorry. So I have had patients in stage two that have developed renal injury, but of course because I have a new computer on the way. Setting, we are going to um, treat it's not them actually the internet; it's my dialysis. computer. But I have a new one on the way. And those patients that you have had in stage two, drop stage audio three, on both just a little bit. Let's hope that helps. Um, can Sorry you about tell that us what the mental status? of those patients were was so we've obviously talked about how in stage one you have this drunk hopefully this helps a little bit and that is alter and when john status, comes back we're switched to using his machine about being drunk so that will alcohol. fix all of it just because you're drunk doesn't mean that you can't do stuff okay in fact unfortunately there are people that drink and drive and some more successfully than others but the point is, is that this is nothing more than being drunk. When you get to these stages, there is nothing about being acidotic that makes you comatose or completely out of your mind. I see plenty of diabetic ketoacidosis patients that become acidotic and they're sick and they're uncomfortable and they're miserable, but I can still talk to them as a physician and have a doctor-patient conversation. So there's nothing about the mental status specifically yeah, So the kidney stones, I had the first one at 17, had several after this, that. And then I went to a brilliant urologist who told me to drink uh, in a, in lime juice in my water. To and I haven't had one in stuff. 15 years. Now, there are times when these calcium oxalate crystals can deposit in the brain and cause swelling, and that would cause some altered mental status. And in the end stages of renal failure, where a compound called BUN or your blood urea nitrogen, this is a test that you get when you go for a physical at your doctor to check your kidneys. If this goes, really, I haven't really seen high, or heard anything from CCW today. Then this um, can cause some altered mental status. If I hear anything, I will definitely give you all an uh, update. Being acidotic, maybe his uh, having these compounds present doesn't render you comatose and unable to to do things. We heard from Dr. Mainland that Miss um, Jensen had some mental status impairment. Um, on December 2nd and December 3rd. Is that caused by the ethylene glycol and the acidosis? It is not caused by the acidosis. It can be caused by several things. One, <clears throat> ethylene glycol that was still ethylene glycol and had not been transformed yet. And then there were several other medications present that really cloud the picture about her mental status, including Ambien, including Librium, including Benadryl, and to a much lesser extent, Paxil. Now, someone who is in right, this is getting acidosis, um, are they immobile? Are they unable to like walk or get up? No. Are they unable to have a conversation? They can have a conversation. And would it be, would someone in acidosis be able to use a telephone? Yes. Would they be able to use a computer? Yes. Okay. This is where they're going with this. Now, as a medical toxicologist, you're also familiar with Ambien. I am. And can you tell us a little bit about how Ambien could cause um, a change in mental status? Ambien is a medication. The generic name is Zolpidem. And... It works at certain receptors in your brain to make you go to sleep. Now, one of the strange things about this medication is that if you don't take it when you are literally in bed to fall asleep and your idea is I'm going to go do some things, I'm going to take it, go do some things, and then go to bed, there have been many, many stories and anecdotes about individuals 
night sleeping, yeah. making sandwiches in the middle of the night. I've heard ambulance going out totally naked and funny. partying in the street, and in some very unusual cases, committing murders. Holy crap! So Ambien has a unique effect on different people to cause them to behave in unusual ways. Thank you. Is there anything else on the chart that you want to show? You guys are such an awesome chat. The, um, such good change of friends. ethylene glycol into acidosis into um, death. I'm going to flip the page real quick to demonstrate something. And speaking of that, there's even more of you here now. Make sure you hit that like button. Um, if you do share videos so out, I'm going to make share it. I know John wasn't exactly clear on if we were going to be live right away this morning. And so let's make sure time. all of our friends know that we're live. And this is going to be concentration. So at this time zero, this is where somebody drinks ethylene glycol. And after well, a that's certain not period time, of time zero. 30 minutes to four hours. Well, I guess you could have you're going to have an ethylene glycol level. Okay. Sorry. That's high. The data of And then as time goes on. Plan. And alcohol dehydrogenase works, and aldehyde dehydrogenase works. It's going to start causing this ethylene glycol level to decrease. Now, it does Literally? not go to zero in a minute. Okay, it doesn't just drop off. So this stage one, where you have ethylene glycol in your body, is going to last a while. It could last a day. It could last longer. So that's what I mean that these theoretical stages don't have a defined starting and stopping place. Now, as this ethylene it's glycol somebody... undergoes metabolism, true sticks. Um, this I, acids. I'm with you. Like this is getting a little bit slow. The jury may start yeah, be losing this. I think acids start we're all, increasing. We're all super interested in things like this, so I think. And so they will go us, from non-existent. Sure, you might be. And get higher might be and higher as the ethylene glycol goes down. So, the mistake that some people make is yeah. to compare. Anthony. Yeah, if anyone wants to know what Anthony is talking about, go check my. Uh, and people that. Twitter account out. Did it in a suicidal just, way. I'm trying to think. This is John's channel, so I'm not going there at all. they were all. working in their garage. Or it was administered to them in a homicidal way. And compare what those levels are. Morning, Becky. Which is ridiculous. Thanks for being here. Because unless you take every single one of those cases and check what the level was. Again, I'm not pointing up chats time, as much because... It doesn't My video has been clicky for everybody. Because if somebody were um, to but I am still to reading them and will still verbally respond. Early on, say here, their level is going to be high. And if this person died from methylene glycol poisoning and they were in a later stage, their level is going to be low. So there is no way to just look at. Yeah. Yeah, go and check out my Twitter. It's that trial junkie call. And <laughs> say, this is a suicide. <laughs> go check out my Twitter. This is a homicide. Find it. Or this was cool. accidental. No, it's uh, Twitter's at Dr. trial Taylor, junkie Are call. you telling us that looking at the levels of ethylene glycol in the blood or in the ga gastric content or some other location in the body is not how you determine the manner of death? Correct. So in this part, you can you can sit down if you're done. Say that. What did she say? But I reserve my right to get back up and draw something if I have to. That's of fair. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> I hate people making jokes in court. I don't know why. It just rubs me the wrong way. Either side. I get to get.
Excuse me, Dr. Hale, we heard that Julie Jensen had 55 milligrams per milliliter or 5.5 milligrams per deciliter in her blood at the time of her death. Is that indica does that indicate a second dose to you? No. Why not? Well, first let me say that the level 5.5 milli milligrams per deciliter. That's how we talk. Not a bad, I, I totally get where you're coming from and not when you hit that we like milligrams per deciliter. Your friend. 5.5 milligrams per deciliter. Like... I'm not even sure would show up on our send out test for ethylene glycol. It depends on the laboratory, I suppose. But we would not really consider treating somebody if that was their level, provided they didn't have any of the other metabolic derangements and calcium oxalate and stuff. So that level in and of itself would tell me not to treat a patient. We don't consider treating until above 20 milligrams per deciliter or dialysis anywhere from 30 to 50 milligrams per deciliter. So not a breast this level <laughs> of 5.5 milligrams per deciliter in the setting of knowing that there were calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney absolutely tells you that she was somewhere in stage two, if not even moving into stage three. And because that level was so low, and was actually undetectable by the first lab. Mm. We know that she was very far into her poisoning. We also heard that there was about a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol in her stomach, gastric contents. Does that indicate, based upon the toxicology you've reviewed in this case, that there was a second dose? No. Why not? I'm not going to do the calculations to prove it to you. No, do. But prove it. And I think it's already been stipulated that it is about a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol. Now, unless several minutes to an hour or so prior to her death, there was a consumption of a little bit of ethylene glycol, which could have happened. I believe that this was a remnant of a prior dose. The upcoming cross and just got interesting. This is not, whatever was left, or even if there was a second dose, there was not enough in the blood to be clinically significant. And so I believe that this is just a remnant of a prior dose. So, Dr. Hill, if I took a half teaspoon of ethylene glycol, would I need medical intervention in order to um, metabolize, absorb and metabolize and then eliminate that ethylene glycol? No. How come? That is a very small amount. I know that there was shown a NyQuil container, and that was about 30 wow. cc's. And... 30 cc's is certainly an amount that can cause you to be toxic, meaning make you go through these stages. When we talk about a lethal dose, we actually don't know what is exactly a lethal dose because I already told you that we don't do those studies. Yeah. You don't it is kill thought that a potential lethal dose would be one to two milliliters per kilogram. So a potential lethal dose in somebody who is 70 kilograms would be about 70, or it could be 140. So it's one to two milliliters per kilogram. We're talking about a half a teaspoon, which is a very, very small amount and how many milliliters is it that is likely not going to cause you to become toxic and it is certainly not enough to be lethal so 
I heard you say kilograms, but I don't really understand what that means. Can you put that in a way that maybe I would understand? <laughs> I'm American. I don't know what a kilogram yes, is. Yes, because in the United States, we do pounds. Correct. Of course, in medicine, we do kilograms. Of course, in the but rest of we, everything. <laughs> the quick way that I do it in my head is you take how many pounds you are and you can divide it by two mm. and get a ballpark. It's technically divide by 2.2, Yeah, but we're doing math. That's a so ballpark was... way of doing it. That's good for me to know for the doctor's office. I appreciate that. I have a question about. I, I, I wish it would be a little more specific about this. Based upon the toxicology that you've reviewed, can you determine the date and the time and the amount of the dose? No. In a living patient, can you determine that? No. What do you have to rely on in a living patient to determine the date, the time, and the dose? Well, even in a living patient, we, and unless they tell you, um, it's difficult to pinpoint to an exact time. However, in a living patient, like I alluded to earlier, there are laboratory tests that we can send that will help delineate which stage somebody is in. And those are not tests that can be performed on a dead person. So it makes it a little bit more difficult in a dead person to define where these stages occurred and to map it backwards. But in the case of Julie Jensen, I don't have the benefit of anti-mortem or before she died blood work, but I know Three important things. Number one, her level was almost undetectable. Look, I love how your brain works. He implying might implying later really on in her stage of poisoning. Number two, there were calcium oxalate crystals present in her kidneys and possibly other places that say that she was at least in stage two, if not moving into stage three. And thirdly, that she died. I want to just go back a second. If you answer this, please um, just explain it to me again. How is there still ethylene glycol in the blood if oxalic crystals are in her kidneys? So going back to this chart. It overlaps. The ethylene glycol is going down little by little over time, it does not precipitously drop off to zero. So you're going to expect a small amount in the blood still, even though you have been making these acids. So when you treat a living patient that is in either stage two or stage three, which you know from the testing you do, um, have you found ethylene glycol in their blood? Yes. And in that situation where there's ethylene glycol in the blood still, we would give both femepazole and if they had acids in their blood and calcium oxalate in their urine, we would also dialyze them. We would do both. If someone is acidotic, I think you talked about they would be trying to breathe out the acid. Yes. Mm -hmm. And would someone continue to do that until they were no longer acidotic? Yes, of course, in, in a situation like this, being untreated, it's not going to necessarily get better. The breathing out the acid isn't necessarily going to get better. Correct. It's not going to make somebody better because they're breathing out the acid. Right. It's your body trying to compensate However, if somebody is in a late, late stage or if their calcium has gone so low and they are getting much sicker, they may wow, start. Sounds like I got a couple of new slower. subscribers already this morning. Thanks, you all. Um, Doctor, does the toxicology Anthony just the in link. this case tell you Please the go over, subscribe to me. We do the same thing on my channel that we're doing yes. here right now. We watch that? trials. The cause uh, of death is ethylene. Fairly new channel. Poisoning. We've watched two trials and over there. The Aaron Dean in this trial. Case give you a manner and of the death uh, to a Angela Hawk trial. Of, um, Both are in a playlist. So you can go check those out. 
And now that I'm back and ready to rock, there will be on-demand videos coming. Medical certainty or probability? No. What would your opinion be to a reasonable degree of medical hey, thanks certainty for subscribing, and probability not as it relates to the manner of death? I love that name, by the way. Well, I would say it is undetermined. And the reason is that if somebody died by an overdose of pills and you found 20 pills in the stomach, that is most likely a suicide. Unless, of course, somebody had a gun to their head and somebody was saying, here, take this pill, here, take this pill, here, take this pill. That would make sense. Because ethylene glycol is a liquid and because it doesn't take a lot to cause toxicity and even death, it can be administered in a suicidal fashion or it can be administered in a homicidal fashion. But there is nothing in looking at an autopsy in a ethylene glycol poisoning case that is going to tell you whether it is a suicide or a homicide or an accident by virtue of the fact that this is a liquid. And so just by staying strict to the science and strict to the toxicology, you cannot determine just by the science what the manner of death is. And so I would say that the manner of death is undetermined. Can you determine just from the science whether Ms. Jensen had more than one dose of ethylene glycol? No. And is that to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability? Yes. Like I said, I can't tell if a few minutes before her death, there was a small amount administered. It could not have been a large amount because there was nothing in her blood. Undetectable, a small, tiny amount. Okay, I, I was... So that's why I say that you cannot Struggling to understand help. that. That makes sense. But more so, just because there could potentially be more than one administration of ethylene glycol doesn't prove that it's homicidal or suicidal. A suicidal person can take more than one dose as well. So the premise that more than one dose occurred, which I don't believe is in reasonable medical certainty, but even if it did, it still does not tell you what is the manner of death. Doctor, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 113. Becky says we have 62 watching and 44 likes. Guys, please go hit that like button. Um, we were a little fuzzy on if we were going to be live this morning. We're here, so let's make sure all our friends know that we're here. The best way to do that, unless you have Dr. a platform to share on, is to hit that like button. Consistent with the Please information that like provided button. to the jury on the whiteboard? <clears throat> yes, it's a little bit more detailed, but the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the, what I showed is a simplification of this. Sure, thank you. All right, we're at 46 likes now. Just please, please go hit it. We're competing with the I'm gonna mark big the trial, but want to be here for you all. So as exhibits, it helps shine out um, a lot. So we have them for the record. Speaking of that, remember, do just because he's not here um, doesn't mean you I can't. Have no questions. Since super chats in, I'll make sure he knows about each and every one. And despite uh, my system issues, I will still make sure I pull up any super chats that come in. You want to mark them together, both pages? So people are hitting the like button because now we have more people watching. That's crazy. So guys, Cause and effect. Exhibits 111, 112, 113, and 114. Welcome to everybody. Uh, just subject coming to cross. In. Good to see you all. Do you want that exhibit left up there, Mr. Jamboys? I do. Thank you. Here we go. Or everybody was just waiting for Jamboys Cross. But it's been marked for the record. <clears throat> How is that marked? That's a demonstrative. This course is so weird. Anytime you're ready, Mr. Jambos. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's um, go. Good morning, Dr. Hale. Good morning. Welcome to Wisconsin. Thank you. 
Uh, I must say that um, I'm very impressed with your background, with your history, your education. That's not a question, and John Boy. Professional qualifications. Um, so your your family must be very proud of you. What the? F are, are your parents? He's such yes. a weirdo. Aren't they? I bet. Do you have proud parents? Of you, I mean, it's well, quite a spectacular <laughs> array. Of, he asked, "Do you have parents?" Uh, no, I got here through your immaculate conception. Experience. Fucking idiot. I think you might be the most ex most qualified <laughs> defense expert I've ever encountered in my career. Okay, these aren't questions. So congratulations on that. What but I have is some questions, wrong? nonetheless. And I told defense this guy is such it was going to be short, but I think it might be a little bit longer than I'd anticipated. Oh my god! My apologies. Your <laughs> test stopped. Um, Oh, so let's start so with um, this Sorry, whole thing about John, differential but... diagnosis. You said that you train uh, emergency room physicians in this? Yes. And so you'll stand by the bedside of a patient and you'll go through their history and that's, that's to assist you and, and your students in making a differential diagnosis. Yes. And um, yeah, Jay, so that was, when you're, that was you train your was students creepy. when they're doing this differential diagnosis, that it's important to get as much information as you can that's relevant to making that diagnosis. Yes. And if you leave out important information, um, that may adversely affect the reliability of the differential diagnosis. Yes. Um, let, let's do an example um, of an analysis of, we'll, we'll take my favorite meal. Um, Your favorite what? My favorite meal. Okay. So, and I bet your husband and I might have something in common in this regard, what unless he's a vegetarian. What is wrong um, with he's I, not, Trust me, we're from Texas. Okay. <laughs> so, good. Then. She, she so knows my she's going to My favorite fire meal would probably consist of two glasses of a nice dry red wine, like a Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, no, he's from Texas. An he eight or 10 whiskey. ounce uh, bone in ribeye steak and a baked potato with sour cream on it. Um, what a pretentious now, as ass. A, Medical toxicologists, you're familiar with the you guys, contents just, of just, that kind of a meal, right? Made yes. sure and you're a lot more of our friends knew we were alive by hitting that like body. button. Keep doing Correct. it. Yes. So let's talk about the good things in a bottle, in a glass, two glasses of red wine. Um, there are What are some of the good things in a glass of red wine? Antioxidants. Well, far outweighed by the alcohol. I'm glad you asked because I actually like to study this kind of thing. I very much enjoy She's natural kill product him. chemistry. She's going to kill me. And him. red wine has a lot of what we call phytochemicals, which are chemicals from plants. And they have a lot of beneficial anti cancer effects and cardiovascular effects. And the reason why red wine is better than grape juice is because grape juice has a lot of sugar, which is not good for you, but that's been fermented to alcohol. And in moderation, there are beneficial effects of red wine. Mm. And then let's talk about the good things in a bone in ribeye steak, aside from the fact that it tastes so good. Um, it's got protein. Yes. Are there other good things in a ribeye steak? Besides protein? Well, I haven't looked so much into ribeye steaks, but um, I personally prefer bison ribeyes because <laughs> they there, are less fatty. <laughs> yeah, so fat's not good. You, don't, you don't want fat in your diet? <laughs> yes. Okay. So a lean ribeye steak and a bison uh, steak uh, both have protein in them, and protein is good for the human body. Yes. And with respect to a potato, baked potato, is there anything good in a baked potato for us? Not particularly, unless they're the purple ones. The purple ones actually have some great phytochemicals in them. Um, but I think a potato is great if you're trying to be gluten-free. Oh, so there's no gluten in the potato. Okay. Correct. And then the sour cream, that's got calcium. And <laughs> you're a potato job you, right? <laughs> Sure. Well, and because oh, but we have to, right we can't we spell his name right in the so chat. All good things it's about just J O M B O Y. Right? Well, hopefully, after <laughs> you don't spell his name right. You your favorite meal. <laughs> no, actually, I do all the cooking in our house, but uh, or most of the cooking. I bet you do. So I'll make it myself. But um, so two hours after I've had a, a meal of two glasses of red wine and a steak and a baked potato, 
uh, I get hit by a car, you do blood work on me, there's going to, you don't, you'll find some good stuff in me and you'll find some maybe John a little bit too asks, much fat and because of the, is he cross-examining her fat or asking her out on a date? Maybe a little bit too much starch because of the current, the starch and a potato. Um, but that doesn't contribute to my cause of death, but there's good things and bad things in my body. Now we didn't, I didn't ask you about any of the bad things in that meal. So if you're going to, if you're going to do an assessment about what kind of a diet a person should have, um, a steady diet of two glasses of red wine and a ribeye steak and a baked potato for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that's not a good diet, is it? Probably not. Because there's some bad things in there too, right? Yes. So in a balanced assessment of what, I don't what see is a anything good meal wrong with that. requires you also to assess what's bad in, what's bad in the items you're ingesting, correct? I suppose. So red wine, which has all kinds of good things in it, also has some stuff in it that's not good for you. Correct. Like the ethanol that you've got up there. There's ethanol in red wine, and ethanol, by and large, is not good for human beings. John Boy is definitely good for I think for there are studies engagement. that show in moderation it has some beneficial cardiovascular effects. But obviously in excess, no. It's a poison. I, I hate that argument. It's still a poison. I, just, <laughs> I, I drink, so, uh, but it's still a thank poison. Thank you, doctor. Now, let's, let's talk about... Um, the differential diagnosis that physicians do and that you did in this case. Um, when you're doing a differential diagnosis um, and we're talking about, and I'm going to, I'm so happy to have this paper up here because, you know, I, I don't like computers as much as I like paper. So I'm going to, I'm going to use that paper for a minute too. So bear with me for a second. You, you... I think the marker's still okay. up there. Right here. Okay. And a microphone. Oh my God. You have to hold it longer. So the way he's acting, he knows he knows she did really well. He's doing more than he planned on doing on this cross right now. Is it working? Okay, now it's working. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so doctor. Could I have a marker, please? Thank you. What a freaking weirdo. So for purposes of your testimony, your evaluation of this case, um, you'd actually been retained to do a differential diagnosis. Is that true? A, a cause of death analysis, yes. And well, I, I want to make sure that I get it right. So let's take a look at what okay. he loves walking around with this microphone wrote here. You wrote in your report, I was provi provided the below listed case specific materials and relied on the following to render an opinion regarding cause of death. That's yes. That's what you did. Well, what page was that? M page, says he's going to go two, somewhere with this um, line of questioning around food in terms and then of page interactions three, with toxins. We shall see. You wrote, my methodology Smart involved thinking. considering evidence regarding the scene investigation, and you considered that. I mean, you saw crime scene photos? Yes. And case details. Well, we'll get into that in a moment, but you indicated case details. Yes. And pathology examination and laboratory analysis, correct? Correct. And then ultimately, I evaluated and balanced that evidence using You're reading again. Of, quote, differential diagnosis. actually i think he can hear and evidence-based medicine as well as knowledge of the medical literature more importantly post-mortem toxicology findings must be correlated with the scene investigation case details and pathology analysis in rendering a cause of death opinion so that's what you wrote right and that's what you did in this case yes now i notice on page four i'm sorry not page Could you hold this for a moment? I have both hands. <laughs> She's 
holding the mic for her. <laughs> and she's doing it in the most awkward way possible on purpose. I love her. She's my new favorite. On page He's six. creepy. He is creepy. I think J. Michael pointed um, it out you first. Wrote at the top there, he's creepy. She acted extremely lethargic, would ramble without reason or making sense. She had lost 15 pounds during the last month alone. Now, do you know where that information came from, that you wrote she had lost 15 pounds during the last month alone? Her doctor. Well, I documented that that came from the Pleasant Prairie Police Department. And do you know where they got that from? From talking to Mark Jensen. So that information was provided to them by Mark Jensen. Yes. Dude, the, and you know for a fact that's not true, don't you? By looking at the case in this, by looking at the information that was in this case, you know for a fact that Julie Jensen what, was had not 12? lost 15 pounds in the last month alone. I don't know. Well, let's take a look at your report again. I will direct your attention to page three of your report. So on hey, Melody, I saw the part where he grabbed the witness mic. That was details weird. and timeline. Um, on on September first, nineteen ninety eight, Julie Jensen went to see Doctor Borman, and she weighed one hundred and twenty three pounds. Does it say that there? Yes. And then on December first, she had dropped from one hundred and twenty three pounds to one hundred and fifteen pounds. You see that there? Yes. There's eight. So between. December between September 1st, 1998 and December 1st, 1998, we knew she had lost exactly eight pounds. Well, I don't know if I would say exactly, but that is what is reported in this information. Well, of all the inf you do know that at the time that Julie was at the time of her autopsy, were you aware that the forensic pathologist did not have a scale? I Which is that, ridiculous. Yes. So when he wrote in his uh, autopsy report that she was approximately 110 pounds, that was his estimate of her weight by looking at it. Yeah. So, one, so the most, 123 the to 110 that we have for Julie is Jensen 13 pounds. Was those that were from her doctor's office, correct? No. Yes. Because when well, we should I be able to that, rely on your medical the examiner. The first thing I do is step on a scale. And that's what most people do when they go see a doctor. Depends on what yeah. doctor. I mean, you go see a doctor too, don't you? Even though you are one, you go see a doctor, right? Yes. And does your doctor have you step on a scale? Yes. And they take your and they record your weight. Yes. And that's what happens to all of us when we go see a doctor. We get on the scale and the doctor records our weight. Yes. So this September first, nineteen ninety eight weight of one hundred and twenty three pounds is pretty darn accurate, wouldn't you say? I would think so. And this day weight of one hundred and fifteen pounds on December first, nineteen ninety eight is pretty darn accurate, isn't it? I would think so. And then the weight of 110 pounds at the time of autopsy, that's an estimate, right? Yes. But an estimate by a, a very experienced forensic pathologist, right? Sure. But even the, the estimate of a very experienced this physician is, pointless. is probably not going to be as accurate as the weight that was recorded on a scale when you step on the scale. I'm sure it depends in part on the scale. Well, the yeah. actors rely upon the information that is generated in their office to make their notes, correct? Correct. And so they want to make sure that the information that's in their notes concerning their patient. No, they don't is, care uh, about your. Uh, right? Sure. And if it's the same scale that was stepped on September 1st. But how do you know if it's and the then same stepped scale? on December 1st, which is, by the way, was that almost exactly three months? Um, if there is a problem with the scale it's probably the same problem they had September 1st and December 1st so wouldn't it be fair to say that she lost almost exactly eight pounds between September 1st 1998 and December 1st 1998 I, I guess so yes so losing eight pounds in three months is a whole lot different than losing 15 pounds in one month isn't it yes so when you're considering the source of that information about losing 15 pounds in one month you might want to consider the source in deciding whether or not that is an accurate or inaccurate result. Because it's inaccurate to say she lost 15 pounds in one month, isn't it? No, I, well, not maybe necessarily. he was ballparking it. I mean, I'm sure that he wasn't specifically the one weighing her, but I don't think that that's a huge discrepancy. 
But it is a discrepancy, and actually, it is pretty big to say. No, it's not. Fifteen pounds uh, in one month. Objection. Argumentative. Three or four months. Correct. That's a pretty big discrepancy there. It's a difference, yes. So let's consider the motivation that Mark Jensen might have had for lying to the police about how much weight Julie Jensen had lost in the last month of her life. Might he have been trying to make it look like Julie Jensen was unstable and emotional and lost her appetite and was suicidal? Wouldn't Judge, that would be a argue, good way to support I would that proposition? There, there's an objection. I would, I would object as to argumentative. He should ask him to go back to his podium, too. It means you can answer the question, Doctor. Did you hear the question? Why would you overrule that? I felt like it was more like a speech, but if you want to ask oh. the question again, ask it more specifically. Okay. Good job. Would you agree that they, they need to object to him standing right, standing right there too? A different question because I don't like. Well, I don't want to make a speech. You understand that Mark Jensen sits over there and he's accused of murder of Julie Jensen. I understand that. And you do understand that. Now, this may be a surprise to you, but you do understand that sometimes people that are accused of murder, who actually committed the murder, have a motive to lie to the police about it. Sure. And so you would agree that Mark Jensen, the accused murderer in this case, if in fact he murdered Julie Jensen, has a motive to lie to the police and everybody else about Julie Jensen's condition in the month or two preceding her death. Would you agree with that? I suppose, but my role in this case is not to assess the credibility of Mark Jensen or anybody else. My role in this case is to look at the medical science. Actually, that's not true. That's not what you wrote in your report, is it? What you wrote in your report was... He needs to sit down. My methodology involved considering evidence regarding the scene investigation, case details, pathology examination, and laboratory analysis. Ultimately, I evaluated and balanced that evidence using the physician tool of, quote, differential diagnosis, unquote, and evidence-based medicine, as well as knowledge of the medical literature. More importantly, the post-mortem toxicology findings must be correlated with the scene investigation, case details, and pathology analysis in rendering a Has he written one opinion. thing? I don't think he's written so one thing. He totally did this just to use the, the microphone. Scene investigation and case details I'll, and pathology I'll give analysis. it to him. That's a little bit savvy, to in be rendering honest. a cause of death opinion. Exactly. And your question was about the credibility of certain witnesses, which is not my role in this case. You indicated I provided the below I was provided the below list of case specific materials and relied on the following to render an opinion regarding cause of death. Pleasant Prairie Police Department records. Yes. Scene photographs. Yes. Dr. Borman records. Yes. Letter to Dr. Borman. Yes. Dr. Borman trial testimony. Yes. Medical records of Julie Jensen. Yes. Kenosha County Medical Examiner records. Yes. And then all these toxicology labs, uh, St. Louis, University of Kentucky, AIT, and NMS. Hey, good to see you, Lord. Um, Croc, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just call you squirrel. Good to see you, squirrel. <laughs> or Croc. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, and, you, and by the way, you know, in terms of your medical, oh, John's links all that. medical toxicological analysis, um, would it surprise you? Hey, good you morning, Jolly Roger. We have the, um, uh, the Dr. Mainland, defense is toxic analysis toxicologist and, on the stand, which is not surprising. And John Boy is creepily so cross examining. You know a lot about so that's about um, all you missed poisoning and you know a lot about ethylene glycol and, and how it's metabolized into the system. So there's not any really great discrepancy between Dr. Mainland and you as to ethylene glycol as being a potential contributing factor to the death of Julie Jensen. We all agree that Julie Jensen was poisoned with ethylene glycol. Absolutely. And you agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. And Dr. Mainland agrees with that as well. That, and Dr. Shamless, for that matter, agrees that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol. The information in this case would be diagnostic for ethylene glycol poisoning, isn't it? Yes. So there's no question about that. The question is, what actually killed her? And the fact that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol, that does mean that she could have died from ethylene glycol poisoning, doesn't it? Say that again? The fact that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol, that does indicate that she could have died of ethylene glycol poisoning, doesn't it? Yes. And that's all you looked at was this 
toxicological stuff. I don't know why the defense is cool with him other information. standing where he's standing. Correct. Yes, because but it was a savvy move for him to, uh... for example, that Mark Jensen had told the police on oh, December yeah, turned, 3rd that she'd lost 15 pounds in a single month. And you know that's not true. I agree that there's a discrepancy between I don't have subtitles. Sorry. And I might because of the court TV feed. When John comes, we're switched back to uh, 16 or long crime. seven or whatever is something that I recorded in the pertinent case details, but it, it really doesn't play a huge role in my ultimate opinion. Because whether the accused murderer lied to the police doesn't affect your medical analysis? No. It shouldn't. You're not going to answer the question? That was a question that was put to you. Judge, I think this is an argumentative line and not relevant as to what Dr. Hale has testified to. We'll, we'll uh, let the doctor ask her that one, answer that one question. Of course you will. Can you repeat the question? Could you read it back, please? Yeah, guys, I'll, I'll switch to it on see when I get a chance. Because whether the accused murderer lies to the police doesn't affect your medical analysis. You're not going to answer that question. That was a question. So right now your line of questioning is about a discrepancy in a patient's weight. And I don't really see that as necessarily a lie. Good answer. And, and if it is a lie, it is not something that affects my analysis. Because you're just looking at the medical information. Yes. No, I'm looking at the totality of the evidence and getting the best history that I can, the best timeline that I can. And I consider, I consider things that Mark says. I realize that he, he is accused of a crime. And I realize that Julie is not here to tell us her side of the story, but there are things where in her medical records and otherwise you can I don't like this answer. essentially paint the picture of what was going on. You know, I'm going to return to my seat for a minute. I'm going to turn this off. Thank God. I'll get back to this in a little bit, but I, I want to return to my seat. I you don't want you to get the you impression. You never wrote that, anything. I know, but I'm going to. Okay. I'm just not going to, but I thought I'd better go back to my seat and sit down and go through this report a little bit more with you. Okay. Okay. I love that she called him out for never writing anything. That was good. I don't know the makeup of the jury. So I didn't want to give you the impression that I was kind of towering over you. I yeah. wanted, so I, I thought it'd be you were more doing that for a while over here. You were not making me uncomfortable. Oh, well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, She's good. She doesn't take any of his shit. So even though you're rendering an opinion as to the cause of death in this case, and it's based upon largely upon your qualifications, your extraordinary qualifications as a medical toxicologist, you do acknowledge that you're looking at a bunch of other stuff in this case as well. Correct. When, when I'm in the emergency department setting, I can talk to my patients or if they're unconscious for some reason, reason I might get the history from a friend or a family or the paramedics that bring them. And so the history is obtained that way. So, for example, if you've got a, a person, a guy that's rushed into the hospital and you, you ask him, well, how much you've had to drink? And he says, hey, doc, I've only had a couple of glasses. I've only had a couple of shots of whiskey. And his wife is standing right there and she says, Elmer, you know, you had a half a bottle of whiskey. Tell this doctor the truth. You know, at that point that you get information from a different source that might be more reliable than the information that's provided to you by the patient. Right. Well, you would consider the statements made by both individuals and then ultimately you would have an ethanol level that might confirm who is correct or not so if his serum level or his blood level is a 0.32 then you know that it's more likely the wife was telling the truth than the guy that's telling you who you only had a couple of shots of whiskey right yes and um so in this case uh when you're listening to this you're looking you're getting you're looking at the history of the case as well as looking at what's just in the blood and and urine and stomach contents of Julie Jensen, right? 
Right. So you offered the opinion that there was no convincing evidence here that Julie had more than one dose of ethylene glycol, right? Correct. Are you aware that Mark Jensen told another person that he had administered two doses of ethylene glycol, that he administered one dose with a glass of orange juice on the, in the evening of December 2nd. That's hearsay. And he administered a second dose of ethylene glycol uh, with, a, with orange juice the next day. Judge, I'm only objecting to a fact not, not in evidence because it was juice, not orange juice. So I just wanted to be clear. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'll say. Well, can, can I make a ruling? Please. Can you change the juice and we can proceed? So on December 1st, the evening morning, evening hours of December 1st, um, oh, I should say, let me back up. Were you aware that Mark Jensen had told a fellow inmate in the county jail that a, in the evening of December 1st, 1998, he administered a dose of ethylene glycol to Julie Jensen by mixing it allegedly and told and two thirds juice. Were you aware that he had said that? Yes. And were you aware that he also then told that same? Uh, she's like admitting that on the next day. He uh, that's what the inmate said. He said glycol. again as approximately one third antifreeze and two thirds juice. Are you aware of that? Yes. So um, she's giving him that. that. I don't like that. Report, though. You didn't at consider all. that. Why is that? I was not aware of that at the time I wrote my report. Oh, oh but now, so so the time you were, he, you John Boy's killing her on this. Mark Jensen had made that statement to Aaron Dillard. Correct. Or that at least Aaron Dillard she, testified that. I mean, I don't want to. Aaron Dillard's John, one that testified that Mark Jensen. Said John, that oh, John Boy, you, you should have just let that. that left that. Not at the time that I wrote my report. And he was almost too ethical there. The, at the time, that I can't believe I'm saying that. that. Mark Jensen had he didn't have to do that. And a coworker, a friend of his, one night in, on November seventh, nineteen ninety eight, that he confided with his friend coworker in an intoxicated evening of, of wife bashing that he told his coworker Ed Klug that he'd found a way to murder your wife. No. That he'd found a drug that will crystallize you from the inside out. Did you know that? This is a good cross. I believe I remember reading the crystallized from the inside out, yes. I still don't know why he did that That's whole thing. That's a pretty good thing. layman's term of describing what ethylene glycol does to you, isn't it? Crystallizes yes. you from the inside out. So were you aware at the time you wrote this report that um, Mark Jensen had a conversation, a drunken conversation with Ed Klug in the early morning hours of November 7th where he'd said Allegedly. Yeah, he was planning to kill his wife? poison her with this drug, uh, using Benadryl and this drug, and that would crystallize you from the inside out? No. I have no idea why the now you're aware is of not that objecting. Conversation. I am. And you're aware that Ed, Klug, uh, Ed Klug's wife, who's now his ex-wife, uh, stepped up and she also testified that she corroborated what, what Ed Klug told her, that he called her that You're night testifying? Her. Oh, my God. As he was talking with Mark Jensen, he'd go up to This is cross. He's allowed to. He, he, he can testify. conversation he was having with Mark Jensen about how Mark Jensen was planning to kill his wife. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of that. But not at the time you wrote this report, you weren't aware of that. Correct. Now, I'll say there's a lot of other stuff in terms of your differential diagnosis that the jury has heard over the past several days that... You don't make reference to in your differential diagnosis, guys. I'm because you didn't know about this. Other I call item. balls and strikes as I see them. At the time I wrote, John Boy is doing a report, really good job right here. I did not know about Aaron Dillard, and I did not know about Ed Klug. Did you know about Kelly Labonte? Yes. So you knew that Mark Jensen had a girlfriend, a woman who's having he, a sexual relationship. He's with, killing her on this. In the months preceding. And this June is all Jensen's fair game because she said she uses the totality you know of the information. Mark Jensen, that there's internet communications between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte after they'd commenced this sexual relationship. Where Mark Jensen is proposing that they run off somewhere and go on a Windstar cruise. Did, were you aware of that? I'm not aware of that. Were you aware that that conversation occurred in the middle of October 1998? No. Were you aware that in the middle of October 1998, Mark Jensen was in an email communication with Kelly Labonte, was proposing that they run off somewhere in 1999 on a Windstar cruise together? No, I am not aware of that. Well, I want you to assume hypothetically the following facts. And now I guess I'm going to go back up there to the list or to this paper. Oh, he's going to come back up. 
Let's see if he writes. Is working now? She's a toxicology expert, but she made findings there's a few seconds based on the totality of the information that she was given. So statements from others Let's consider are entirely relevant to her decision. John Boy John Boy's differential diagnosis. Doing a good job. Number one. And um by the way, you know and I don't like to say that. We all of us make differential diagnoses in our lives, right? We, we might not call it that, but we all make those kinds of diagnoses, right? Say that again. We, or don't all of us make differential diagnoses? I'll, I'll give you an example. Police officers, for example, when they're investigating a case and they're considering whether a murder suspect actually could have committed the crime, they consider motive, opportunity, and capability. Those three things are what every cop has been trained to do when they're conducting an investigation. Motive, opportunity, and capability. And that's kind of maybe the components that you need to make a deferential diagnosis. Is this the guy that did it or not, right? Well, first of all, I would argue that cops should never be rendering a diagnosis or going through the process of a differential diagnosis, and they would be the first to tell you that that is not their job. Secondly, I'm Good answer. not really sure how what you just said plays a role in differential diagnosis. Well, in a differential diagnosis, what you're doing is there's a, an infinite He's still array not of write. possibilities when you're looking at, when you're talking to somebody, right? Yes. Now, when you're talking to somebody in the emergency room, you're talking to them because you want to make a differ, differential diagnosis as to what the problem is with them so you can come up with a course of treatment, right? Yes. So you ask that person questions so that you can make that differential diagnosis. Yes. And don't you think that when a police officer is talking to a person who has, they're in the police station, they want to find out what this person has that they can tell them about the case that they're investigating, right? Well, what the police officer's role is and what a physician's role in are two completely different things. I didn't ask you that, though, did I? I already know that police officers don't do the same thing as medical toxicologists or emergency room physicians. And don't you think every person in the jury already knows? Knows. Judge, I would that police officer. Yeah, he says emer an emergency medical. Room She's objecting. I think there's an objection. There is. This is argumentative. Uh, it's not a question. Overruled. What? So that means you can answer the question. I understand what that means. The problem that I have with what you are saying is that you are saying that police officers use differential diagnosis, and so that is absolutely incorrect. Oh. Well, what do you call it that police officers do? They investigate a scene and they write reports and they can make decisions whether to arrest people or not, but they are not diagnosing conditions. Well, good job. Do you think they just arrest people randomly or do you think that when they make the arrest decision is based upon their assessment of the evidence at the scene and their conversation or communication with the suspect? Well, obviously it depends on the crime and it depends on the situation. Yeah, they I think there are times when police officers just arrest people randomly. Not randomly, but depending on if they are in the process of breaking into a home, then yes, they would probably arrest right away. Why did he walk up there again? So the question here was, I mean, the objection was that I was being argumentative. The fact is, um, you're not Sorry, I can't my, hear you. The, the objection was that I was being argumentative. But you don't need to. one that's arguing with me here. I mean, it's a Correct. simple proposition, isn't it? That's, a, that's, that's argumentative. argumentative. That. That's just a, well, it's a simple proposition that police officers don't go about arresting people randomly without regard to the facts. That you that get they so mad. To them, correct? In general, yes. And we all make decisions based upon the facts that are presented to us, don't we? In the broadest and most general question I've ever heard, I guess the answer is yes. Okay. So let's get back to the more specific specific question about differential diagnosis or a differential we make a decision based upon the information that is presented to us correct correct and then we differentiate we look at the information we choose to believe we look at the information that's inconsistent with other information we've received and then we make a decision about our next course of action correct correct we obtain a history the best way possible and weigh all of those different facts and some facts are more credible or less credible than others. And then we take that history and we do ancillary studies. An ancillary study might be 
an x-ray or a laboratory test. Hey, doctor, doctor I, I appreciate I it. object to him she, cutting her she off. Was, okay, she's she was being non-responsive. Go ahead, doctor, finish. He gets so mad. When you do a differential diagnosis, there are different components of that. There's the history, which, as I've said, you can obtain from the patient or a family member or the paramedics that bring the patient. And you weigh all of that evidence. I think and sometimes Trump was actually doing a good job here. I think or she, it may not be the exactly doctor's right, also doing a really good a job of holding her. But gotcha. you consider those things. And then you look for ancillary studies, such as radiology testing, like a chest X-ray or a CAT scan of a head. Um, or laboratory testing, or biopsies. Those are all things that are ancillary tests. And you combine all of the information. Both parties Some are doing a really good helpful. job. Here. Some of it may be incorrect, and you combine it together to render a diagnosis. So you made reference to reliable versus unreliable information, correct? Correct. So you, there is, when you're making a differential diagnosis, there is an assessment of the reliability versus the unreliability of the information that you're receiving, correct? To some extent, but as an emergency physician, I may not always have the ability to corroborate certain information, especially in an emergency department setting where it's, it's fast and you're thinking on your feet. So when you, you get the information and you record it in the medical record, just like I recorded in my report, my report does not include commentary about whether I believe that information or not. I am merely reporting what the evidence shows. And the same thing would occur in the medical record. When I create a medical record and the patient tells me that they just got back from a trip from Mars, then I'm going to write in the medical record, this, this patient just got back from a trip from Mars. Now I realize that is an extreme example, but it gets reported. So to get back to reliable and unreliable information, would you agree that when you're teaching your, um, your students that you suggest to them that in evaluating information, they should rely more on re reliable information and less on unreliable information? Well, I suppose when I'm teaching, I would say the same thing that I just said a minute ago, which is record what the patient tells you, record what you're told, we don't always have a way to know whether Trust a person is reliable or not, or if, the, if it's their family member that is reliable or not. But we report what we're told, and we put that in the medical record, and we don't make an assessment of what is reliable or unreliable. So now I'm going to approach one more time, and this time I'm going to write something, I promise, okay? I don't um, believe you. Dude, if he doesn't, so he, he does look a little bit incredible by saying diagnosis. he's going to write something and not writing something. But I, I just don't know if the jury likes him or not. If the jury likes him, he's killing it. For your differential diagnosis, you considered Pleasant Prairie Police Department records, right? Correct. And that's a broad category. But um, did the police, Pleasant Prairie he wrote Police two Department words. records <laughs> include the email communications that I just described to you between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte in mid-October 1998? I don't believe they included any email communications, and I'm I can't say for sure whether the police records uh, reported that or not. So I've got homicide on one side and suicide on the other. My handwriting's not very great, but I, you know, maybe I should make this a little bit clearer. Oh my God. <laughs> so homicide and suicide. So we're going to do a di differential diagnosis here. So um, you did not. But she did. You, you were unaware of, or you did not consider, the fact that Mark Jensen had a girlfriend on the side in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death. This is good. If he gets, if he gets away with this, this is good. That's a determination for the jury. 
Yeah, but he's asking questions about it. The I, I think the jury's smart enough to figure out he's just asking a question. I agree with you, Judge. I think he so could do this So we're going to let it go. Thing with facts versus no facts. I'm just saying. You can mark what That's he fine. wishes. That's fine. Oh, you my can God. You redirect and I ask will. your expert that what you great. wish. Go ahead. So for your differential diagnosis, you didn't consider the... Um, I can't believe he's going to get away with this. The email communication. But that objection Jensen wasn't very good. Levante in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death. Uh, no, and just. That's sufficient. Just no. You did not. Sir, but again, I object to him not letting her finish her answer. Well, Your Honor, the fact is it was a yes or no question. And so she should answer no. And she likes to lecture a lot. I mean, she's talking to me lecturing. She lectures a lot. I just want to know. You did not consider Ju Mark Jensen's Dude. communications with Kelly Labonte. Let him rule on the objection. Julie's death. Yes or no? No. Dude, you did not consider the defense needs a protector witness on this. A sexual relationship with Kelly Labonte in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death. No. You did not consider the fact that Mark Jensen lied about that relationship to the investigating officer when he was in asking him questions about Kelly Labonte. This you did not consider that either, did you? No. This is pretty brilliant by John Boyd. The fact that Mark Jensen. There's evidence that this jury has heard that Mark Jensen, in the years preceding Julie Jensen's death, subjected her to a sadistic pattern of harassment and humiliation and demeaning behavior. You weren't aware of that, did, weren't you? I was aware of that, yes. Oh, you were aware. You were aware that Mark Jensen, in the years preceding Julie Jensen's death, had repeatedly um, done hang-up phone calls, had repeatedly left emails or sent her emails with the penis pictures that he repeatedly left penis pictures around the house for her to find. You were aware of that? Judge, I object to the nature of the question. I think if she's aware that pictures and phone calls were had, that's different than Attorney Jamboy's indication that it was Mark Jensen. Well, that's a, again, that's a jury determination. I agree. I think that the question just yep. isn't clear for the experts hey, I'll, I'll be when right we're back. talking about was she aware of photos and harassing phone calls versus Mark Jensen being the person that did them. I think that's the problem. She's also an expert, so. I agree, but Attorney Jim Boyce just wants a yes or no, so I'm just trying to make sure that we're clear on the question so that she doesn't say no but and then she can't finish you, her You answer. know what, Judge, I'll, just re I'll withdraw that question. Thank you. So you were aware that Julie Jensen was the was the subject of a sadistic campaign of harassment and abuse. You were aware of that, right? I was aware of that situation, yes. Well, um, Julie Jensen had kept a log of all these patterns of harassment, correct? I know that now, yes. That um, Julie didn't know who was doing this, but somebody was calling them all the time and hanging up the phone. You were aware of that? I was aware of that situation, yes. It went on from early 1992 through August of 1998. You were aware of that situation? Yes. You were aware that um, in addition to the hang-up phone calls, they would the, the, whoever was doing this would leave a series of penis photos all around the house or that allegedly leave them with, at Mark Jensen's place of business? And Mark would come home and show them to her. You were aware of that? I'm not aware of that specific scenario that you just described. Oh, you weren't aware of the fact that Mark Jensen showed these photos that, that he got, that he, he said he got them at, the, at his office, and then he'd come home and show them to Julie. You weren't aware that he did that? Not that specific thing, no. Were you aware that um, Julie Jensen received emails um, with th these disgusting um, Pornograph, pornographic penis photos attached to them. Are you aware of that? Um, not specifically as you described. Well, were you aware that on April 13th, 1998, Julie Jensen received an email and she put, put it in her log of harassment that she received an email on April 13th, 1998? I'm aware of the situation, but not of the specific date or are you, specifics. Are you aware of who actually created that email that Julie Jensen complained about on April 13th, 1998? No. Are you aware that this jury saw that it was Mark Jensen that created that email that made it look as though it came from Turtle to Julie Jensen? Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that it actually was an email that Mark Jensen had created himself with 15 different penis photos on it that he took out his name, put in Turtle as the person that was from, 
took out his name and put in the name Julie Jensen as the person who was two. Were you aware that Mark Jensen did that? No. Are you aware that the jury, is, now the jury has seen very clear evidence of that. Would you agree that that kind of behavior reflects a, a malicious, a sadistic frame of mind on the person who would do something like that? Yes. And would that be relevant to the issue of whether or not the person who did that on April 13th, 1998, as part of a pattern of harassment for the last several years, would have a motive to murder Julie Jensen on December 3rd, 1998? Possibly. And would you agree that if Mark Jensen was planning to go on a cruise with his girlfriend in October of 1999, and he, he was talking with his girlfriend in October of 1998, about that cruise, would you agree that Mark Jensen needed to do something with his wife, correct? I'm not going to agree with that. I would say that that makes him guilty as an adulterer, but not necessarily as a murderer. Sure. I mean, he could have wanted to get a divorce, right? Yes. And he could have planned to get a divorce, right? Yes. In fact, at the time that communication was taking place between Mark Jensen, who was married to Julie Jensen, Kelly Labonte at that point was not actually any longer Kelly Labonte. Her name was actually Kelly Greenman, and she was married to Mark Greenman. Did you know that? No. Did you know that Kelly Labonte, or I'm sorry, Kelly Greenman at that point was communicating with Mark Jensen via email and saying, well, you know, I know what I'm going to do with my issue. What are you going to do with your issue? Do you, are you aware that Kelly Greenman had sent that communication to Mark Jensen? On, in the middle of October 1998? No. Were you aware that Mark Jensen responded that, well, you know, details, that's just noise in the greater picture of things? Do you, were you aware that that's how he responded to the details that he was supposed to be taking care of? His wife and his children, they were just noise in the greater picture of things in Mark Jensen's estimation? Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that during the course of the ensuing months and the ensuing days from the time he had this communication with Kelly Labonte or Kelly Greenman, right up to the time of Julie Jensen's death, there was not one single search on Mark Jensen's computer for a divorce attorney. Were you aware of that? No. Not one single search about a marital property agreement. Were you aware of that? No. There was not one single search about child custody. Were you aware of that? No. There was not one single search about anything relating to divorcing his wife or property maintenance or property division. Were you aware of that? No. But there were several searches about botulism, about, um, I don't know, pipe bombs. There was uh, several searches using the anarchist cookbook looking for ways to kill your spouse. Were you aware of that? Judge, I would object. That's not what those searches said. Well, I think there was one search how to kill your wife. It was the sentencing of a pipe bomb person. So that's different. And remember, we advised the jury that just because it wasn't on the screen. Okay, we'll, we'll withdraw that last question. Okay, so you were aware, you, you were not aware that Mark Jensen had gone on the internet and was looking up things like botulism, pipe bombs, um, a variety of other poisons. You weren't aware of that? No. Were you aware that, you know, a word search was done for the unallocated space of Mark Jensen's computer? Uh, and the number one word that was searched more than anything that came up more often than all the other words was poison. Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that Mark Jensen had 20, several hundred, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of penis photos on his work computer in 2002? Were you aware of that? No. Would, you would agree that for a man to have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of penis photos on his computer, that's a very unusual thing. Would you agree? Yes. It reflects an obsession, perhaps, an unhealthy obsession with male genitalia. Would you agree? Yes. And if Mark, so if somebody was leaving these penis photos all around the house for years and years and years and years, the fact that Mark Jensen has several hundred penis photos on his computer, that might reflect that he's the person that's doing that, correct? Possibly, yes. A reasonable inference, isn't it? Yes. Were you aware that Mark Jensen? In the early stages of his relationship with Kelly Labonte, she'd become Kelly Labonte again by this point, that he was asking her to describe in great detail the size, shape, and circumference of every penis she'd ever encountered in her life. Were you aware of that? Judge, I would object as to relevance for this witness. Well, 
I think he's asking her what she considered when she made her opinion. The understanding from the jury is that was after Ms. Jensen had passed, so I'm not sure as how it's relevant to this doctor's opinion as to cause and manner of death. Actually, Your Honor, there's no indication that that conversation necessarily occurred after Julie Jensen's death. I don't agree with that. That's not a correct statement, so we'll go ahead and continue. So did you answer that last question? I don't remember if you did or not. I don't remember. Okay. Could the reporter read back the last question? The reporter's going to stab him. Sorry, I was missing. What did I miss in a couple minutes? I was trying to get off that call as fast as possible. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And I know a lot of us are asking or thinking, why is he, he allowed to ask a lot of these questions? And she really opened the door to him being able to uh, um, ask questions around the affair, ask questions around um, the thousands of pictures, to ask questions around um, what jailhouse snitches said. She opened the door to this by saying she used the totality, the totality of the information she was given, which included those things, um, to make her decisions or to make her findings. Um, I think there is a point where the def- uh, the defense could be objecting to it being outside the scope of her expertise. But again, I don't think they would win on that because, um, yeah, so John D. is saying she did great on, she, she was great on direct. Um, I don't know if it's, it's really, I think she's still, she's holding up pretty well on a really, really good cross. Um, she could have had a few truth. I saw a few points where she could have been truthful and um, answered better. Yeah, like, it's hard to have a bad cross when you're allowed to answer all this, but like, ask all this. And I'd love to get John's take. I think John might disagree with Lee a little bit. But I think the judge is right. In allowing this, because she said she used the totality of the information to make her findings. Now, again, I'm still a little confused on what, exactly what they're arguing over. Um, because she did um, concede like, that she could have died from alcohol poisoning. Uh, or um, antifreeze poisoning. Um, ethanol, ethanol glycol poisoning. Um, I think the argument is over if there was two doses or not. So, but then John Boy is turning that, John Boy's using this witness to once again hammer home all of his points. It's pretty effective here. Let's see. Hey, Pat, thanks for the $5. Remember, everybody, if you send in Super Chats, I will pull them up. The money still goes to John. Um, John and uh, Sharon. He's using questions to the expert to reiterate the previous hearsay testimony. Exactly. And she's not doing... That's the place where I don't think she's doing that great on cross. Her answers could be, well, that's what the jailhouse snitch said, but I relied more on facts than hearsay. She, I would love to hear her even call out, well, that's hearsay, John Boy. Um, that's the part where I don't think she's doing great. Other than that, I think she's holding up very well. She doesn't seem to be intimidated by him. Um, she's using his snark against him in some cases. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Let's talk about a little bit about what I think is a pretty genius move, especially the first time. To, to pretend that he was going to write things on the board in order to then get that walk around Mike in order to stand right over her. I don't really like how he called himself out for doing that after. He probably should have just gone and sat down. She did a good job of being like, of, I think she was being very truthful when she said, I'm not intimidated by you. Um, that was good. So let's see what some of you all are saying. And remember, I'll pull up Super Chats first, but we do try to pull up everything. Um, and if you like this kind of analysis, Anthony has just put in uh, the link to my channel. It's a uh, trial junkie. We, we really do the same thing over there that we're doing here on J. Robine Law. We cover trials. Um, it's a fairly new channel. I have two trials that I've covered. The Aaron Dean case, which is a case of a officer-involved shooting. Um, and the Angela Hawk trial, which has to do with midwife, 
a um a midwife i'll just leave it at that go check those cases out and um also please make sure you hit the like button here it helps us get back in the el- gets us in the algorithm i know a lot of people didn't know if john was going to be on or not this morning uh so we want to hit that like button make sure all our friends know uh let's pull up what does Tasha she have to say? Pro, the prosecutor has been intimidated, argumentative, and just plain out misrepresenting the testimony. The judge didn't rule on the objection and let the state continue without a ruling. All right, so I'm going to take that first part, that last part first. I absolutely hate how John Boy will just roll through, blow through objections. It's not proper. It's not professional, and the fact that the judge lets him do it is inconceivable to me. It should not be happening. All right, with that said, let's look at the second part. Prosecution is intimidating and argumentative. I would argue that's their job on cross. They are cross-examining a hostile witness, just as we would expect a defense team to be intimidating and argumentative, um, if that's their style. In cross, I think we have to be fair and say that's okay. Um, that's probably them doing their job. I don't know if he's misrepresenting testimony so much. The one place where I felt pretty uncomfortable about what he was doing was making he- the hearsay statements sound like they were fact. I thought that was misrepresenting testimony. And I thought the defense should be objecting much, uh, much more actively to that. Interestingly enough, though, John Boyd kind of called himself out on that. Um, I I don't know that he needed to, without the objection. That's interesting. Let's see what. Uh... Luke, if you're missing your uh, meltdowns from John, I think he'll be back fairly soon. I think we're getting pretty close to John coming back on. Um, let's pull up JSDs. I like he has some contrary ideas and thoughts to me usually. So, problem she has is when she had totally said totality, so it shows that she either didn't use totality of the reports and evidence, or defense gave her limited reports and evidence. That doesn't look good either way. I think it's more she did use the totality. And the problem is by saying that she allowed John Boy to completely reiterate his whole argument through her. I think it's smart. I think it was a I think it's a smart move on his part. Yep. She opened the door by the way she said that. Um, and, and not really from a legal standpoint, she opened the, uh, she opened the door in terms of allowing him to segue to these questions, um, in, in a manner that made sense. Oh yeah. The whole, the wine and steak and potato part was, was weird. Uh, I, I, I don't think it was that. I don't really want to give him the benefit on the doubt on that one. I seriously think he was just being a creep. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just being honest there. Um, oh, yeah. So this is a good point. Jam Boy, spelled correctly, is uh, the prosecutor's last name. He's actually a special prosecutor. He was the original prose- the prosecutor in the in the original trial. Um, has come out of retirement to be a um, special prosecutor in this second trial. Uh, for those of you sports fans, there is a um, very amazing YouTube channel um, run by a great guy named I think his name is John John Boy, but his last name is John Boy J O M. B-O-Y. So that's why I keep calling um, 
keeps calling I keep calling him Jom Boy. J O M B O Y. It's just my thing. <laughs> um Yes. Seriously, if you're into sports, um, John Boy does great, like great breakdowns of interesting plays. Um, he's a lip reader, so uh, if there's an argument between a player and an umpire, he can usually tell you exactly what is said in those arguments, um, which is very fun too. What else do we have in terms of this trial? Let's see what Pat has to say here. Um, and I know this was being said to somebody else, so forgive me. But um, the data search was done at Mark's office computer. To point out there might be other reasons poison might be overrepresented. Oh, sorry. I don't know. I should, probably shouldn't have pulled that up, but don't exactly know the context of that full conversation. <laughs> so uh, John and I will debate this if he disagrees but it's when, it's not opening the door in the sense it's the it's just the fact that she used the totality totality of um Switch provided to make it so he has the right to ask about those things but we still need John to come back. I do think John will disagree with me. We're back on the record on uh... Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF314. Appearances are the same. Jury's back in the courtroom. The doctor is still on the stand under oath. And Mr. Jambois, you can continue with your cross. Thank you, doctor. I'm, thank you, judge. And thank you, doctor. <laughs> um, so I have this this list up there, and I, do, I don't have anything underneath it. But in, in terms of the differential diagnosis, Can everybody hear me now? Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. So, oh, God, your go. conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty was that Julie Jensen died because, and I'm going to write it down here, ethylene glycol poisoning. Is that right? Yes. Oh, darn it. Oh, I forgot to switch the on crime. <laughs> you, you can see that? I can. Okay. So, um, but you know, there's the forensic pathologists that have testified in this case have indicated that yes, she was a victim of ethylene glycol poisoning. But that she also that asphyxia. Right, but I don't think this is an outrageous extent. I'm, and, and don't get me wrong, like John Boy has done some stuff in this trial that asphyxia, absolutely makes it uh, was an issue in this matter too. Were you aware of that? I am. And in fact, the defense expert, uh, I think her name is Dr. He's not Thomas, doing that though. He uh, is he's that, using um, facts that have been testified to and that are in front of the jury. In Julie Jensen's death, were you aware and of that? Not, I shouldn't say facts. I'm not aware he's using of, things that uh, have been testified what to. their opinion is. Because a lot of it's hearsay. Okay. Well, you you. But it's already in. As a emergency room physician, you've dealt with you've had people rushed in who died from asphyxia. Yes. And have you heard of positional asphyxia versus? Uh, asphyxia that is not positional asphyxia? Yes. Okay. So um, would you agree that the diagnosis of asphyxia 
is largely um <laughs> dude john boy saw this this mic that's that? not tied to the desk that ordinarily was asphyxia there's he's all over it actual physical evidence of asphyxia would you agree with that well since you asked <laughs> because i didn't come here today to talk about asphyxia but you have asked about that and i can talk about asphyxia, which requires not a yes or no answer. So I need to explain. Well, doctor, I, I only want you to give yes or no answers to yes or no questions. So go ahead, tell us about asphyxia. Asphyxia merely means that you're not getting oxygen in. And when you talk about asphyxia, we can all it agree that this judge allows to way clear too up many, the semantics. It's way too many I have on argument. Heard in this case, a number the defense has objected to argumentative, and I thought they were around. right. And so we need to clarify some definitions first. Asphyxia, like I said, means that you're not getting oxygen. So in the generalist of senses, if all, all of the oxygen was sucked out of this room right now and carbon dioxide was pumped in, or some other gas compound, then by definition, that is asphyxia. If you drowned or have a near drowning, that is a form of asphyxia. Then there are individuals that suffer from what would be called positional asphyxia. Now, positional asphyxia is somewhat rare but it would be in a situation where somebody gets drunk and then falls off the bed and they get wedged between say the nightstand and the bed and they're in a position where they are not able to breathe and that is positional asphyxia there is also something called prone asphyxia prone hey, asphyxia I don't have is this thought to that, to that when you are on your stomach oh. Let me see what that I can. you can't breathe, which is absolutely false because there are it's well known that even with COVID, when there was a great deal of lung injury, that people were not oxygenating well. What would we do with a lot of them? We would flip them onto their stomach. So there is nothing about being on your stomach that causes asphyxia. In fact, there are a number of things that actually actually cause it to improve, meaning your oxygenation. There is also something called compression asphyxia. And compression asphyxia is this thought process no, I know that if you apply uh, enough crackle squirrel, but if I do somebody, anything on this computer right now, that it's gonna that cause will things cause to cause them to stop and breathing and they I don't have a good connection asphyxiate. right now. Now there are plenty of studies and there are some individuals, some emergency physicians in California that have studied this. And they have shown that even putting massive amounts of weight on somebody on their back does not cause significant changes in ventilation and oxygenation. I tell a story of a patient that I had one time where he was a homeless gentleman and he fell asleep in the dumpster. and Along came the next morning, the trash compactor. Oh, God. And the trash compactor came and exerted this massive amount of compressive force on him. And then, of course, they realized this and they called 911. And he came to me in the emergency department. And he had externally a great deal of petechiae, which are little pinpoint hemorrhages from basically here on up, and also something called a subconjunctival hemorrhage. A subconjunctival Sounds hemorrhage horrific. is the whites of your eye <laughs> that below the conjunctiva, which if you've ever had conjunctivitis, you've probably heard that term, it bleeds, the blood vessels bleed in the white parts of the eye. And so it takes a tremendous amount of compressive force to asphyxiate somebody and then there are external changes that you see on the body to show that asphyxia has happened. Now, another form of asphyxia is strangulation, 
where someone gets choked or there's some type of cord or tie around the neck. And when that happens, there are visible injuries externally, as well as uh, with the hyoid bone, which is a bone in your neck, and the cartilage around your larynx. So those would be indications. Hey, Natalie, that good, asphyxia good to hear that you're occurred. feeling better. John is so coming back on. Before we can um, have a conversation, I about thought asphyxia, it might even be back on now to, to discuss what but we're I'm actually texting talking and tell about, him, uh, so that we can actually have a real scientific conversation about what's going on. So we have to define: Are we talking about strangulation? Are we talking about compression? Are we talking about prone? Are we talking about positional? Because those are all different things. Are you finished? I am. Okay, well, see, I didn't interrupt you at all. Now, let's talk about He's such an positional asphyxia. You said you saw the crime scene photos? Say that again? You said you, you said you saw the crime scene photos, right? I did. And one of the crime scene photos, could you find the crime scene photo where Julie's in the bed uh, with the, put it up on the screen. The crime scene photos, uh, that you examined show Julie Jensen laying in her bed. The covers were pulled back and she was kind of laying on her side with her arm beneath her and her face was in the bed. Do you recall seeing that? Yes, I saw that. Okay. Now, um, do you think that could be indicative of the potential for positional asphyxia being a contributing factor to Julie Jensen's death? It is not a position that would cause somebody to stop breathing. Oh, so you don't think positional asphyxia is a likely factor in this case? Correct. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. so I'm going to put a photo up on the screen, and that I think that's the easiest one for you to see right up there. Yeah, it looks um, super fun to have Natalie on. Of course, it's dark right now, but there we go. Um, that's that's the photo that you saw of Julie Jensen at the time of her. Uh, at the at the crime scene yes and um you, you don't think that could be that that's indicative of the potential for uh positional asphyxia no wow okay now what if now we have um, an argument what if there's testimony uh that mark jensen told somebody that when he came he, he when he he rolled Julie into that position. Now, actually, he John told will police probably be that back on in about an hour. Julie Natalie, he's going to that might out. explain kind of the way her arm is displayed, is played there under. She was laying on her back, and he rolled her into that position. Were you aware of that? Yes. <clears throat> and that does look like somebody laying on their back, and they were rolled into that position, doesn't it? Possibly, or it could just be someone that fell asleep, intoxicated. Okay, but it's consistent with Mark Jensen's statement to detective ratsburg that he rolled julie into that position correct yes i suppose so it's not uncommon for somebody to roll somebody over to assess whether they're alive or dead well that's not why that's not why he what did if I it told you that mark jensen you told should... detective ratsburg she needs to know that this julie was this is not good and she was gra gr gasping for breath so he rolled her on her side in that fashion that's that condition is consistent with that description that Mark Jensen gave to Detective Ratzberg, isn't it? Sure, that could be. No, um, but that position would not cause positional asphyxia, would it? No. Now, were you aware of the fact that Mark Jensen told Aaron Dillard that after rolling her in that on her side like that, he walked back into the room and she was still breathing uh, reasonably well and he needed to kill her? before her children, before he brought the children home. So that he sat on her back, right about right about here, sat on her back and shoved her Everyone face Everyone stick in around. We'll make sure we get Natalie on. Until she stopped thoughts. breathing. I now, definitely want to hear what she that thinks about this case. Be a form of manual asphyxia? Yes. And that would kill her, wouldn't it? It could, yes. So positional asphyxia, you would exclude that as a possibility? Well, there was no evidence of that of any kind of asphyxia on the autopsy. Uh, well, let's now pull up that, that other photo. You were aware that Dr. Shambliss had indicated that the um, that he'd taken a 
photo at the autopsy and that he'd, have, he'd observed um, hemorrhaging on the second, third, and fourth rib of Julie's rib cage. Yes. It wasn't visible on the outside, but it was visible on the inside when he, when he did the classic Y incision and, and pulled the skin back. You remember that? Correct. And Dr. Shambliss had not seen the crime scene photo uh, when he did the autopsy. Were you aware of that? I don't know. Well, now I'm going to direct your attention to the... This is another good line of question. Here. I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Uh, now, can you see some hemorrhaging along the rib cage that the doctor had testified about? Yes. And the hemorrhaging along the rib cage kind of lines up with where Julie's arm is down here, doesn't it? Would you agree with that? I would say it's kind of hard to say. But well, would, would you agree, doctor, that the hemorrhaging on the rib cage, um, that a reasonable explanation for the hemorrhage on the rib, rib cage is that it's consistent, I, I'll just put it this way. Would you say that it's consistent with Mark Jensen's description of the manner in which he murdered Julie Jensen by sitting on her and shoving her face in a pillow, would you agree that the injuries on the rib cage and the condition of the it's body at that point, thought, that yeah, those please. factors are consistent with what Mark Jensen is alleged to have said to Aaron Dillard? I find that strange because if I, there's... I just asked you whether it's consistent or not. I is don't it think it's consistent. You think, you think that... Sounds good, Natalie. Cage and the manner in which Julie Jensen is laying there is inconsistent with what Mark I, Jensen I, is alleged to have said to Aaron Dillard. I'm going to uh, get in touch with you. So I think as it's strange back, that we're getting, there we're would not be external signs of injury and internal signs like this that we are looking at um, are nonspecific post-mortem artifact. And I say that because, as we discussed earlier, in my expert witness practice for the Department of Justice, I, I look at tons and tons and tons, hundreds of opioid deaths, and even more recently- All right, my day just fentanyl. got made. Natalie Wisco just and called me on Twitter. Invariably, on just about hey, any babe. autopsy report that I review, it is not uncommon to see post-mortem artifact, including petechiae and including hemorrhage, which is an artifact. It's due to the putrefaction process and post-mortem change. And so in the example that I told you about my trash compactor man, he was obviously compressed. He had a, a large amount oh, of why do we have to keep coming back to this? compression on him oh, and he didn't die. Sounds horrible. But he had the external signs of compression asphyxia. And so if the thought is that it's consistent that this post-mortem hemorrhage on the inside was caused by something on the outside and there's no signs of it on the outside, I would say that's inconsistent. Now, doctor, we were talking about your extraordinary qualifications and in order for you to become a medical toxicologist, um, you had significant amount of training beyond that of an, other physicians. Is that true as a medical toxicologist? Say that again. In order to become board certified, <laughs> I want to pull you to you had a very bad. significant amount of additional training and specific <laughs> experience beyond that of most other physicians. Isn't that true? Yes. And in order to become board certified as an emergency room physician, you had a significant amount of experience and training beyond that of other physicians in order for you to be even qualified to sit for a, a, a to be board certified as an emergency room physician. Isn't that true? Yes. And you're not board certified as a forensic pathologist, isn't that true? Correct, I already said that. <laughs> yes, and I'm just emphasizing that point again. So, and yet, uh, Dr. Shambliss and Dr. Mainland are both board certified forensic pathologists. Correct. And both Dr. Shambliss and Dr. Mainland indicated that these injuries- I know you guys don't like him, I don't like him. of Julie Jensen's body- at He's the doing time, a great cross. Found. And these autopsy, that autopsy photo, combined with Mark Jensen's confession, alleged confession to Aaron Dillard, that his description is consistent, is consistent with the findings at autopsy and the crime scene photo. But you're denying that. Well, you're asking me my opinion. I, of course, find it strange that. that 
these two high qualified forensic pathologists Ooh. reviewed Here she goes. the same material and neither one of them thought about asphyxiation as a possibility given the scientific evidence until it was asked of them to retroactively Ooh, clap back oh, you know that if you, it was consistent you, you think that's what happened you don't think dr shambliss had indicated at the outset that th she could have been asphyxiated you don't think that you weren't aware of that oh. i'm i'm not aware of that but i know that there was the consideration of that because of petechiae on the inside but petechiae on the inside is a non-specific finding in every autopsy uh, what i asked you was this you were unaware of the fact that Dr. Shambliss, from the outset, had suspected asphyxia in this case. You were unaware of that? I'm not aware of what he was aware. That's not good for her. Um, you're unaware of the fact that at her, at the initial, at the testimony, the initial hearing in this matter, uh, um, Dr. Main and said so, I don't Main was uh evaluating i just asked you whether you were aware that at the time that dr mainland testified at the this first not, hearing she could not rule out asphyxia as a contributing factor i'm not aware of what she testified at the time of the first oh, oh lady so doctor when we look at um your differential diagnosis you concluded ethylene glycol poisoning was the um was the cause of death in this matter correct and you didn't offer an opinion as to the manner of death. Yeah, my internet went dead for a correct? second. It's actually my computer, oh, not you my did? internet, you indicated unfortunately. That you had an opinion to a reasonable computer medical is certainty on its as way. the manner of death? I did. What's your opinion to a reasonable medical certainty as the manner of death? Undetermined. Oh, 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 I see. So you couldn't distinguish between possible homicide or suicide. You just said because of the information you had, you couldn't make a choice between homicide and suicide. Correct. Or accident. Or accident. Correct. Well, um, so let's consider some of the information that. That's a super interesting fact. What the jury has heard to help them. Let me think through what that means. And, suicide. Um, and now I'm going to approach and I'm going to start writing things down again. I don't think it's that bad, you but I was thinking the same analogy. Some things that Mark Jensen said, correct? Being, coming across a little bit like Dr. You considered some of the things that Mark Jensen said, correct? Correct. And acknowledging that Mark Jensen is the accused murderer in this case, correct? Correct. So you would acknowledge that in determining reliable versus unreliable, if a person actually murdered somebody, they might be an unreliable source of information about that victim's uh, what that victim was like in the weeks and months preceding her death. Would you agree with that? Correct. So when Mark Jensen wrote, she lost. See, we'll, we'll put this on. He's coming Mark back Jensen around to the weight. She lost fifteen pounds. I didn't know. I didn't know you had this in him. This is this in is a good cross month, in, in month in one month. Hopefully, John's watching. And that would kind of suggest if he just, you know, loss of appetite, extreme emotional upset. It's consistent with suicide, isn't it? It's consistent with depression. It's not necessarily consistent with suicide. Well, that's a good point, too. I mean, pe most people that are depressed don't commit suicide, right? Yes. The overwhelming majority of people who are depressed do not commit suicide, correct? I'm not sure what the statistics are. Well, would it sound like maybe four in 100,000 for women who are 40 to 45? Does that sound about right? I don't know. Okay, well, let's... Uh, maybe as high as nine out of 100,000 women um, who are age 40 to 45 die by suicide. It's a very low number, isn't it? I honestly don't know. Well, most of us want to live and most of us don't want to commit suicide. But those of us who do commit suicide, oftentimes they're depressed. Those of us who right? Yes. Um, now, and if a person is depressed, um, they might lose 15 pounds in a single month, right? Or gain. Yeah, or gain. And so you... So if Mark Jensen is saying that Julie Jensen lost 15 pounds in a single month, but we know for a fact that's not true. I don't I mean, really you know like it right now that Mark, that Julie Jensen did not lose 15 pounds in one month. Don't you? I don't really like how he's using. Yes. We've already discussed that. Yes. The weight. So she weighed 123 the pounds. I think he could have uh, used something else as the bookends. And on 12, one, 
she weighed 115 pounds. So that's an eight pound difference. In, let's see, October, September, October, November, December. So in, um, in, nine, in three months, she lost eight pounds. That's way different than 15 pounds in one month, right? I would submit that eight is different from 15. Yes. And then on 12, four, 98, estimated. Just when I'm praising him, approximately he comes back to this. I don't think this is pounds. near anywhere close None of those to figures add up argument. to anything approximately close to 15 pounds in a single month, does it? Kind of does. No. Oh, okay. She admitted. And then um, with the difference suicide, between eight pounds and I mean, Mark pounds. Jensen was talking about Julie being depressed, right? Correct. The medical examiner said 110 pounds. I, I, I do find it disingenuous that they're using the fact that their um, ME didn't have a scale Julie Jensen to their had favor. told her I don't like neighbor, that. Tad Voigt, that she was concerned that Mark Jensen, her husband Mark Jensen, was trying to poison her? Were you aware of that? I was aware of that, yes. And that, that she was concerned that she didn't know if he was trying to poison her or if he was trying to make it look to her like he was poisoning her so that she would do something stupid and then she'd lose the children. Were you aware of that kind of conundrum, that, that, that problem that Julie was had, having in making a decision? I am aware of that. This is the lane he needs to stay. And were you aware that Julie Jensen uh, had told her third grade, her son's third grade school teacher, Teresa Fazio, that she thought her husband might be trying to kill her? Yes, I'm aware of that. And then within a few days of Julie Jensen sharing with Thaddeus Boyd and with Teresa Fazio her fear that her husband might be trying to kill her. Within a few days of that, she ends up dead. You were, were you aware of that? I'm aware of that. Would you agree that those statements are more consistent with this being a homicide than a suicide? Yes. Wow. It's not good. And the defense isn't objecting much here, y'all. I, I think they felt like, I mean. So Julie's statements are consistent. I think objections concept. hurt them Mark because Jensen's the judge tries to make them suicide, look dumb right? when they object. But. Correct. So, gee, there's still, you don't know what to decide. Is it homicide or is it suicide? So then, in addition to Julie's statements, yes, we so have reasonable doubt. a murder suspect having a sexual relationship with his girl he's coming back in the months on us again holy moly that's more consistent with his it's a motive isn't it it's a motive for mark jensen to murder his wife it could be then we have the years-long sadistic Humiliation. I, I don't like how she's just conceding the apparently point that the this happened. Husband. That's also indicative. It's still of like homicide, isn't alleged it? through hearsay he that the these things that happened. That, then perhaps I think it's the witness's job. Okay. The, first, it's the defense should be objecting. If not, I would at least like the witness to push back. The, like they're starting. Harassment. He's doing a great job of getting her to accept these things as fact. And humiliation. Yeah, you're and right. Then we have Mark Jensen planning a trip with his girlfriend, cruise with his girlfriend. That's also I don't think consistent this is with a homicide, isn't it? I wouldn't go as far as to say that's consistent with a homicide. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I would say that is consistent with somebody having an affair. Yes. Their crappy husband. Finally. They're an adulterer. But that doesn't this equate. Is, this is the type of answer I mean, that should have, Certainly she not. should have been making. Um, but if he's planning a trip with her, um, unless he's planning to bring his wife along, um, he's either planning, um, he's either lying to Kelly, of just stringing her along, uh, or if he's telling Kelly the truth, about wanting to go on this trip with her, he's got to do something with his wife. You would agree with that? No. 
No, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I mean, there are husbands that tell their wives they're going on a business trip and they're not. I just, the, she should have been fighting back like this. This is exactly what I'm saying. Now we're getting, like, hopefully my, my point is kind of made differential here. diagnosis. She should have been doing this a lot more. Um, but Mark Jensen's representations to you are? Mark Jensen's representations were taken at face value to consider, as well as evidence about Julie Jensen and her mental state. And there are facts on both sides that would lead someone to determine whether it's a homicide or a suicide. That is not for me to weigh or decide. And so the point and it's my role here to... is I'm aware of these different facts, bad facts for both sides, but my role is to make sure that there is not a misconception in the science, in the toxicology that suggests one way or another, not to be misconstrued that a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon in a stomach means homicide or that a whole stomach full of ethylene glycol means a suicide. What I'm trying to express is that my analysis, even though I'm aware of these facts on both sides, my cause of death is ethylene glycol poisoning, which is differential diagnosis, because differential diagnosis is a, a diagnosis, and cause of death is a diagnosis. He's got her a little this flustered. This chart right here with homicide and suicide is right, manner is of death, not cause of death. And I'm aware of both sides. That goes into a manner of death analysis, not cause of death analysis. And... My analysis is focused on the science and to represent that there is nothing I don't know why she wasn't saying that, that defines whether this is a ago. suicide or a homicide. And I am not making a opinion about the salacious details that have been presented in this case, which is why my cause of Finally. death is ethylene glycol poisoning and my manner of All death right. is undetermined. It is not for me to decide. But in, I wish her all of her answers would have been consistent with that philosophy. Manner of death. You said it was undetermined, right? I did. In arriving at your manner of death, you did look at the salacious details. You consider what Mark Jensen said about Julie being depressed, right? I did. You did consider what Mark Jensen said about her losing 15 pounds in a single month, correct? I am aware, and I know you like making this discrepancy over and over again. I would hope that nobody would you know, make a statement based on what someone says she someone weighs, back. because I have to estimate people's weights all the time. And I'm a seasoned physician and I don't do it correctly. And I'm sure that he didn't weigh her every day. And it was an estimation. The difference between eight and 15 is negligible. And I just Thank took it you. not at the amount, but that there was weight loss. Not that that means something. She's fighting back and she's fighting back. Considered Dr. Borman's uh, analysis, and Dr. Borman I has just wish her answers that throughout. She started manifesting signs of depression on September 1st. Aligned directly right? with the argument she's Correct. making now. But she'd never manifested any signs or indication of depression before September 1st, 1998. Correct? Uh, I don't remember exactly when he said, but there was there were things in his notes and in his testimony describing a declining um, mental status. Well... September 1st, 1998, he talks about Julie Jensen being depressed, correct? Correct. And now, now were you aware really that it was in August about. of 1998? She's pissed. It looks a lot better for her to stand up for herself like this. Kelly Labonte for the and, defense to fight um, for her. Going to St. Louis. And, it makes John Boy Were you aware that it was like in September okay. of 1998 I, I, that Kelly Labonte That makes perfect sense. That that's when she first started having sexual relations with Mark Jensen. And that's from Natalie, for those who aren't. I'm not aware of when it exactly happened. just listening. Um. Would you agree that a married woman with two small children who suspects her husband is having an affair, that that might cause her to become upset or depressed? Yes. So that might account for Julie Jensen starting to show signs of depression and being upset on September 1st, 1998, if she suspected that her husband was having an affair, right? Correct. And by December 1st, 1998, um, 
by this time, Mark Jensen's affair with Kelly Levante was in full bloom. That might be another reason for, for Julie Jensen to be distressed, to be distraught, to be upset, right? It could be. And especially by December 1st, 1998, if Julie Natalie, Jensen if was telling to, uh, her neighbors uh, listen, and her, do you think and, and her son's his, school teacher that she's His line of questioning around the salacious that would details be another reason for her to be are appropriate. Upset, correct? Sure. And that might account for her weight loss if she's between 123 down to 115 pounds. If she thought her husband was trying to poison her, she might be a lot more careful about what she's eating, wouldn't she? Perhaps. Um, and then when you consider this thing over here for depression and so forth, uh, Dr. Borman asked Julie on December 1st, 1998, if she was suicidal, didn't he? Yes. And she specifically said no. She would never commit suicide because of her children. Correct? Correct. So that's indication of not suicidal. Wouldn't you agree that a young woman who says, my children are everything for me, I live for my children, I would never commit suicide because of my children, a statement like that is an indication of a lack of suicidal intent? At that exact moment in time. Yeah. On December 1st, 1998. Now, then, at the time of Julie's death, you talked about the uplink glycol on board, but she also had other things on board, yeah. right? Yes. What else did she have on board? So I'm going to take she this to mean that it is probably Ambien. objectionable. Now, when um, Dr. Borman, but the defense strategy, but now he says that it's Julie probably Jensen the defense strategy to let him dig himself. Um, he made a reference in his testimony opposed to objection, side which we see a lot. Have you ever heard of side caps? S i g e c a p s. No. Well, um, it's the first thing. Uh, is side caps that the first letter is stands for suicide so um when and it's kind of shorthand for the things that the doctor goes through um suicide interest um oh. doctor, i would object because dr borman actually said he didn't do that when he testified actually it's dr Do dr borman's testimony that i got it from so dr borman rec acknowledged that it was a thing but said that he's that's not what he used when i he hate speaking ask another question uh, I'm going to say, oh, what, so what, what, what are you going to say? <laughs> it's called SIG E caps, not SIG caps. Okay, so I got it wrong. Okay, well, that's why I'm a lawyer, not a doctor. So it's SIG E caps. What so, is SIG Sorry, I didn't know what you were talking about. Oh, so, uh, my <laughs> I thought you were making up some kind of suicide capsule or something. <laughs> so, SIG E caps. What's SIG E caps? SIG E caps. SIG E caps. Um, so forgive me because I'm not a psychiatrist that does this every day, but it's kind of a, a list of things that psychiatrists go through asking questions about um, their mental state, appetite, and, you know, their mood and things like that. And kind of come Natalie, up with a I seem to remember a to rate somebody's depression case where that strategy. Would, okay. Well, where I Dr. Borman the strategy that that Julie seemed to work told very well. She was not suicidal and that she lived for her children. And by the way, there's a number of other people that said that about Julie Jensen too. Are you aware of what her neighbors said about her? That her neighbors all said that Julie Jensen was a profoundly devoted, loving, kind, and sensitive woman, that she loved her children. She would do anything for her children. Did they, were you aware of that? Yes. Um, so, Dr. Foreman had indicated she said she was not suicidal. And also, now, back in 90 or 91, Julie Jensen was seeing a guy by the name of Paul DeFazio, a, a therapist. And he also said she was not suicidal at the time that he was seeing her back in 1990 or 91. That was seven that? years right. before. So two different doctors indicated that she did not appear to be suicidal, correct? Correct. One of them just days before she died, correct? Correct. Were you aware that, um, and I'll, let's get back to this thing about the other stuff on board. She had. Barbara, you're right. Phone. There's a lot of here. What today. else did she have on board? Uh, we're just, I think so we're just also ambient. desensitized ambient. to it at this well, point. That could be either homicide or suicide, right? Sure. So we'll just kind of put this down here. <laughs> what else? Librium.
What else? Uh, paroxetine or Paxil. I'll just write Paxil. Yeah. <laughs> what else? And Benadryl. So Benadryl, Ambien, Librium, Paxil, and ethylene glycol. Correct. Anything else on board or was that it? I'm sorry? Anything else on board or was that it? That That's it. So, uh, so, doctor, as a medical toxicologist, um, certainly you're familiar with the um, with Ambien, correct? Correct. And um, you know that Dr. Borman gave Mark Jensen. He originally 10 said this Ambien was going to be a short cross <laughs> on December second. Were you aware of that? Yes. Oh my. And were you aware that he gave Julie Jensen three Ambien pills between the time that he got home from that appointment and again the morning of December? He's 3rd, assuming hearsay as fact. I don't know now. whether he gave I, them, she took them, but there were three missing. I don't so, like that part. Um, well, according to Mark Jensen, I don't like he them gave three do that. Ambien pills. Were you aware of that? I am aware of of that statement. Yes. I mean, I'm talking about the statement he gave to Detective Ratsburg. He told Detective Ratsburg he gave her a pill when he got home. He gave her another Ambien later that night, and he gave her a third Ambien the morning of December 3rd. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of that. I just don't remember exactly when. And that's consistent also with what Mark Jensen told Aaron Dillard. Uh, were you aware of that? Uh, I, I don't recall. Now, according to Mark Jensen, when he was both speaking to Detective Ratsburg and when he was speaking with Aaron Dillard, Mark Jensen indicated to both of those persons that Julie Jensen was, uh, was awake at around two or three o'clock in the morning of December 2nd, and that she appeared to, in the early morning hours of December 2nd, and that she appeared to be, um, she said, she, I'm, I'm feeling drunk, you know, I, I feel like I'm drunk. and that Mark Jensen indicates that he took her to the computer and showed her this paroxetine list of possible side effects, and one of them was um, vertigo and a variety of other things that might explain her being intoxicated. Do you remember, do you remember hearing about that? Yes. And, um, and it was after that, it was after he'd uh, done that in the early morning hours of December 2nd that he went to see Dr. Borman. I totally defer to mid -morning Natalie. December I understand 2nd. where she's coming from. And, strategy. Um, but and Dr. I, I Borman don't, for something to help I still Julie can't sleep. fully understand why, that? Yes. why the defense is not now, objecting to uh, And Mark Jensen told him, that to both uh, Paul Ratzberg and to Aaron Dillard. Him kind so, of... Um, and furthermore, Dr. Using, Borman like, the Mark that indicated Mark came to statement him and said that he needed to get something to help you. Opposed Julie to sleep. someone said, so, so said that Mark said. So it's a pretty reliable it, scenario that actually Mark Jensen did in fact go see Dr. Borman on the early morning hours of December 2nd or mid morning December 2nd, say 10, between 10 30 and 11 o'clock. And, um, I would object as to the time Dr. Borman did not testify to that. That's the point you're objecting okay, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll, rephrase, I'll rephrase it. According to evidence that will be presented in this case, Dr. Uh, Mark Jensen filled the prescription for the Ambien at around 11.13 a.m. on the morning of December 2nd, 1998. Um, so that kind of indicates yeah, Creed, that sometime right. before the defense was objecting. Uh, 11, 12 or 11.13 a.m., he obtained than the prescription for Ambien from Dr. Borman. That be fair statement. I feel like the yes. judge kind of made them look bad. In now, according to so maybe that's what they're avoiding. Doctor Borman, he indicated that it was to be administered at night. Correct. But that, they didn't object. That's, what right, I'm that's specifically typically when you about. give somebody Ambien, isn't it? When they, before they go to bed at night, right? Correct. But according to Mark Jensen, both in speaking with Detective Ratzberg and in speaking with Aaron Dillard. 
he gave Julie Jensen a dose of Ambien as soon as he got home from the doctor. Were you aware of that? Yes. That's that's not what Dr. Borman had prescribed, was it? Probably not. And Mark Jensen explained to Aaron Dillard that he needed the Ambien to so that Julie would sleep through the adverse symptomology of ethylene glycol poisoning. Were you aware of that? I am now, yes. And you know, that's a pretty good way to do it, isn't it? Objection argumentative. Uh, rephrase it, Mr. See, they're not scared to that. Yeah. If Mark it's Jensen wanted Julie hard. Jensen to sleep through the symptomology of ethylene glycol poisoning, giving her Ambien would assist him in accomplishing that objective, wouldn't it? Yes. And then, according to Mark Jensen, talking to Aaron Dillard, now not talking to Detective Ratzberg, uh, Aaron Dillard indicated that he administered a second dose of ethylene glycol to Julie Jensen in the evening of December 2nd. That's what Aaron Dillard along said. Along with a mixture of juice and antifreeze. Um, now, that second dose of Ambien, that would have been about the time that Dr. Borman was expecting him to give her the first dose of Ambien, wouldn't it be? Correct. And certainly, Dr. Borman was not expecting Mark Jensen to administer a dose of ethylene glycol, was he? I wouldn't think so. Yes. Judge, but I if would gonna... object just to argumentative and not relevant for this witness. A question and answer will stand. Go ahead, Mr. Jim. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> um, Ethylene glycol is by itself an odorless, sweet-tasting substance, isn't it? It is odorless. Laboratory-grade ethylene glycol is very sweet. There are bittering agents that are added to antifreeze. Now. There are now. <laughs> but in 1998, there were additives to antifreeze, but they didn't have a requirement of uh, bittering agents in the state of Wisconsin. Were you aware of that? Well, I know that the bittering agents were added in the late 1990s, and it kind of varied from place to place. Uh, so I, I believe you that if there weren't, then it would have a sweet taste. But, 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 you know, automotive antifreeze is not pure ethylene glycol, is it? I mean, automotive antifreeze does have additives to it, and they're not added to make it taste better. They're added to um, prevent car systems from getting rust. The stuff has got rust inhibitors in it, right? Truth be told, I am not an expert on general automotive automotive knowledge, so I don't know. Doctor, we've stumbled upon something that I know more about than you do. So you, what? you're unaware that automotive antifreeze has rust inhibitors contained within it. Never really thought about it. I think. Okay. He well, in any like event, um, the. If the, the ethylene glycol that Julie Jensen was ingesting, we know this, it was not laboratory grade ethylene glycol, right? There's no reason to think that. Correct. The off the shelf antifreeze that people buy is got a lot of, it's, it's almost pure antifreeze, but it's got a lot of additives, it's got additives for automotive cars. We may disagree for example, on how it's got well a he's doing agent, in this, right? on this cross. Some of them do, yes. But I think and we the all fluorescent agent the is for mechanics, people who work on cars like me, can find out where, if, if a car is leaking antifreeze, we can see it using a uh, black light. Correct. Um, so in order to get somebody to unknowingly ingest ethylene glycol or antifreeze, it would be necessary to put it in another substance and dilute it, correct? Correct. Because otherwise the person would know they're drinking antifreeze, right? Probably. So... Fixing the ratio at, say, one-third antifreeze and two-thirds juice um, would be a good way, perhaps an effective way, to, dis to disguise the presence of antifreeze in the substance that you're slipping to somebody? Maybe. So if, in fact, Mark Jensen did tell Aaron Dillard that on the evening of December Second, 1998, I administered a second dose of ethylene glycol. This is how Julie all Jensen of these questions should have been asked. 
like one third antifreeze and one third juice. And then I also gave her an ambient pill. Um, there's nothing in the medical and in the, in the toxicological results that you saw at the time of Julie's death that would be inconsistent with what I just described, is there? No. And if Mark Jensen had told Aaron Dillard that the next morning he gave Julie Jensen a third dose of ethylene, uh, I'm sorry, a third dose of Ambien, a third Ambien pill, um, there's nothing inconsistent with Julie Jensen's uh, toxicological presentation at the time of her death that's inconsistent with that, is there? Right, there's no way to look at a post-mortem drug level and say how many were administered and exactly when. And that goes for all of these post-mortem substances. But you are aware that the medical examiner's office, the, the deputy medical examiner who was at the scene, collected all the items that were there. I feel right? like he and made his he point collected here. the Ambien that was I, there, right? I, think Doctor, I would, uh, this is actually, it wasn't the medical examiner. This is not correct. Just rephrase it, Mr. Okay, well, you are aware that Whichever authority it was, they collected the Ambien at the scene. There were seven Ambien pills left out of 10, 10 Ambien pills. You were aware of that? Yes. So sometime between the point where Mark Jensen got them on November 13th, I'm, I'm sorry, on December 2nd at 11, 12 or 11, 13 a.m., sometime between that point and the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998, when these pills were collected, somebody had used three Ambien pills, correct? Correct. And Mark Jensen's description that he administered three Ambien pills to Julie Jensen from between the morning of December 2nd, 1998 and the morning of December 3rd, 1998 would be consistent with that pill count, correct? It would be consistent with the pill count, yes. But it would be inconsistent with the doctor's uh, prescription as to how much Ambien to give somebody. Right? He's, he's Correct. Um, you would never, doc, Dr. Borman He's never told himself. Mark Jensen he should get, you should give her a pill as soon as you get home, another one tonight. He, he forgot, one he forgot one rule never across, get in and get out. I don't believe so. Because that's not consistent with the dosage for ambulance. This is carrying on way too long now. Well, it's not the way that it's prescribed. Well, especially for a, a woman who weighs between 110 and 115 oh, pounds. Wait. I mean... If I took an ambulance, oh, so now you now he's saying she may have weighed 110. Pounds, okay, so well, uh, I don't want that? there to be a discrepancy in your weight, though. <laughs> well, okay, well, okay. Please. let's say 202.4 pounds. Okay, well, let's say I weigh approximately 202.4 pounds. Um, I might be able to take a couple, uh, maybe a couple of ambient pills, or have the same effect on me as one ambient pill would have on Julie awesome. Jensen, right? I don't know. She discredited, like, but she just certainly Dr. Borman would not have right prescribed, there. would not have told Mark Jensen, yeah, you should give her three ambient pills in the next 24 hours. Judge Aston answered multiple times. You'd like 17 we'll times. Take this answer, we'll move on. Go ahead, answer it. Oh my God. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> now, on the other hand, if Mark Jensen said, I gave her the first Ambien pill as soon as I got back from the doctor so that Julie would sleep through these symptoms. That's a pretty good course of action for somebody who wanted her to sleep to take, isn't it? Church, this is all asked and answered. It is. Go ahead and answer the question. What? Oh. The purpose of Ambien Judge, is to I'm make you sleep, whether it's through audience, something or it's just been it's asked through the night. So, times. yes, it's the. Ambien is a medication that helps you sleep. So let's move um, to, and now we're going back to this differential between oh, homicide oh, and suicide. Let's not go um, back. You are aware that Mark Jensen told the authorities oh, that he God. went to work. Um, he left for work sometime at 11 o'clock in the morning and arrived to work sometime around noon on December 3rd, 1998. 1998. Are you aware of that? Yes. Are you aware that there are three people who were working in the office that day who testified? So I would still argue that his bias is towards letting everything in. I'm aware, but I don't know what their testimony is. Well, what if I were to tell you all three of them said that Mark Jensen never came to work on December 3rd, 1998? Would that suggest to you that maybe, well, either all three of them are mistaken or lying, or maybe Mark Jensen didn't go to work on December 3rd? 1998. Is that a possibility? Is it a possibility that Mark Jensen did not go to work on December 3rd, 1998? Judge, I would object. I don't know how this witness can answer that. 
It's a simple question. Well, there's Why a possibility. You, I you, agree. Let's ask another question. Thank you. Well, the judge sustained him objection. We'll get back objection. to this notion that Mark Jensen <laughs> is an accused murderer. Um, can oh you see why someone who's accused of murdering his wife sometime in the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998 would want to place him somewhere else on the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998? Judge, I object as to argumentative and again, outside this yeah, well, witness. No, well, you can answer. Oh my this. God. <laughs> that should not come in. I'd ask the question to be read back to the witness. Oh God. I know I'm flip-flopping on this stuff, guys. I think he was doing a great job. Well, now he's going way too long. Sorry, I can't hear through the glass. Oh. Here, just a minute. I'll get you the microphone. No, thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to the notion that Mark Jensen is an accused murderer. In the afternoon of December 3, 1998, would want to place himself somewhere else on December 3, 1998. I suppose. You were aware that Julie Jensen, um, th that medical authorities arrived within two minutes of getting the phone call at 4.31 p.m. on December 3rd, 1998. Were you aware of that? I don't remember the exact time frame that they responded. So if the uh, person who responded, a guy named Dave Wilkinson, a paramedic by the name of Dave Wilkinson, testified that he arrived within a few minutes of receiving the call, um, that's neither consistent or inconsistent with your understanding here? The evidence. Would you agree that if Doctor, if David Wilkinson testified to that, Creed, we're on the and same has records page there. reflecting Some that, that that would pretty much support the proposition that he arrived within minutes of receiving the phone call about Julie Jensen. Yes. And he testified that at the time he arrived there, there was some measure of rigor mortis that had step has set in. Were you aware of that? Yes. And the next day, rigor mortis was largely fully present in the body at the time of autopsy. Were you aware of that? Yes. So the fact that there was some rigor mortis present uh, at the time that the op that the time Dave Wilkinson arrived at around four thirty two or four thirty three p.m. on December third, nineteen ninety eight, that's consistent with her being dead for quite some period of time. Would you agree, Judge? I object. I don't know what quite some period of time means. Well, I'll ask her about that in a minute. Go ahead, ask the question. So I request the question be read back. Oh my God. So the fact that there was some rigor mortis present at the time that Dave Wilkinson arrived at 4.32, 4.33 p.m. on December 3, 1998, that's consistent with being dead for quite some period of time, yes, correct? For quite some period of time, correct? Is that true or not? I don't know what... I do not want to comment that. about rigor mortis because... It is very controversial in the literature about timing somebody's time of death by the presence or absence of rigor mortis. And that is something purely in the lane of a forensic pathologist. And I don't want to cross into their lane. Oh, okay. Except when you're rendering an opinion as to manner of death. <laughs> good. That, that was good. I would object as argumentative. I don't we'll let that one good. answer. Uh, go ahead, answer that, and then we'll go somewhere else. So you don't want to you don't want to intrude upon their lane, except when it comes to rendering an opinion as to manner of death. So, I don't believe that the manner of death is outside of my scope as a medical toxicologist in this particular case. Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened there. I'm bringing it back up right now. We need John back. In and of itself, I don't see a reason why she would not have been able to get out of bed. Yeah, my stream went as down. As far sorry, as back. other medications that would have added to intoxication, I don't have any reason to believe that she would be incapacitated and comatose by those medications. 
certainly intoxicated, not necessarily comatose. Sorry for the... Uh... Yeah, this is why we can't have nice stuff. Sorry about that, y'all. I do have a much better where. So, um, you and we will go back to John uh, the stages um, of ethylene glycol Peter when he gets here too, so we won't have to deal with uh, that. Stage one is EG is what's EG? Ethylene glycol. Oh, okay. So stage one that should maybe oh it's up here too. EG. So drunk, being intoxicated. Yes. And um, then in stage two you say acid. Dosis, glycolic acid, pH 7.4 to 6.9, hyperventilate, oxalic acid. Let's see, it, calcium, too, too much calcium or something? No, the two plus is the ionic charge on the calcium. Okay, calcium oxalate crystals, kidneys. And then on stage three, you've got renal, renal failure, and bun way up. But, you know, I've seen um, stage three of ethylene glycol where the person drops into coma. I mean, no, so nobody in ethylene glycol poisoning, they, they don't drop into a coma? Well, a couple things. So the, <laughs> My there was a VUN, which is the blood urea nitrogen, which is a measurement of your kidney function. And that was ever so slightly elevated in her vitreous. And so that indicates that she was not what we call uremic. I believe the number was 20. And so if you have renal failure and you're, you know, requiring dialysis for whatever reason, okay, um, you can develop uremia where your blood urea nitrogen can go above 100. And that can definitely cause some mental status changes. A BUN of 20 is not very high. Now, there are other laboratory parameters that I alluded to earlier today that would help me differentiate a little bit more from stage two to stage three that you can't do in a dead person. So as I said, she was clearly in stage two. There was some evidence of renal tubular destruction, but I don't think that she was very, very far in to stage three because her BUN was 20, which is not really very high. And most deaths are going to occur in stage two because of this calcium, which doesn't have anything to do with being comatose. Now, certainly if there was swelling on her brain and crystals deposited in her brain, there would, reason, there would be reason to believe that she was comatose, or if her BUN in her vitreous was in the hundreds, and we knew that she was not just in renal failure, but in multi-organ dysfunction, very terminal, terminal stages of stage three, then that might explain comatose. But there's not anything that I see in the toxicology to explain that she would be comatose. You were aware that um, ethylene glycol was found in Julie's liver and in her brain at the time? Uh, uh, I would, let me look at my report real quick. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm with you, Giselle. So, on pathological exam, there is just a mention of mild congestion in the liver. And I remember there's something being possible calcium oxalate crystals, but it mentioned out of plane in the section, which makes it questionable whether there was a great deal of calcium oxalate in the brain. But I will say, when I told you that these calcium oxalate crystals go everywhere, they do go everywhere. The question is to what extent and if they are depositing in parts of the brain that would cause brain swelling and other problems, that could be an explanation of being comatose. So when I've 
I mean, I, I haven't studied this the way you have, but when I was reading about ethylene glycol poisoning, and they were talking about third stage, um, right at the bottom here, they put comatose and then death. So you've never seen a description of ethylene glycol poisoning where the third stage was terminated with um, comatose and then death? You've never seen that? That's not what I just said. No, I, I, so, I'm asking, so you do agree that with regard to stage three, that oftentimes the person becomes comatose. Hey, H and J, and good then, to see you all here. Right? If, if they go to stage three you, uh, and they CCW haven't been treated, first. then they will develop multi-organ dysfunction and can develop coma and death. Okay, he should, it's time to be done. Attorney John Boy. John Boy. So you do know that Julie Jensen died and she was dead oh, on December 3rd, 1998. And your, your testimony, your conclusion is that the cause of death was ethylene glycol poisoning. But you're saying she was somewhere in stage two and trending into stage three at the time of her death? Yes, what I said was there are three things we know definitively without all of the anti-mortem testing that we would do in a living patient. Number one, she had a almost undetectable ethylene glycol level. That is in the setting of calcium oxalate crystals that were seen in the kidney. So we know that she was at least to stage two. The third thing is that there was some evidence of renal tubular destruction on the autopsy. But as we just talked about, her BUN was 20 in her vitreous, which is slightly elevated. Now, the other way that I would want to know about renal failure would be a, um, a measurement of her creatinine, which if you were to go to your physician, they would measure that. We don't have this, so I can only guess where her creatinine might be, but the BUN is somewhat helpful. It's creatinine, and she certainly what was I call creatinine? Uremic. So we know. There's something else. An almost undetectable ethylene glycol level, calcium oxalate crystals present, some element of renal tubular destruction with a BUN of 20, and she's dead. So my opinion would be that she died somewhere in stage two most likely because of calcium, which is where most of these deaths occur. So, Doctor, you just said we know, but that's actually what you know, what you believe, right? You, what you, based on your analysis, and that's what you believe, correct? Yes. Now, um, were you aware of the fact that Mark Jensen um, told Detective Ratzberg and also told Julie's brother, Paul, that on the morning of December 3rd, Julie could not get out of bed? Did he, were you aware of that? Yes. Were you aware of the fact that he had to prop her up in bed so her children could kiss her goodbye? Were you aware of that? Yes. Were you aware of the fact that he told um, Paul Griffin, and I think he also told Detective Raspberry this, that she, she could barely speak, that she was grunting? Were you aware of that? Yes. Well, that's not suggestive or indicative of somebody who could get up out of bed and go down the It's been pr pretty clearly established, the ruling in this case, that is it anything Mark said, is it? is a statement against interest and will come in you don't know i at don't the time that julie jensen is saying goodbye that analysis is pretty odd to me, goodbye but that is the analysis um, and she couldn't speak to them she didn't speak to them and she couldn't get out of bed at that time and when her husband says she couldn't get out of bed you don't think that's inconsistent with her going on the computer at 9 42 a.m and looking up ethylene glycol poisoning Everything that you just described is a person that may be weak, but not comatose. Yeah. Do you think that somebody who's somewhere in the first or second stage of a thing like I, oh, I can't put on subtitles um, is likely uh, going to get up at say, one or two o'clock in the morning um, on December third. We switch the feed. And look up unconsciousness. Or even when you think somebody might do that, break. who's suffering from ethylene glycol poisoning? So that's very specific. But somebody that, as I described already, 
that is intoxicated by ethylene glycol should not be able to not get up and do things. I mean, they may be very weak, they may be very dizzy, they may be still feeling intoxicated. But it wasn't just ethylene glycol, was it? Was it ethylene glycol and ambium and librium? There were other things in her system at the time, right? Right, all of those things that could contribute to intoxication. But also could contribute to her being less able to get up out of bed. And by the way, why? if somebody intentionally on their own took ethylene glycol and librium and zolpidem, why do you think they'd get up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning to look up unconsciousness on the computer? Judge, I would object. This is outside her expertise. Yep. Agree, sustained. Um, do you have a lot more across, Mr. Jambo? No, not a lot more, just a little bit more. We're getting close to our lunch hour. Oh, yes, we are. Just a moment, Judge. Let me confer with my more learned counsel here. He's such... Oh, is he actually talking to his wife? Oh, no, I thought he turned around to his wife for a second there. <laughs> there is one other thing, Doctor. Um, uh, again, I'm very impressed with your background. Oh, and your God, he's so condescending. I, I must have, how, much, how much did you charge for your, uh, to, to evaluate this case and then to come in here and testify? Oh, no. Sorry, guys, we're spinning... Spinning, spinning, spinning. He's asking the, the standard question of um, how much were you paid to come in and testify? Um, let me see if I turn my camera off. It will, will stop the spinning. Probably have to do that after lunch. Uh, well, probably gonna Sorry about that. After lunch. It'll be short, but I think that we should take a lunch All break. Right. Let's do uh, one thirty again, folks. Relax. Don't talk. Here, I'm going to go back think. for the minute we missed. I think well, poisoning um, is likely going to get up at, say, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning on December 3rd and look up unconsciousness. You think somebody might do that who's suffering from ethylene glycol poisoning? Sean should be here soon so we don't have to deal with this. So that's very specific, but somebody that as I described already, that is intoxicated by ethylene glycol should not be able to not we'll find out how long get the break up and is do things. And just I mean, they may be very weak. They may be very dizzy. Just be playing a second. And then what but it wasn't go? just ethylene glycol, was it? Was it ethylene glycol and ambium and librium? There were other things in her system at the time, right? Right, all of those things that could contribute to intoxication. But also could in contribute to her being less able to get up out of bed. And by the way, why? if somebody intentionally on their own took ethylene glycol and librium and zolpidem, why do you think they'd get up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning to look up unconsciousness on the computer? Judge, I would object. This is outside her expertise. Agree, sustained. Um, do you have a lot more across, Mr. Jambo? No, not a lot more, just a little bit more. We're getting close to our lunch hour. Oh, yes, we are. Just a moment, Judge. Let me confer with my more learned counsel here. What, what else was he going to ask? Hey, all, we have new folks coming in. Good to see everybody. We're about to go to lunch break, just replaying the last minute that we missed. There is. Will you all here hit that like button, um, please? Again, I'm very impressed with your background and your qualifications. I, I must have. How much? How much did you charge for your uh, to to evaluate this case and then to come in here and testify? Probably have to do that after lunch. Well, probably going to have to do it after yeah. lunch. It'll be short, but I think that we should take a lunch. All right, break. let's do uh, one thirty again, folks. Relax. You, Don't talk about the case. Thank you. I know what creatine is. I take it every day. But she said it like creat. She said a different word that I. She said it in a way that I don't know if she was talking about the same chemical or not. All right, let's bring down the screen. Thank you, everybody, for being here. John is on his way back. I would expect him to be here soon. And where it is. I think Natalie's going to be able to join us, um, hopefully, if he gets back in time. I think Natalie's going to be able to come on and uh, 
answer some questions that we have about some of the characters in this case. Oh, uh, here, let me see if I can, I can probably send you a link. Nope, I didn't mean to bring that up. One second. Guys, I'm just sending Natalie a link here. Do that now that we don't have the TV screen up. Okay, that should be good. All right, Natalie, I'm sending the link right now. Just came through on um, Twitter. So I think I think we might all be, for uh, John's health, it might be good that he wasn't here for that cross. I don't think he would have been. Um... Okay, cool. It's creatine and, and this are two different things. <laughs> Creatinine. I thought she was just saying creatine weird, but that makes way more sense now. Sorry, just checking on where everybody is. Um, oh, here's Natalie. Hi. Hello. Nice How to meet you. How are you? I'm doing well. Yes. How are you? Oh, I'm okay. I feel bad that John's not here, but I actually had time right now. So I was like, I'm just going to do this now. Well, it's his fault. Oh. <laughs> I know. I do. Right. Well, awesome. and it gives us you something to do over the lunch break without yeah, you, absolutely. Appreciate uh, having it. to just sit and, uh, you know, ramble for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's what I usually do. So questions for you on this case. One, so let's go, because you were watching for most of the morning, right? Or at least listening. Um, I didn't really start watching until I messaged when I had popped in. I had actually been at the Kenosha Courthouse this morning from like 9 to 10. Um, but by the time I came back to my office, I started, um, you know, kind of just checking in because um, my I had an appointment to stand me up. So I was like, hey, I got an hour that I had planned on working. So let's do this instead. That's awesome. Um, so... When Attorney John Boy was doing his cross, so first of all, um, and I'm forgetting her name, but the doctor that was testifying is a toxicologist opposed to a mm -hmm. uh, pathologist, but she still made a finding um, that cause of death was undetermined. Mm -hmm. The question me and the chat have, is it was it proper for him, for Attorney John Boy, to ask questions around, well, did you consider and then put in sal salacious detail number one, mm -hmm. number two, number three, you know, for example, did you consider what, um, oh, I'm going to forget his name too. Um, I suck at names. The uh, jailhouse snitch. Mm -hmm. um, did you consider what the jailhouse snitch said, Mark said? Well, with now, that, you know, um, Experts are one of the only type of people that you can really ask those types of questions to. And part of that is because they are allowed to give their opinion based upon other people's evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that um, she had stated at the beginning, you know, effectively that she had considered all of the evidence in the case when she made her yes. opinion. Yes. And so that's the reason he's being able, able to specifically ask her about it is because her opinion was made in light of all of the evidence of the case including the salacious details. So, I mean, that gives yeah. the state more of an ability to ask about that because it's asking about 
did you take this into consideration when you made your opinion? I mean, and regardless of while, whether or not it's hearsay, things like that, yeah. um, you know, for him to bring them up, um, you know, it still is not improper to ask. Okay. So, Chad, I was right. <laughs> the chat was disagreeing with me on that. And I thought the fact that I really honed in on the fact that she said that she considered all of the evidence. Yeah. And then that would have really, I mean, opened it up. Yeah. As if he, if she hadn't considered everything, if she didn't know all of that, then that'd be something else, which is, you know, um, something that frequently, you know, we do with experts is provide them everything if they want everything, if that's relevant. Sometimes, you know, we intest, intentionally don't give them things because then they're not, you know, allowed to, um, the, then the state can't focus on them. Uh, right. You know, it depends upon whether or not the evidence is relevant to the thing that they're testifying about and considering, you know, what she was testifying about cause of death. You know, I mean, it's, it's just long and drawn out and boring that he asked her like that, um, all those questions. <laughs> but I mean, it's See, permissible is different than, you know, whether or not you should, then you actually should do something. Um. So I actually, and just to make sure we're all clear, I am not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's probably evident, but um, so I actually thought what he was doing, I mean, I think he drew it out a little too long in the mm -hmm. end, but initially I thought he was doing, you, using her to actually kind of weave his narrative based on the questions he was asking. Oh, that's what it was, is because he was asking her specifically about spe salacious details. So he can ask her about all the things that are important to him. Um, sorry, give me one second. Hopefully right. my appointment didn't come back. Give me a second. Yeah, no problem. No. So that's interesting. Um, Creed, I say what you're saying, like maybe I missed the manner in which the questions were asked. I don't think I can go replay Creed, but if you can say, if you can give me an example, um, that would be super awesome. What else do we have going on here? Super fun to have Natalie on. Dude, apparently my appointment is here, so okay. like I'll come back. Yeah. I'll give you guys like five more minutes, but um, before oh. I, yeah, somebody since it's snowing out, I like I'll forgive and let somebody have a fifteen minute late appointment. <laughs> but <Yeah>. um, <laughs> no, with everything, it's you know, and I had um, I know some people in the courtroom watching stuff like that, and I had asked different people at different points in time, you know, how jury's been responding, and I mean. My take on a lot of it is the jury's tired of this from the people okay. who have been looking at the jury is, I mean, there are, I think they kind of think there are two creeps in the room and one of them is Bob Jamboy. Um, okay. and, the, and so, I mean, there is a certain amount of what I said earlier, you know, um, not objecting to things because not wanting to bring people's attention to stuff. Um, mm -hmm. If you object to something, it's usually because it's important as an attorney. And I think that jurors pick up on that. So if it's something that is, you know, you, you have to be careful sometimes with, with objections because that brings attention to something that might not, you know, necessarily be perceived otherwise. Um, it gets overlooked, you know, just when you hear somebody droning on, you don't necessarily listen to every single detail. And sometimes, you know, making a fight over little things can detract from the fact that, you know, it didn't go over well to start with. Yeah. So we actually um, saw reporting from court TV that the jury put their notebooks away immediately, upon, uh, immediately upon cross. Well, that's because they don't care what he's saying. They don't care what he says. That's very yeah. interesting. And, and so, mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, is like, I also, so I know, the players in here is so the woman who it was doing the cross on this um, or rather direct on yep. this, not the cross. Bridget Krause was actually um, an adjunct professor of mine in law school. Oh, she cool. is um, the, one of the heads of the Milwaukee public defender's office trial division. And so I've seen her work and she does object to things. <laughs> so, okay. um, you know, I know that in the beginning there was a lot of stuff that had been overruled, so you, you know, you don't want to rehash things that have already been ruled about, because again, that's bringing attention to things that you might want people to overlook. But I do, you know, personally have experience with her. And I believe that, you know, 
I know that she watches the jury when she's okay. working. Very so cool. I think that that is, you know, something to keep in mind that people forget on the outside is, you know, that's one of the benefits of having multiple attorneys working at the same time is somebody can always be watching the jury. Right. And Jeremy Perry, the, um, the male criminal defense attorney, um, used to be the head of the appellate division for the state public defender's office before he went back down to trial. He um, okay. actually was trial counsel for Darrell Brooks before yep. Brooks went pro se. Right. And so he knows a lot of, you know, things that you have to preserve for the record, stuff like that. He's sitting next to her. You know, I think that in that respect, it's, you know, okay, this has been preserved for the record. I'm going to keep an eye on the jury while you're talking. If it's something that you should actually object about, you know, we signal to each other, you're a team, you work together. Just even tap on the leg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, there, there are little things like, you know, misrepresentation, stuff like that, that you can obviously object to that Bridget yep. was objecting to. She was objecting moment. to that. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, you know, that's a nice thing about having multiple people go on. And, um, you know, the jury, what works with one jury isn't going to work with another jury necessarily. And those are the people you have to sell it to. Right. So there was their opinions and their responses are really the only ones that matter. So if they're not picking up on something or if they're just not buying it at all, I mean, there is an advantage to, um, you know, letting, the prosecution dig themselves a hole that they can't get out of because you know that's something that shouldn't necessarily impact jury deliberations but it always does one of the first things that they go back and talk about is usually you know what they thought of the lawyers yeah and that can very much color the situation so um you know it's if he's coming across unlikable to us and being a bully i mean we're not even there in person so imagine how it comes across in there when he's actually there. Yeah, for sure. Now, I, I asked the chat this morning because I was like, I don't know if people, if he thinks people like him. He kind of, like, he seems like he makes jokes to where, like, where he, 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 he comes across to me as someone that he thinks like everyone likes to hear him talk. But mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the case. I got to go do my meeting. I'll be back in a bit. Awesome. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Hi all. That was fun. Should be back. Hopefully John will be back because John will have great questions for her too. Um, and I don't want John to miss this. <laughs> Come on, John. Where are you? Um, so that that was very good insight. Um, it, it definitely validates what we were hearing from Court TV that the jury put their um, notebooks away. Um, and I would assume the folks that Natalie's talking to in the courtroom are probably not the same folks that I know in the courtroom. Um, they may be more of the legal side of things that know how to read juries. Um, so that's very interesting. I've been concerned. I've been very concerned. Is that We don't like John Boy, right? Um, but does the jury? And I think I got that question answered for me right now. And so that completely colors my um my analysis of his cross examination now that we know that the jury didn't necessarily like him to begin with his tactics of taking that um portable microphone for lack of a better way of saying it and standing right next to the doctor um was probably not nearly as good as a move as I thought it was. Um, I thought it was a, I thought, I mean, it was still, it was still savvy in how he was able to do it. Um, but now it was, pro I, I would totally change my opinion on if it was savvy to actually do it. His methodology of being able to do it was quite smart, I thought. But I bet you the jury freaking hated it now that we know that they were already not really um, keen to him. Uh, I'm going to pull this up. I hope I don't get John yeeted, but 
I, I 100% agree with this. That I've said from the beginning, um, well, let me pull this up first. Well, I'll go to that first. And then, um, so I have yours star too. I want to talk about what you're saying there too. Um, I've said from the beginning, like, I feel like the, um, the detectives and then this prosecution were way too focused on the, um, I'm trying to think, I, this John's channel, I would say it just clear on my channel, I think we'd be fine, but they're focused on, um, we'll, we'll just say the salacious um, side of this. They took, the one thing they took from the garage was Playboys. Hyper focused, it, and they they seem absolutely baffled that anyone would look at porn on their computer. Um, now the number of pictures he has, I will say, seems a little bit weird, but I don't think it's nearly as odd um, as the prosecution tries to paint it. I think some of the witnesses have been a little bit too. Um, willing to kind of go along with that narrative. Uh, finally, our doctor here today did push back and say, yes, I've had cases where pornography was involved. Yeah, but a male with this number of males? Um, well, yeah, like, that's not, I think she finally pushed back a little bit. And, and Kara, I think you're absolutely right. There. A normal jury is um, going, okay, this, a normal jury is saying that number of, those kinds of pictures and that number of pictures do not equate to murder. It might have been interesting to hear once as a little bit of circumstance to it, but hearing it over and over again and making it the focal point of his case, I think is really hurting attorney John Boy. And let's pull up Giselle's because I think she has a very good point here too. But we aren't any different than the jurors. As a whole, we just don't like bullying nice people. That's what John Boy has been doing. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I he's a jerk. He's an absolute like like I said. I think his cross was fairly good um, until he just let it go on too long. But. Um, his cross was fairly good until he let it go on. And some of you guys were disagreeing with me. And I said, the one thing we can agree on is he's a jerk. He's condescending. Um, he does that thing that I hate when people do. He gets condescending and is wrong and gets pointed out on it. Um, that happened to him several times. Not a good look. Now, in terms of us just being a normal jury. I don't know if I give this chat too much credit. I don't think I do. You are all more savvy in terms of what you're looking for um, than I think a normal jury would. Um, and Natalie will be coming back, y'all. So hopefully with John, because that'll be super fun. If any of you tweet, make sure you tweet the link out. Uh, make sure you're hitting that like button so folks know to come... Uh, Hang out with us. Uh, since I did that, let's do the full YouTube thing. Please hit the like button. Smash that like button for John. That gets us into the, him into the algorithm. Gets us in the algorithm. It's kind of an us thing right now. Um, which is super helpful considering there's another trial that we're competing with. Um, and that we weren't 100% clear if we were going to be live all day this morning. Speaking of not being 100% clear if we were or not, make sure you have that notification bell rung. Sometimes things get crazy in the lives of us YouTubers, um, and we're doing our best to make sure that we can come on, um, have to move some things around. Have that notification bell on, so if, at, if we decide to go live at the last minute, you're alerted to it. Um, finally, if you haven't, I'm sure most of you have, Subscribe to the channel. We all know why to do that. Um, it's super helpful for us. Gets us in the algorithm. Um, and for someone like me, 
I need a certain number of subscribers to start be, to be able to monetize. So if you're so inclined, I'm sure one of our uh, illustrious mods will drop my link um, soon. My channel is called Trial Junkie. Most of you, I'm sure, know. But if you haven't gone over to subscribe, please do. We do over there. This is what we're doing right here. We watch trials, gavel to gavel, um, and provide analysis. John will be on with me as much as I can talk him into it. He has the standing invite. Um, honestly, I think John and I work well together. And I know some of you guys take a little bit of offense to him calling me a layman. It's it's not. It's not offensive. Um, he he is. I, I didn't go to law school. It's it's just a fact. But I um, have watched a lot of trials, and I I've seen a lot of things, and I also know how to ask questions. Um, John knows the law, and is, is very good at explaining it. But sometimes lawyers get a little bit too legal, and I can come in and say, okay, what does that mean for us in the chat, right? All that to say, John will be on my channel often as well. Um, so please go over there and subscribe. Kara, thank you so much for the kind donation on my cash app. If so, if you are also inclined, and please, if, you, if it's a choice between super chatting John or sending me a cash app, please, please, please send John the super chat. Um, this is his channel. He's going way above and beyond to help me try to build my channel. Um, so if it comes down to it, please super chat, John. But if you are so inclined to do both, uh, you can always cash out me. The cash app tag, I think is what they call it, is um, the, the cash app tag is just trial junkie. I think it's dollar sign trial junkie. I don't know much about cash app, but when I say it, I some of you guys do send uh, donations, so it sounds like I'm saying it right. Um, again, it's cash app tag trial junkie. Oh, speaking of cash app, someone can tell me why certain donations come in and they just come in, and certain I have to accept. I'd be super interested in that too. It might, I think it might just be a dollar amount, but yes, I've missed a couple because I didn't know I needed to accept them. Um, and now that I go to accept them all the time, not all of them have to be accepted. Again, thank you for that. John will be here soon. Uh, if you have questions, send in those super chats. Um, comments, send in those super chats. It will certainly help John. If you're waiting for John to come and we're going to bombard him with super chats, I think that's totally fine too. Um, what else do we have going on? I missed yesterday. Sounds like John Boy lost his mind, but I don't know how to go through like nine hours of trial to find um, his little fit. Let me look. Oh, how cool is that though? How cool is that to get like, I mean, I didn't know how much Natalie's allowed to say about other colleagues. Um, sounds like she's allowed to say a lot. I, I, I sense that she already shied away from the judge. Um, I'll wait for John to kind of ask around that because he would know the more appropriate questions to ask. Um, it's not foreign currency. They're all from, uh, that's causing me to accept them. I, I think it's, they were all U.S. dollars. But uh, you know what? Good point, Lord. Uh, Lord Crocos, Croco Squirrel. Um, it could be foreign currency because there is, a lot of diversity in this chat, which is awesome. People from all around the world. All right. What do we have? So Natalie followed me on Twitter. It was probably just so that she could get a DM, but I'm still super stoked about that. Um, uh, I missed your comment earlier, Anthony. Let me scroll up to it. How long ago was it, Anthony? Maybe, Anthony, can you just comment it again? I'm sorry. It's hard to scroll up on these things. Um, so John said he should be here a little while ago. So hopefully we're seeing him. 
I don't know how much time he had to watch, but we'll get his take if we can. Guys, uh, this is a perfect time to throw questions out to me. Give me give me little um, jump off points uh, to go on a rant. Super helpful to me. Interesting. I gotta get. I gotta go check that out. The Kenosha County Eye on John Boy. Should we read it now? Let's do it. I'm gonna find it. Bear with me, chat. I'm gonna. I'm gonna search for something. So I get it. I, not that great at doing two things at once, but I, I think that would be super interesting. Oh, well, it popped right up for me, so let's pull it up. This this, this is super interesting to me. Whoever uh, threw that out there, I think it might have been Melody. Uh, let's read it together. You know, I am not nearly as good at reading on screen as John is, so bear with me. But I think I can do a fairly good job. All right, let's zoom this in. Maybe. Technology. Oh, but I'm gonna have to scroll over here. Okay, this is gonna be weird. I'm gonna be looking away from you guys a little bit, but that's right. Mark Jensen is facing his third criminal proceeding for alleged 1998 anti-freeze murder of his wife, Julie. In 2007, okay, we know the details of this case. Oh, okay, they're going to go right into it. In 2007 and 2008, former Kenosha DA uh, Bob Jamboy, so he was the former DA. That That's good to point out. Um, tried the case as a special prosecutor. Jensen was found guilty. So he was a special prosecutor back then, too. Oh, I'm missing Anthony's question again. Sorry. Um, thank you. Let's pull it up. In the 90s, having porn addiction was not that rare. It was free and you could get it at home. So a lot of people developed an addiction. I think it's even worse now. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, it was, the internet was around. I think I quoted Avin and Q the other day. There's a song The Internet is for Porn. Thank you. Uh, not right. And Anthony, was that the question or was there or something else? Okay, yep, that was it. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I mean, I don't want to get too into that. Just it's John's channel. Um, but you're absolutely right. Okay, so former Kenosha DA Robert John Boyce tried the case as a special prosecutor. Jensen was found guilty, according to John Boyce, because. According to John Boyce, because of his excellent lawyering. Okay, interesting. After a lengthy appeals process, in the, and that's a quote, the excellent lawyering. After a lengthy appeals process, the Wisconsin State Courts and the Federal Courts, the Seventh Court of Appeals, ordered a new trial. Kenosha Judge Chad Kirkman. Okay, we've all heard this history, right? Chad Kirkman defied the higher court's ruling and found, guilt, found Jensen guilty without trial. So that might be what they call Jensen, too. The Wisconsin Court of Appeals wouldn't permit Kirkman's unprecedented ruling in defiance of federal court. Therefore, earlier this month, Jensen's second trial started. John Boy is prosecuting this case again as special prosecutor. So that's all history that we knew. Um, John Boyce was born in 52. He moved to Kenosha in 1974. Uh, he went to UW Parkside. And he then went to the University of Wisconsin Law School. I don't think we all care about this. He was, was well, let's go through this. He was hired by the city of Kenosha as an assistant city attorney, prosecuting non-criminal ordinances. Okay. And he then worked his way up 
<laughs> Kenosha County Eye has some interesting ads. Um, hey, you all, I just realized. Bear with me. Sorry. Okay, I am going to have to bounce in about 20 minutes. So if John's not back here in 20 minutes, you guys will be left to yourselves. But um, I'm going to text him real quick. Okay, cool. Sorry. Um, KCE has spoken... Okay, Kenosha County I has spoken to attorneys and other legal community who were around during the John Boyce tenure as DA. Most of them have some things to say. Bob John Boyce is a hothead. KC, KCE did some digging, and we quickly found few examples that would suggest this was true. When push comes to shove... In 1988, John Boyce has never, had never lost an OWI trial. Um, I think that's probably driving well, operating well, intoxicated. That was until he tried a case in which criminal defense attorney Robert S. represented a defendant. So, 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 oh, is that uh, Sheriffisi? Uh, that might be Sharfisi. Won the case uh, marking John Boyce's first OWL trial loss. At the time, John Boyce was run, running to be the Kenosha County DA and had boasted in political ads that he had a 100% record pro prosecuting OWIs. That's crazy, too. Attorney S. asked at the same time, looks like you have to change the ads. This comment would later come to haunt. Body. Attorney S. Attorney S would later oppose John Boyce in a criminal matter 11 years into his tenure as DA. Attorney S. and John Boyce were in a preliminary hearing on Thursday, October 20, 2000, in front of Kenosha County Circuit Commissioner Carl Greco. Attorney S. client was being, um, oh, some is salt and pepper. Okay, sorry. Uh, attorney uh, where was I? In front of Kenosha County Commissioner Carl Greco. Attorney S. client was being charged with a domestic related crime, and John Boyce added a firearm enhancer to the charge, which Attorney S. thought, thought was ridiculous because the gun was non functional and in rusty pieces. A verbal altercation began between the prosecutor and the criminal defense attorney. John Boyce yells, I've been taking crap from this wheezy little creep for 12 years now. And gave Attorney S. a hard shove. Attorney S. believes 12 years comment was from John Boyce's OWI defeat at the hands of Attorney S. 12 years prior. Apparently, John, John Boyce holds a grudge. John Boyce has never faced criminal charges because Attorney S. didn't wish to pursue the matter. But that didn't stop taxpayers from roasting John Boyce in letters to the editor. Robert John Boyce has his clique of self-appointed Many uh, messiahs, ne oh, Robert John Boyce and his clique of self-appointed messiahs need to realize that the law applies to them as well as to others," said 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 somebody in November of 2004. Another Kenosha taxpayer was upset, saying his nephew was criminally charged for similar conduct. Adding, "Now I ask you, is your day DA exempt from these charges?" Because of his position, my nephew won't be. All right, the car horn debacle. A young man once pulled into a driveway of Bob Jamboy's home. He was there to pick up Bob's daughter to take her on a date. This is going to be great. <laughs> the man beeped the horn instead of knocking on the door. The kid was a teenager, so maybe he was nervous about meeting the hothead DA in person. This ticked off Jamboy's. He went outside and told the kid to pop the hood. The kid obliged. John Boyd then proceeded to rip the wires that went to the horn out of his car. John Boyd learned that the kid didn't have a valid driver's license. Did John Boyd use his official law enforcement DMV clearance to check the young man's license status? As likely as it is, we don't know. He refused to answer our question. This certainly could have been 
charged as a criminal act of damaged property. This guy's nuts. <laughs> All right. Next heading is from Cheeseburger to County Jail. According to Kenosha Police Report, John Boyce went to McDonald's on Sheridan Road for lunch in October in August of 2004. A 40-year-old home. Oh, I think this is the one the chat has been telling us about. A 40-year-old homeless man named Joseph McGraw was in the restaurant eating a cheeseburger. According to McGraw, a man who did not know, a man that he did not know, came up to him and called him a vagrant. Jamboy's statement to police said that McGraw asked Jamboy for the time and asked, could you spare me a buck? Jamboy said, that, then told the man that it, it was against the law to panhandle and Jamboy wouldn't allow that in his, in his community. He then ordered the man out of the restaurant, and according to a source, the two got physical, and Jam Boyce detained the man, who had been drinking. In Wisconsin, public intoxication is treated as a, as a social ill and is not criminalized. Pan- panhandling has since been declared constitutionally protected free speech. When Kenosha police or officers arrived, Jam Boyce ordered them to arrest McGraw and charge him with, with state disorderly conduct charges. The man was taken to jail and booked. He would never face criminal charges, but he was mailed a $102 municipal ordinance citation for begging on October 4, 2004. On March 2, 2005, the Kenosha, the Kenosha municipal judge dismissed the charge. So we've all heard about that one. What a what a lunatic! The Kenosha News gave Jamboys a dart a few days later for throwing his weight around and having a panlander who asked him for a buck arrested for disorderly conduct. The paper called him an overzealous prosecutor. Longtime Kenosha News columnist Bill uh, Guida, Guida, Guida wrote the following about the incident on August 31st, on August 31st, 2004. I don't know anything about, uh, hold on guys, one second. I'll be right back. Hey, sorry about that all. And I am going to have to jump in just a few minutes. Hopefully John will get here. I texted him. Um, He said he'll be back by then. Um, Yeah, so John should be back real soon. Okay, so let's finish reading this though. Um, Okay, so that's what the Kenosha County DA or paper said. Um, according to a lawsuit filed by federal court, John Boys applied for a position at the Dane County DA's office at the ur- urging of the Deputy District Attorney Tom Fallen in 2015. He was encouraged to apply because he brought significant trial experience to the office, which was severely lacking at the time. The Dane County DA's office did hire John Boys in 2015. John Boys then claimed that he successfully prosecuted several high-profile defendants while offering success, successful membership and tutelage to younger trial attorneys. Dane County DA Ismail Ozain denied all of these claims in court, including that Jamboy secured a conviction in the Jensen case because of excellent lawyering. In 2016, Jamboy's ran against Ozain and lost. Jamboy sued Ozain in 2017, claiming he was treated unfairly after the election and the, and the case settled. Jeez. The Dane County DA is refusing to hand over this 
settlement documents to KCE, the Wisconsin GOG is review, reviewing this denial. Okay. There's Beverly Jam Boys. I don't know if there's more. Okay, there's another one. Uh, there's an interesting prosecution team. The Kenosha County I has received no fewer than a dozen questions about two of the three women assisting the prosecution. Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil is an experienced prosecutor. No, nothing suspicious there. But Jamboy's wife, Beverly Jamboy's, and good friend Joyce Erickson were introduced to the jury many times. Jamboy's introduced Beverly as public service special prosecutor. If you don't recognize that title, you are not alone. Neither does Kenosha County legal community. Beverly's public available curriculum, uh, uh, her, her CV, the mentions zero experience as a prosecutor. Even more tra- strange, John Boyce introduced local Democrat activist Joyce Erickson, Erickson as a jury expert. We could find no one within the legal community with any knowledge that Erickson is a jury expert. Erickson is a very vocal on social media and likes to attack conservatives. We don't know that Erickson and Beverly were paid activists. Oh, wait. We do know that Erickson and Beverly were paid activists that lobbied in favor of a Kenosha casino and for an indoor smoking ban with the Tobacco Free Coalition and Kind, (laughs) Uh, which is another anti-smoking thing. Sounds like we might have as much politics in this case as we do in the Murdoch trial. Erickson is good friends with Bob and Beverly, sometimes hosting them at her home. Casey has not yet learned if the county or state is footing the bill for the two women's services. That seems unnecessary, but we'll continue to dig. I love the Kenosha County Eye. On, on January 11th, 2023, the third day of trial, Joyce... And yeah, we all heard him scream, boy, scream at the judge. Oh, Jamboys ran against the judge in 2005, and many in Kenosha believe it was due to Jamboys off the rails behavior. Uh, oh, jo- Jamboys lost to him, and many think it was because of his off the rails behavior. They, so they don't like each other. That's kind of an interesting color t- for us to uh, think through there. Um. I was ready for this type of behavior as seen above. There are possibly three weeks left of this trial. For the betterment of the community, let's hope John Boyce can contain his hot temper. Amen to that. And let's just see who the author of that was. I think it's, um, I'm trying to remember his name. Let's see. I want to give him a shout out. Credit him. Yeah, Ke- Kevin Mathewson. Can't do that. And I think Kevin is also in the courtroom. But so shout out to Kenosha County I for that information. How interesting was that? I'm glad. And shout out to um, whoever in the chat mentioned that to me because that's very, very interesting. All right, folks, I have to step away for a few minutes. I am told that the illustrious John Robine is on his way and should be here very shortly he's two minutes out when did he say that he said that now he's coming to take his channel back i'll see if i can't hang till he's here but i'm gonna have to bounce really quickly after that so i mean i think we all kind of knew there was issues with this DA, but that um, that that paints it in a whole and it paints it in the same light, just in brighter colors, right? Um, and just so you guys don't, just so we're clear, I gotta leave for an hour at most, and then I'll be back to hang out with John. Um, thank you all for having me and hanging out with me as I uh, commandeered the channel for the whole morning. I had a ton of fun. Um, when John gets back, let's bombard him with some super chats. Let's turn this chat. Let's turn this chat all kinds of different colors. Um, if you enjoyed hanging out with me, you can always head over to Trial Junkie. 
I'm sure they'll drop the link in the chat. Uh, we do the same things over at Trial Drunkie. I would love your subscription. And um, as you all know, where are we at? Oh, let's see. Where? Oh, just trying to get me to a thousand. I don't know how many uh, how many subscribers I got. Um, if you haven't subscribed to John's channel, please subscribe to J Robine Law. I'm sure most of you here have, but some of you may be here for the first time. Uh, John's also a very great listener. He's a true lawyer that can provide even more detail into the legal analysis that we make on both his channel and my channel. I'm at 361. All right, you guys got me over 360. That's awesome. Thank you all. Um, John, hurry. I got to go. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, let's get me to 1,000. The watch hours will not be a problem for me to get monetized. When you stream full trials, watch hours aren't that hard to get. Um, but I do have to get over 1,000 to get monetized. I do plan on refocusing i know i keep saying this i'll say it one more time if i don't hold up to it this time I already stop saying it but i plan on dropping more on-demand videos as well um so head on over subscribe all right john's not here but do not fear he's going to be yep he's one block away i'm dipping um i will be back i'm going to oh i'm no i'm gonna leave the share off john it's just gonna be my face for just a little bit um but i'll talk to you all soon
So good afternoon, everyone. I am back. I have reconquered the channel from Cole. I would like to thank him very much for his uh, really selfless service to take care of this this morning. So give me a couple seconds while I set everything up. And we will be back to what is a fantastic fantastically ridiculous case. And I do apologize for the interruption service, and I do thank Cole for taking the time in the meanwhile to make sure that we do provide uninterrupted coverage of this chaos. And I have some comments from the morning. I watched a little bit of it, and we will talk about that because I think that we're probably going to have a little bit of time before the court returns. No, you be muted. So, sorry guys, I had some real life lawyering stuff that I had to do. No, it's not a it's not a new camera, Mean John. This is the one that I've been using for a little while. Oh, CCW and H and J, more importantly. I hope seriously hopes and prayers that that goes well. That can do wonders for folks. So please, everybody. Support CCW and H and J. It really does mean the world that we have three folks under one YouTube channel who have been extremely kind and helpful. And have these girls have had greater insights than many attorneys that I know. So that is I'm glad that it's getting taken care of. I'm sorry that it has to happen in the first place, but that makes a huge difference. And I'm hoping that everything goes well. Then we have Kara with the $5 super chat. Both of you are great on your own, but together as an old married couple is the stream at its finest. You're probably right about that. Uh, I was watching in the car some of this morning's stuff and i will comment on it a little bit but thank you again cara for the five dollar super chat and guys i did not have the opportunity to point this out uh because cole was in charge this morning uh all of your super chats will be read um seems like we did not necessarily get any this morning unless cole has something that i'm not aware of so if any of those were missed, please let me know. And I will be sure to read them and we will discuss them together. Uh, this morning was, I, I, I don't even know where to begin, but I'm gonna recenter. Stacy for the $2 super chat, daily coffee. Thank you for setting up the stream this morning. Yeah, I, I, I had to do it in a really rapid fashion in order to get to another lawyer's office and take care of what I had to do today. Thank you all for being here for Cole. I know he has a relatively small channel at this point. I would love if we can try and pump him up. I know a lot of you have. Uh, I think that he did a fantastic job from at least what I have seen, certainly. There were times when he was screaming at the camera when I absolutely would have been too. So that was kind of cool to watch from an outsider's perspective. It was a little weird watching my own channel and not being there.
Yes, uh, Cole did text me. Shoot, this might actually be pretty good. Give me one second. Let me do that. One second, folks. There's a little bit of behind the scenes that needs to happen. All right, so um, all right, so this is an open invitation. If Natalie has the opportunity to come on, it would be fantastic to discuss it. <laughs> Ruger. All right, that's fair and kind of funny. So while we are still on lunch break, let me uh, go ahead and present the course so we make sure we don't miss anything. And then I'm going to do my opinion as it relates to this morning's uh, Kind of strange testimony. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. All right, we can get a, a croc scroll on for a little bit. Cool. Yeah, so Croc Squirrel is invited, and I would love to hear the commentary on how the morning went. I saw a little bit, but I am really hoping that you can fill me in, my friend. You're still muted, just so you know. But okay. so... <laughs> Yeah, we get to listen to Jam Boys Badger Witnesses. Just, I get the impression that this guy's got got just a permanent man. I, it's like he want. It, it's like he feels like he has to be here. He didn't want to be here, and he wants to make sure everybody freaking knows it, especially Mark Jensen. Okay. <laughs> and this so last explain, is, so explain that a little bit. Well. He doesn't actually ever seem to get unmad. I am told that he has a, he is just, he's absolutely infamous for treating people the way he does in the court of law. He's, he's been doing here. Um, he's an aggressive asshole. <laughs> just, that's his trial style. And the kind of, he's getting away with the kind of behaviors that he's actually known for. Sorry, one second. I just want to get Debbie's chat in. Um, I appreciate you so much more of talking the LNC chat. They have no idea what reasonable doubt is. I've learned so much because of this wreck. Thank you very much, Debbie. And it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you again. And like I said, I really appreciate the super chats and the memberships. You do not have to in order for me to try and address your questions. It just makes it a lot easier when it is, you know, highlighted for me. But yes, I did go back and I found that, Debbie. Sorry about that, Croc. Go ahead. Yeah, no, he's uh, he tried to bully a he tried to bully a doctor earlier today, and she just she she put it, put, she put a stop to him. <laughs> That's the that was the part that I was she watching. Pushed she pushed back. She pushed back on him pretty good. So that was the part that I was watching and I absolutely, so I had it on in the car and I thought she did a fantastic job. Almost, they weren't formal objections, but responding to him in real time. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, you go girl. And it's not easy to do that without coming across a certain way. It's like, hey, you get them, lady. Get yeah. That's right. We need it. But I yeah, was no. here when, when Jamboy started his opening is when I actually thought that uh, that's when I think that Cole kind of woke up a little bit. I thought it was a little bit quiet, quieter than I might have been <laughs> in the direct. But yeah, that I, cross, I, I missed the first hour or so. Yeah, but that cross when Jamboy started talking about you know, favorite meals and stuff. I was like, I, "Why is this? Is this actually a cross examination, or are you telling us something?" Like, I, 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 I seem to recall he went back. He he went after he went after one of them for uh, about the about the penis pics. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Because I haven't even monetized this stream yet, so that's already screwed. Nah, you'll be fine. We're far enough in, they might not notice. They probably won't notice. Well, now I'm turning it on, so oh, well, they're okay. definitely going to notice. Yeah. Because I didn't do that the time that you're about to hours. Hours. this job. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I, I was sitting there and he was going through it he's like you know are there good things in two glasses of red wine and my first answer was yes alcohol yeah but al alcohol is technically a poison so mm -hmm. you know i don't know if he was trying to conflate the two and then he made the point about uh what was it the husband comes in for some sort of liver or comes in for some sort of an incident and he says, oh, I had two drinks. And the wife's like, no, you had half a bottle of whiskey. And I'm like, you know, you're and your blood alcohol content is 0.32. Ouch. And I'm like, you know, Jamboy, just just so you know, these are really specific facts. Are, are you trying to tell us something Pretty like sure it, Mark could at is that this point, cry for sure help enough if he wanted to. <laughs> is it a legal hypothetical or is it a cry for help? Mm, on his part, probably. <laughs> I may I, I'm making it as a joke, but it's like, dear lord. I, I don't even know what to, I, I have no idea what to do with this morning's testimony. I really, really wish that I had some sort of legal analysis to bring to it. But unfortunately, John Boy has a remarkable way of not using any law in his examinations. So those were the things that jumped out to me um you let me know if you caught some of it or even the chat if there's something i missed that you have a question about you are more than welcome to ask i would love to hear it because we probably have another 15 or so minutes before the court returns oh yikes well, my, the the one that really stuck out in the mind was this lady who just stuck it back to him unlike the guy unlike the guy we were uh, unlike the the firearms tool marks expert from uh, the Murdoch trial, but Loki, that Loki and I were looking at last night. God, that guy needs to learn how to speak. <coughs> the last 15 minutes of cross? All right, we can go back and do that. Yeah, sure, let's do that. Because that was kind of semi-entertaining. Let's see if I can find it. Does anybody have a timestamp for me? That should be about right, right there, actually. Minus uh, two forty-two thirty-nine. All right. Oh yeah, unhinged. No. Hang on. Give me I'll one second. A little bit more. Uh, well, okay. You can right. Put his name and put in the name Julie Jensen as the. Yeah, turn up, let me turn up the volume a little bit. Are you aware that the jury is now the jury is 
This is one thing that drove me nuts is that he doesn't speak into the microphone properly. That kind of behavior reflects a, a malicious, a sadistic frame of mind on the person who would do something like that? Yes. And would that be relevant to the issue of whether or not the person what? who did that on April 13th, 1998, as part of a pattern of harassment for the last several years, would have a motive to murder Julie Jensen on December 3rd, 1998? Possibly. Wait, what? Object! Where the hell? I, I haven't seen this. This was not on when I was driving. He was talking with his girlfriend. Oh, it's just it. Natalie says that uh, they may not be objecting because they don't want to call attention to it. Needed to do something. Again, that's possible. I'm not going to agree with that. I would say that that makes him guilty as an adulterer, but not necessarily as a murderer. Sure. I mean, good answer. Get a divorce, yes. Right? I guess that's and a good answer. You could have planned to get a divorce, right? Yes. In fact, at the time that communication was taking place between Mark Jensen, who was married to Julie Jensen, Kelly Labonte at that point was not actually any longer Kelly Labonte. Her name was actually Kelly Greenman, and she was married to Mark Greenman. Did you know that? No. Did you know that Kelly Labonte, or I'm sorry, Kelly so Greenman at that point was communicating part of this with Mark Jensen know. via email and saying, well, you know, Oh, by the way, we're already yellow. So we finally sped run this what are you gonna where do? it took about a minute and a half. Do you, are you aware that Kelly so, Freeman had said if you would like to contribute to the channel, Super Chats are always welcome. Mentioned. If you would not like to pay you, you 30%, that Mark Jensen responded. Reason. That, well, you know, yeah, well, well, that's just noise in the description. greater picture of things. Do you, were you aware that that's how he responded to the details that's that okay. supposed to be taken care of? Almost wife, a minute. Children, they were just between me turning it on picture of things and Mark <laughs> Jensen's estimation were you aware of that no and were you aware back, that during the while. course of the ensuing months and the ensuing I mean, days my fault anyway i think they probably the time he had this that time communication because. with kelly levante or kelly greenman right up to the time of julie jensen's death there was not so, a great i do know that they objected prior. this was about when, when no. I had but one single arrived at my destination. A property and agreement. To Were you aware of that? Things. No. There was not one single search about child custody. Were you aware of that? No. There was not one single search about anything relating to divorcing his wife or property maintenance or property division. Were you aware of that? He doesn't no. necessarily but there need were to do several a search. How is this within the property. scope of her expertise? It's about not. Um, She's a toxicologist. Pipe bombs. Right. There was, uh, several searches using the anarchist cookbook looking for ways to kill your spouse. Were you aware of that? Judge, I would object. That's not what those searches said. Well, I think there was one search. Oh, shut up, Judge! Sentencing of a pipe bomb person. So that's different. And remember, we advised the jury that just because it wasn't on the screen. Okay, we'll, we'll withdraw that last question. Thank you. Okay, we actually had a decent ruling. You, you were not aware that Mark Jensen had gone on the internet and was looking up things like botulism, pipe bombs, um, a variety of other poisons. You weren't aware of that? No. You, were you aware that you know, a word search was done for the unallocated space of Mark Jensen's computer? Uh, and the number one word that was searched more than it, that came up more often than all the other words was poison. Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that Mark Jensen had 20, several hundred, hundreds and hundreds and no, hundreds of people on his No, And in this in case, I'm going to disagree with Cole. No. I you would agree respect that him immensely. To have she reviewed everything that was provided to her. He's asking about well, materials that thing. she's already admitted were yeah. not provided. It reflects an obsession, perhaps, an unhealthy obsession with male genitalia. Would you agree? Yes. And it marked, so. This is not appropriate somebody, questioning. Was no. these penis photos all around the house for years and years and years and years. The fact that Mark Jensen has several hundred penis photos on his computer, that might reflect that. Do we know it's actually his personal correct? computer? Possibly, or if yeah. anyone else has access to it? Yes. He's asking her Jensen about in the materials that she was not provided. She'd become Kelly Labonte again by this point. And he already made but that point. Her and this was part of the stuff that I was watching when I was shape and in the car. Penis she'd ever encountered in her life. Yeah. So yeah. I'm fairly comfortable yeah. saying he is literally asking her to give opinions on materials that she did not have when she formed her opinion. This is not appropriate. The understanding from the jury. No, no, it's not. 
past, so I'm not sure as how. I don't know why he's so hung up on it. Maybe he enjoyed. Maybe he Actually, enjoyed the Ron, view while he was going over it. That that conversation I, necessarily occurred after Julie Jensen's death. I don't. I don't agree with that. Fine. Uh, that, 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 that's not a correct statement. So we'll go ahead. So uh, did you answer that? By the way, is he a prosecutor or some sort of like mega church pastor right now? Um, I'm going with mega church pastor. Were you aware of Mark Jensen in the early stages of with Kelly Levante began by this point that he was asking her to try to pursue the besides Jason's Oh Pat, I think I missed that. Yo, Pat, thank you so much for the 20 gifted memberships. And guys, if you are not already a member, please so in all the cases, allow the that that you membership. In your life I would love to see everybody in the green here. Somebody who did something like that? Thank you again, Pat. That's awesome. I really do appreciate it. Well, I think you asked her about her experience. And, and guys, please give it up for her. That. That's I awesome. I didn't ask her about the specific facts, I'm sure. I mean, it's just not it's relevant. About some specific facts, poisoning and stuff like that. That's her expertise, Judge. That's why I, I asked her that. that. So go ahead. Ask the question. Could you read the question back, please? I don't think I have a proper so answer for that. Yes. You don't know, encounter somebody that twenty two hundred hundreds and hundreds of penis photos on their computer. Why is this relevant? He does that is that there have been plenty of cases I've been involved in where there's pornographic material on somebody's computer. Okay, so you've encountered a case where a man I understand everyone's saying totality of the evidence. That's not how this works. Computer, hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of, the of evidence photos of penis. Is the totality of the evidence that she actually received? Not specifically as you described. Not what she explicitly uh, said. I have a question right now. She didn't. Our Jesus. break is coming really close. Do you, uh, I don't want to interrupt your cross, but are you close? Not with, even close. Not even close, Judge. We're going to take a break. Take your break, folks. Uh, hopefully you can get by here. <laughs> All right, so for folks that think that this should all come in because she's referring to totality of the evidence, no. She can testify to the evidence that formed the basis of her opinion. But so she, if she wasn't provided something, it's not forming the basis of her opinion, and it doesn't come in through her. Nope. This is wrong. Croc, you tell me. Am I am I totally off base? No, you're not off base in any way, shape, or form, as far as I can tell. But you gotta remember that Kenosha is fairly conservative when when push comes to shove. It's also and where the rules of evidence go to die. Yes. Uh so if he can if he can use if he can do if he can use this one this one fact uh to hammer into the jury that he's a pervert of some description then maybe they convict because they don't like that activity but that but that's been my entire frustration with this trial from the beginning yes is that but, this is a conviction purely by innuendo yes as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure his, this is the thing that got him nailed the first time. I believe you're probably right. But <coughs> he, he did have the letter, and I think that she was brought in to say that, or I believe she was brought in to suggest that without the letter, because let me phrase it this way: the prosecution cannot bring in the letter. That's a problem. So, I think that there was a way that the defense was trying to use this witness to poke holes in why they focused on one thing as opposed to another. And that would be my thinking, yes. The prosecution cannot bring in the letter to explain that. Right. See what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah, you'd have to be a psych. If if she was a psychologist that focused on sex therapy, then maybe I get that. 
Uh, but she's a toxicologist. Her job is poisons and blood. Seriously. But this is this has been my problem. I, again, it's prosecution by innuendo, not by facts. Well, you know, he's he's been pounding the table the whole damn time. That's just all. True. He's and I don't think he's got anything else. He's only even here, probably because a no one else wanted to take this freaking case, uh, and b he's trying to defend his honor. Well, and and I understand that, and you understand that. I'm wondering if that's getting translated over to the jury. And oh, I'd be willing to bet. Yeah, Creed makes a good point. She was born to prove that the antifreeze level in the blood doesn't say how many doses she took, what amount she took, and whether it indicates uh, self deletion versus uh, other deletion versus accident. Fair, absolutely right. Correct. That she that still being had said, it. I'm just going to throw this out there. I hated the way that. She let him get away with a little bit too much in the section that I was watching, where one, there's no such thing as a dose of antifreeze. It's, not, it's just a poison. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be taking. You don't want to be drinking that stuff regardless. Ever. Under any circumstances, it serves no therapeutic function whatsoever. Yes, it will, however, get you wasted. That you don't want, you don't want to do that. Because if you, uh, if you even remotely overdo that, you're gonna, you're gonna kick your own ass. You don't want to do that. Yeah, and I mean, you can go back to prohibition, where with prohibition, people would drink antifreeze as an alternative, and a lot of folks died from that. Yes, they also had antifreeze in the stuff that was available to speakeasies, amongst other things. Yeah, uh, wood grain alcohol was a very was a common one. They get they get that because it achieved the goal, but then you had people going blind and dying because, yeah, that's okay. And so here here's the point, and this is where I actually do agree with Cole's analysis from what I heard. And remember, guys, I only heard maybe an hour over the course of the morning because I happened to be in a car. Um, I think that she did walk into a trap. I think, I think that Jamboy did a good job in terms of what evidence she did not review. Well, again, she would only be, really be expected to review the stuff that she knew that that she got but i'll, I'll put it this is. way so in terms of the rules of evidence the reason why he's able to testify to all of this garbage is because it's being brought in for impeachment purposes it's not being brought in for the truth of the matter asserted even though obviously it is going to be heard as such you see uh -huh. what i'm saying well, you know, you got you, you got this particular fact, but you're tr but you're using it to to try and destroy the man's character. Not yes. that, I, that in that area, he's really got much, he's got really got much of a reputation anyway, especially not after what twenty years in jail. Well, let's see if I can <laughs> wait a little bit when they come back, and we'll watch some of this. And I want to make sure that I am live when the court actually returns. I think we have maybe another couple minutes or so. At most. And yes, I still count as a viewer today. Oh. We're back on a record on uh, Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF314. I want to make sure that the same miss jury's when back the in the court courtroom. The doctor is still on the stand under oath. And Mr. Jambois, you can continue with your cross. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, judge. And thank you, doctor. Um, so. Hairbrush. Lady, I have this, this list up there and I don't, I don't have anything underneath it, but in, in terms of the differential diagnosis. Can everybody hear me now? Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. So. Your. 
conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty was that Julie Jensen died because, and I'm going to write down here, ethylene glycol poisoning. Is that right? Yes. And he's drawing. Ethylene glycol poisoning. Okay. The ethylene glycol is what killed her, not the ambient. You can see that? I can. Okay. So, um, but you know, there's the forensic pathologists that have testified in this case have indicated that yes, she was a victim of ethylene glycol poisoning, but that she also, that asphyxia. Well, she's going to explain this one to me. <laughs> Asphyxia uh, was an issue in this matter, too. Were you aware of that? I am. And in fact, the defense expert, uh, I think her name is Dr. Thomas, has indicated that um, positional asphyxia could have been a contributing factor in Julie Jensen's death. Were you aware of that? I'm not aware of uh, what their opinion is. Okay. Well, you, you as an emergency room physician, you've dealt with, you've had people rushed in who died from asphyxia. Yes. And have you heard of positional asphyxia versus uh, asphyxia that is not positional asphyxia? Yes. Okay. So um, would you agree that the diagnosis of asphyxia is largely, um, it's a process of elimination? Would you agree with that? No. That ordinarily with asphyxia, there's seldom actual physical evidence of asphyxia. Oh, do you would you agree with that? Well, since you asked, that is one aspect of her testimony I did not care for is how much she focused on have asked about her that. work on and I can talk about asphyxia. And we are going to go back live. It's all state. Yes, they would swallow it. And do people generally use um, liquid to swallow? Yes, and that's typically how a person would take medication. Right. And I think what you had testified to on cross is that when you're looking at some of these other factors, if somebody has taken a whole bunch of pills, because it would be hard to like force it down their throat, um, that's something that you would look at. Correct. Dr. Hill, based upon everything you re reviewed, there's no indication, or do you know if there's any indication that Julie Jett Julie Jensen was taking pills. Oh my God, on redirect, they're actually asking late open evening questions. Of December 1st, early morning it's almost hours like they're 2nd. professionals. I'm not sure. I can't tell from just looking <coughs> at the yes. postmortem toxicology what I'm day or time totally something was taken. We have to get that information from the medical records. Correct. And what we know is that the Paxil was prescribed on the 1st. I don't believe yes. so. I, we might have just briefly, but right? yes, yes, the witness was passed back to the defense. And if Ambien was redirect. prescribed on December 2nd at some point around 11, 13 a.m., I think is what Attorney Jamboy said as to when it was picked up, it would seem that she wouldn't have had the Ambien to take at the time the first dose of ethylene glycol was taken. Well, I don't know exactly where that was the a little dose of ethylene glycol In fairness, taken, I, so I, you know, I got to be equal so if we opportunity. Take Attorney Jamboy's suggestion that it was sometime in the late evening hours of December 1st and early morning hours of December 2nd, it would stand to reason she wouldn't have had that ambient at that time. Correct. You That's had a little testified leading, so. under, on cross that you didn't have Aaron Dillard's testimony at the time you wrote the report. Correct. You have since had a chance to review his testimony. Yes, I watched it. And you understand that Aaron Dillard claimed that Mark Jensen told him that Julie Jensen's breathing was no longer this, bad. All right. 
So, is that consistent with what we know about the to toxicological findings in stage two of ethylene glycol poisoning if an individual is still acidotic? If somebody is still acidotic, then they would be hyperventilating or breathing fast and breathing deep. The word for breathing like that is called Kussmaul, which is K-U-S-S-M-A-U-L respirations. So we see that in diabetic ketoacidosis where they're breathing deep and hard and fast. And so if somebody is acidotic, they would continue to be breathing like that. And that's because they're trying to get that acid out of their system. Yes. Right. They're trying to blow off carbon dioxide. And without getting into an extensive physiology lesson about why that works, the idea is that the more carbon dioxide that you blow off, then that compensates for, it does not fix, it compensates for that acidosis. You also know that Aaron Dillard claimed that Mark Jensen gave Julie Jensen a dose of ethylene glycol like we just talked about on December 1st through December 2nd, and then, I did a, and then an identical dose on December 2nd. Is that consistent with what we know from her toxicological findings? Could there be. is nothing looking at the toxicology that tells you how many or when just by that post-mortem toxicology. However, if it was a large enough dose on the second or even the third, then we would have a much higher ethylene glycol level present post-mortem. And present where? Good question. In the post-mortem blood. Attorney Jampo has told you on direct that the credibility, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Attorney Jambos told you on cross that the credibility of a source of information is essential when making a determination um, as it relates to manner of death. Yes. Um, are you aware of Aaron Dillard's credibility? I am. Is it the job of the medical toxicologist or the jury to determine the credibility of the witness and the witness statements? The jury. Get them, girl. Do it. Get on. This is clearly not our first rodeo. She knows what she's doing. Well, she's do she's here to do a specific job, and that isn't it. Dr. Hill, after everything that you've been told during cross-examination, as well as the additional questions I asked, do you have a cause of death um, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability? Yes, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability, the cause of death is ethylene glycol poisoning. And what would your opinion be as to manner of death? The manner of death, weighing all things, remember it's not my job to determine the reliability or the credibility of certain statements. Like I said earlier, there are statements on both sides and because of that, my manner of death is undetermined and there is nothing scientifically or toxicologically speaking, which is what my scope falls within to state Good that this job. is a homicide or a suicide. And therefore I say that the manner right. is undetermined. For an this is a good rehabilitation <laughs> of an expert. I have nothing there you go. Mr. Jambo, do you have any questions? I do. By the oh, way, Dr. folks, um, didn't you I just thought, say on I can't this morning, it. both on direct examination and cross-examination, that the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood at time of death is not indicative of how much uh, or when the person ingested ethylene glycol. Didn't you say that? You are misconstruing my testimony. Thank oh, you. I'm sorry to hear that. So let's. Uh, Good job. You're objecting when the defense doesn't. You indicated that well, the amount of ethylene really glycol is, in the blood at the time of death um, could not possibly be indicative of whether it was a homicide or a suicide. Correct? Correct and that the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood at the time of death is not necessarily indicative of how much ethylene glycol was ingested, correct? That is not entirely correct. Okay, well you just, let's, you did just say on redirect examination that if Julie, that if Julie Jensen had a, had a larger initial dose of ethylene glycol at, for her initial dose, you'd expect to find a larger amount of ethylene glycol in the blood. Didn't you say that? Yes. That wasn't the question that I asked her. 
Well, it's, then she can say, no, that's not what happened. It's in the area you went into, so go ahead. Did you understand the question I asked you, doctor? Well, I think that there are a couple things wrapped up in your question, and not that I'm reading your mind, but uh, I can revisit the explanation that I gave this morning to perhaps clarify for the jury so that they're not confused. Well, even though this is cross-examination and I, I can ask leading questions, I would like you to do that in a non-leading fashion. Tell the jury about your explanation about the relationship between the amount of ethylene glycol at the time of <coughs> death with the amount of ethylene glycol that was ingested pre-death. Okay. Would it be okay if I had the microphone back and I can read I'll, get you, I'll even get you the microphone. That's very kind of you. Uh, screw you. Thank you. Come on. Buttering up the witness. All right, so while this is happening, I would like to thank Kara very much uh, for her kind contribution over on PayPal. Thank you. I think I'm going to make it a point <laughs> to try and acknowledge folks uh, when they do that. Kara was so kind as to... Okay, so this brings us back to this chart that I made this morning. And the question is... And if you do not want to give YouTube 30 percent, there is an alternative so option. at a certain point in time. It is in the description yes. below. I look at All right, back in a, a minute. level here. And thank you very much. Okay. Excuse me, Doctor. I've got to get up. Why don't we, for the record, Ms. Crosby, why don't you say what number this exhibit is that she's talking about? And I'll read her statement while we're doing this. All right. Yeah. Were you aware that one time Mark Jensen so, were white after the day? Are looking at Absolutely. A, a random post mortem level. This is where we're at. And you don't know what time we are so from death. It could be here. It could be here. Could let me here. plug it real quick. And so just by virtue like to, of what that level is, does or, not tell you, you know, join us when something was consumed or those are greatly that it's appreciated. a homicide or suicide. Uh, There's no way that you can look at that level. Support YouTube. And there is an alternative. The link is in the description. Potter, alchemical way what what how that was administered and so i want to make that clear that there's nothing I'd about that, level the addresses in this that tells you how it got and yes there. it does work and that whether is whether someone gave it to you or whether you drank it yourself. because paypal takes there's nothing about a lot smaller commission that level in youtube now there has been a narrative in this case that because there was a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol in the stomach that thus hence heretofore, that was a second administration and therefore it well, was I'm probably again the trouble. And that is flawed. That is incorrect. Or even and so my discussion yeah, was no. that whatever if there had been a larger amount of ethylene glycol administered around the time of death such that there was still ethylene glycol in the stomach, that would have gotten absorbed and would have produced a much more detectable level than what Julie Jensen had. Okay. And I'll let you turn it off too. Yep, that'd be about the same. So doctor, um, at the time of Julie Jensen's death, she had 55 micrograms of ethylene glycol in her this witness um, is so under, done with your voice correct that would be 55, for her 55 micrograms per milliliter of ethylene glycol in her bloodstream that was tested post-mortem correct correct and i would like to say that that because we deal in medical toxicology with these units in milligrams per deciliter that is yes. actually 5.5 milligrams per deciliter in a different laboratory gave it four milligrams per deciliter which is within laboratory error so, told you. And you don't have any numbers here, but she's um, got him. We would say that uh, five milligrams per liter. Is that what's five milligrams no, per liter or five per milligrams? deciliter? Milligrams per deciliter. Milligrams per deciliter. So let's say they'll be right down here somewhere, possibly, right? Almost undetectable. Yeah. Now, um, at the time of her death, correct? Correct. <laughs> Okay. 
This guy yeah. is tilting at windmills. You don't want to testify. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to offer an opinion. Don Quixote is mad at you uh, now. Because there's such great variation about um, Cause even he uh, rigor mortis that. and so forth. That you, we know that she was dead at 4.33 p.m. Yes. We don't know when she actually died, though, do we? So um, I guess I'm going to turn this mic back on. Oh, we got the microphone back on. I don't think your what? mic is on. <laughs> it takes a minute for it to heat up or something. Um, so you'd also testify it's not how electronics about the half-life of ethylene glycol. Freaking dinosaur. I would actually object. This is outside. I didn't ask for it on direct. She's never testified about half-life, and I didn't ask for it on redirect. Well, it's, it's certainly relevant to what I'm going into on recross, Your Honor. That's not how that works. No. explanation on her own. So, Doctor, would you agree that the how many um, times have I explained? He let it. He's let see. He's letting it in. All right, fine. Okay. So, Doctor, um, and those would you agree that Thompson, ladies the, and gentlemen, generally in the literature, uh, and clearly the finest experience that the half life of ethylene glycol in the human body is somewhere between three hours and eight point five hours. That's generally what is in the medical literature, of course. As we've discussed earlier, it's very difficult to get an exact number because it's unethical to perform these kinds of studies on humans. But that's the accepted range in the generally in the middle medical literature is three to five hours or three to 8.5 hours, correct? Something like that. So um, let's say that this dose Did you literally say that, that we should be testing at the freeze on live people? The second dose. Did I miss that? And no, um, she said it was so if you had a so. dose of ethylene glycol, she said it was an ethical was to do so, but he was suggesting that we might have done it anyway. Milligrams yes. Of ethylene gly gly glycol. Milligrams mixed, or milliliters? Milliliters. I'm sorry, milliliters. Okay. 20, 20 to 30 milliliters. Uh, here, I'll, I'll. Do you have that uh, thing, Bob? Okay. Uh, first off, 30 cc's would be gone fairly quickly. <laughs> And might not Half life is not nearly as much damage as you think. So the top ring on and this is a normally functioning years. human being. The half life is not that. And that's long. so. If Julie Jensen either ingested, well, well, let's say she ingested either it was administered to her or she drank herself. She drank a solution that contained anywhere from twenty to thirty milliliters of ethylene glycol at six thirty or seven o'clock on the morning of December third. She would we have more in her system. That say at 7 o'clock, a little bit less at 7.30, a little bit less at 9, a little bit less. And until we got to somewhere around 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, she'd have less in her system at 2 or 3 o'clock than she had at 6.30 or 7 when it was first administered, correct? Right. Over time, yes. it decreases. Yeah, the CDC says 3 now, to 8 hours. And, um, some might still be in her stomach because it's still metabolizing out of the system, or it would still all be in her stomach yet? Or would it, uh, it wouldn't all, all be in her stomach, stomach by that time. I don't think so. Well, there can be a remnant in the, the stomach due to various reasons that would cause delayed gastric emptying. By the way, I have so never seen a case earlier, where the judge is so willing to let somebody walk in into the well like this. At post mortem does not preclude the possibility that she took a single dose of ethylene glycol on the evening of December 1st, 1998. Right, right. I believe that, that that very well is a remnant of a prior ingestion. And you just don't know if it was the prior ingestion from the evening of December 1st or from the morning of December 2nd, correct? Correct. Now, you also indicated that um, the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood is not indicative at all of the amount that was ingested at the time of death, correct? I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry yeah, Becky, time of that ingestion. is a very fair so point. So the amount of ethylene glycol at the time of death it's not necessarily same jurisdiction where they let finger point and gun at the jury. Right. It's Actually, it's not very possible to do some kind of extrapolation that. to this is the amount and this is how much was was ingested. Yeah. Uh, because you would have to know some other parameters like time and things of that sort. Time, weight of the person in question, et cetera whether or not they ate something at the same time. This is, uh, it breaks down, it would break down similar to, you know, uh, 
standard ethanol except? So, doctor, let's say that there's a single dose of ethylene glycol, say 250 milligrams of ethylene glycol ingested. Milliliters or milligrams? I'm sorry, 250 milliliters, uh, 250 cc's of ethylene glycol ingested at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's quarter, and the person that's dies quarter sometime of a liter. That afternoon, 2.30, 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon, that person dies. You would expect to, you'd expect to find a significant amount of ethylene glycol in, her, in the person's bloodstream at that point? Would you not, post-mortem? No. Well, Did it you? depends on a number of things. The absorption of that ethylene glycol from the stomach and I'm then every person, but when you brought up a half-life, the half-life of any substance means that it is the time that ha it takes for half of a substance to go away, to be eliminated from the body. It's just one pharmacologic parameter that we learn about. And so in general, it takes approximately five half-lives to get to zero. So if we look at something like ethylene glycol, where the half-life is published to possibly be between three hours or eight hours, you are essentially saying it may take three times five is 15, 15 hours, eight times five is 40, to 40 hours to disappear. That, that's a big difference, which is why this can be very complicated to time backwards. But all of the things being equal, um, the less you easy adjust, to do on the back of the envelope. Um, I've the, done it the less there's going to be left after the five, less, less will be left after three, two to three half lives. And the more you ingest, the more that'll be left after two to three half lives, correct? Y yes. I'm sorry, that just didn't make any sense. Okay, well, let's do it this way. You know, um, I wasn't old. He wasn't talking. Look at your life. I wasn't a life science major, but one of my majors was economics. So we did all kinds of graphs as ec economists. So this is. I don't care about um, you. Shut up. In economics terms, this would be like a supply curve because as. No, no, fuck. I'm sorry. This no. would be a demand curve. As the price goes up, no. the, the demand as goes down. Somebody. And this would be like a supply. If it was going for an economics major, up, no. The supply goes up. This and this point right work. here is equilibrium. This, so not from an economics, economics perspective, but supply curve, that is the, demand curve. But that and is the we're curve. looking at EG. We're looking at kind of like <laughs> a demand curve. I don't like it for her so, economics degree. Now, if there's a, an, ex, an extraneous. It's a bad comparison for many, many reasons. Of a particular mm. item. It's a horrible. It's a horrible. Then we just have a different curve. We'd. Supply and demand curves have nothing to do with half lives. It would look like this. God. All right, hang on. I need a minute. Yes, you come back in a minute. John is going to beat his head on the wall. Because your supply will go down. No, that's. So let's take this and say this is 50. Let me put it this way. Human no, biology no. is not an economic no, entity. Congestion. And this is... Oh, my God. He's literally doing this. Million. Yes, this is exactly what he's doing. Initial ingestion. All of the factors being... Human equal, biology is not an economic time, entity. There'd be a less amount of ethylene glycol in the blood and with a Holy 50 shit. milliliter ingestion. And with a 100 milliliter ingestion, there'd be this amount, right? Why is this happening? I don't not mean necessary. any disrespect. But you have completely lost me. Oh, and me too. How a supply and demand curve analogy applies in this situation. Thank you. Thank really you. My sense. God. Well, let's take. Let's say this is the EG. This is an EG line. No, right human biology right? is the, not. The amount of ethylene glycol in the blood of economics goes down. I actually know fairly decently progresses. about both of them. Agree with that, this correct? is a travesty. But there's a starting point. So if we start at 50 I, milliliters. This I could get beyond the dumpster fire. I could get this talk in seconds. Uh, ethylene glycol in the blood <laughs> even with this metabolized, correct? Yes. 
So if there's a hundred milliliters, that's initial ingestion. This is this, this is a legal like that amount of glycol. This is a, a genocide of law. Right? Yes. Possibly. Very genocide. So, you're trying to suggest that. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about in the same person, correct? I'm talking about the same person. I'm saying all of the factors being equal, that uh, the exact same woman, uh, that one time she's she has 50, she takes an initial dose of 50 milliliters of ethylene glycol, and then it's measured four or five hours later, or three or four hours later, and then another time she takes 100 milliliters and is measured the same time later. Um, you'd expect a lower amount at a 50 milliliter initial dose versus um, whatever half of the original dose was. Yes, stupid. Uh, may I come join you up here? Uh, we're not going to sing a duet. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll even give you the mic. Sure. Sure. Is an economic theory. Okay. I appreciate oh, your God. depiction of this. They're but this he is simultaneously debasing two of the fields of exists. this thing. Still 114. Oh my God. 114. And this has math. What Cheddar's parabus does not work in biology in the same way that it does in economics, you fucking when, moron. So this alcohol dehydrogenase that we talked about earlier. Which, by the way, Cheddar's parabus literally just means all things being you. Saturated. That does not work when you're and talking so about depending, human beings. You're talking about a about much more complex system. Putting somebody God dose. Damn it. Cara it's says, we come for the legal analysis. No, stay no, for the no, rants. No. Thanks for the two bucks. The picture. <laughs> Thank, you for the higher two bucks. Thank you again for the five overrun. Are not pictures of water with sugar. Hey, we have a bunch of different compartments, but I, the reason why I spent so much time explaining I didn't this this morning that was about alcohol and hydrogenase, which quite to the extent that I sugar. have. Okay. And so because you're not because it's not the it's not the S twenty five call that does all the damage. It's the metabolites thereof. Plays a role Correct. in what that ultimate is concentration like is. All sorts of really and also that ends up being saturated. Work, and it so is the broken down into very toxic compounds. To go through well, the ethylene glycol, uh, which is kind of what I was explaining down, this it's morning. It's very so ugly acid. Add ethanol to the and then it gets it worse. For that alcohol so does straight up ethanol. But so, I, I'm, in the world but of it's economics, not as, we're but the, and demand what you get out of ethanol exist, isn't quite the same, and are probably subject to other factors. Yes, the glycol, not actually, exactly does, the, the glycol involved here actually here does situation. the glycol complex makes it makes absorption a bit quicker, believe it or not, which is a bad thing. A oh, very bad you, thing. You can return to your seat, but so it, earlier. We're taking to put yourself to sleep. It would hurt nearly you so made bad. Some, you were offering testimony about how the amount of ethylene you might glycol not even in you one part of your system. For instance, I'll give the example. One of the reasons why Tylenol type of is so I really I bad to give to an alcoholic, so not that necessarily that. even drinking alcohol. Well, I'm not sure exactly what, what specific conversation we were having that you're referring to, but in order the punch to more rapidly try and process these compounds, right. is an acetaminophen that there is a very small amount and the toxic of ethylene glycol converted faster than is safe in for the stomach. To handle. And My God. there, as I was explaining, is a narrative there's that because question, that's actually, there, there, there had to have been an administration. Uh, of ethylene glycol the ethylene around glycol the time of death. Oh. If that was true, then that level would be higher. Is that what you're asking? I don't even understand what you just got done saying. You indicated that if you asked the question about an administration of ethylene glycol at around the time of Julie's death, nobody's talked about that. Oh my God. Um, so I don't know where you got that from. The defense counsel didn't ask you about that, and I didn't ask you about that. There's no suggestion. Croc, by the way, thank Julie you for being here, because I think that I would have at about, lost at my about the time freaking that. mind if I did not have so to understand to bounce my thoughts. Well, that's that. supposedly what I'm for. We spent a hey, part of God the morning just hours five more today discussing oh. that, and that ultimately my opinion was that that small amount 
of ethylene glycol in the stomach was a remnant of a prior ingestion, not a repeated ingestion around the time of death. Yeah, okay, no, well, it would take a while. Around it takes, a, it takes I mean, a while. Um, so for according to Hill. Mark Jensen's confession, I mean, isn't that Zillard, literally a definition of a half-life? Quite aside from whether Aaron Zillard's a <coughs> reporter or not. It According to, to that confession that, that Mark Jensen ethylene glycol could take to Aaron Dillard, twenty-four to the first dose of ethylene glycol was administered in the evening yeah, hours Ms. of John, December Thank you very much for the fine memberships. I aware, really appreciate correct? it. It is and going to go a long to way to me paying Mark to Aaron Dillard, my the second dose of ethylene the glycol this trial. was administered in the early so in the morning thank hours. Thank you. Very, very December third, sometime before the kids got up. So I maybe really do. Or seven o'clock. Are you aware of that? Yes. Now, and you are aware that Julie Jensen was found dead at 4.33 yeah. p.m., that she was determined dead at 4.33 p.m. Awesome. by the responding That's parents, awesome. Right? Thank you for yes. the membership. At which point there was some measure of rigor mortis yes. that it set in, correct? Yes. It broke my So nobody's proposing that Julie Jensen died at 8 o'clock. In fact, we know she was alive at 8 o'clock in the morning because her son David had told his little friend Eric that mommy's breathing really bad, <sighs> like that. So... Her breathing at eight o'clock. No, in the stop morning, testifying, you. David Jesus. was getting ready to go to school. Is demonstrating that at eight o'clock. Opposing counsel is testifying. Assumes he's and allowed then, to testify. Mark this is Jensen's cross. He's assuming that facts, he, not he evidence. To uh, to Aaron Dillard, he came back from running some errands, and her breathing had improved. In other words, she didn't. Not that she was breathing. How well, the fuck would you was, know? Her breathing wasn't as bad as it was when he'd left that morning. According um, to was that a possibility? According to who? Condition could improve it all on their own. They could be, they, they wouldn't be breathing. You already finished your piece as in hard chief. You had an opportunity eight to prove in the morning, this. Uh, it did it. Ten o'clock or ten thirty in the morning, as they had been at eight o'clock in the morning. Is that You're a just possibility? You're assuming this now. No, he's using. I, he's, you know, he's I don't know. It's sometimes very hard to translate through different different people what they're trying to describe was going on so but according to mark jensen when he came back julie's breathing had improved and he according to mark jensen's confession to aaron dillard when he came back and confession he found her to aaron improved, dillard are you kidding me he was worried yes about he is Not stuck on the aaron died, dillard that she wouldn't talk. are you so capable her on her side. of understanding the her word her. alleged and then he came back and she was still breathing. You're a, at that point, he sat on her. You're a retired her prosecutor, and you're not capable and of understanding the word alleged. And ran some other errands, and then nope. he came back at around 4. He wouldn't know what that was. He wouldn't know what an allegation was. If, if no, there's nothing about this. Object is to argumentative. <laughs> there's nothing about that scenario that's inconsistent with what you found by reviewing not the only Jackie, if you ever need one, you know where to find and me. Toxicological results that you've reviewed for this case, is there? Well, you just lift, listed a whole number of She's things objecting in for one the question defense. and said it's all consistent. No, and I'm, I'm not going to agree we, to that. They no, probably have an agreement with those She's objecting for the another. defense. She's, gonna, she's, going, she, she's got this guy in hand. She really so does. Applications of these technical <laughs> findings. He's trying to um, save his narrative now. And you've concluded to a reasonable medical certainty that Julie Jensen died of ethylene glycol poisoning. You've concluded yes. that, correct? Yes. And you've offered that to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. You said that I'm already. Compounds. This. Ask an answer. The, your findings. Move on. Toxicological, the medic, medical toxicology findings I, that you've honestly, discussed. Honestly, he's trying to I, I, I genuinely think that the judge Mark has Jensen checked out. Indicating Before, that her breathing had approved that morning. And yes. There is... Becky, Nothing I genuinely hope that, that you never I can require my services. In uh, if the you want it, you know where to find me. Or in the postmortem toxicology that tells me anything about whether her breathing had improved or was worse. There's, you cannot assess somebody's breathing when they're dead. So the short answer to my question is no. There's nothing about that scenario. That's, that's not a question with, pending. Like, there's nothing in your findings that are that's not what she, with oh, that God. That described by no. Aaron no, there is that, nothing. Her breathing has started to improve. 
<laughs> and roll her on her side. There's Fair nothing about your toxicological analysis that would be inconsistent with that, uh, that, that did, scheme of events, is there? Well, that's kind of misleading because to suggest that anybody, that she's whether they are a medical to toxicologist or not, would be able to look job. at toxicology findings uh, or an autopsy and be able to tell how somebody was breathing before they died. It's not that it's consistent or inconsistent. It's just not possible. You can't do that. It's not possible that her breathing had improved? That's not a question. Your question is looking at the toxicology findings and looking at the autopsy. Your question is what can I look at in that to tell me? Whether Both. somebody's breathing had I'll improved honest, or not, and there's nothing that you can look at scientifically to, the to do attorneys. that. I don't know that that's exactly. I wasn't the case. The They right. may have just. They question. have may have just decided is, to let her main nothing handle. that you can tell us from the you know medical tax. Maybe that's the idea is that you just that has any sit there and let her do it because she's doing a great job. Accept or reject. Well, well. See, here's the thing: the judge can't say objection overruled to her. He returned. This is her testimony. They, he can't, have, he can't have, however, overrule um, the There's nothing about the toxicological analysis that does. you've done that would in <laughs> any way shape or form. I want to give her an honorary law degree. Of, or, in fact, I'll start this question over again because I don't. There's don't, nothing about the medical up. toxicology in this case. Shut that all the up, dude. That Julie Jensen, that Mark Jensen did not sit on Julie Jensen, shove her face in a pillow, and asphyxiate her. Oh my God! No, there's no evidence of that. Yes. Oh, so, I the fact that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol and drugged with Ambien does not preclude the possibility one of your th that Mark Jensen rolled her on her side, Stop. sat on her chest, shoved her face into a pillow, and held her there. Stop until repeating she stopped your there's nothing in she your just analysis. Said there was no evidence of that. that. And there's nothing there's that is consistent no with that. there's evidence of that. But my question is, there's nothing in there that's inconsistent with that, is there? What? <coughs> He's trying to save his and theory, and it's not working. There's also nothing inconsistent with the medical toxicological results that you've testified to that would be inconsistent with Julie Jensen being administered a small dose of ethylene glycol in the evening of December 1st, and another small dose of ethylene glycol in the morning of December 2nd, is there? Yeah, you, you can't to tell she if it was more than one on that night or that morning. Thank you, doctor, nothing further. Okay, have a safe trip back, you're excused. We have exhibits up there. What? And then we have something by the doctor too. Right? Yes, I'm going to grab those. Oh, but uh, to team, my concern is, is that the expert created an exhibit and then attorney Jambos wrote on the exhibit. So I'm not sure how we differentiate for that for the record. That's a really so good a point. Or anything, so I don't we'll know. figure something out. Right. Maybe he should initial the parts that he did. Assuming I remember the parts I did. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that. I'll try and do that. Draw something around where you put your... Create, you make a very good point. Is there anything, anything in her time. testimony that's inconsistent with Jamboy's poisoning or death leap glycol? No. There is nothing inconsistent with Jamboy having gone there and done the deed himself. Or anybody else that's for not that. Matter. Exhibit. Is there anything no, in that report that is inconsistent with Jamboy's shooting no, JFK? Exhibit 114 in Attorney Jamboy's before no. you started to. That's uh, not evidence. Examination. I think it needs another sticker. Uh, um, so exhibit 114 is this page and this page? The, the two pages that the expert did. That's correct. Okay. Well, then I request that um, this handiwork, because there's testimony about being marked as exhibit, it would be 115, counsel? 115, Madam Clerk. All right, we have 115 now. Very well. Sorry, the guys, we are sure. now at 101 <laughs> likes. So I'm going to stick with tradition for the 100 right, likes. The uh, defense witness. Detective Paul Ratzberg. Quiet skirt. Yeeks. Yeah, the, the tartan skirt, not necessarily what I would have well i'm certainly not a fashion expert by any stretch of the well my brain says that 
for her, that's pro she'll pro she'll live. Uh, if you wore golf pants to it, you need to evidence. Of course, you probably get left. Probably get left out. <coughs> or told to put on something appropriate. You could remain standing. <clears throat> you solemnly swear that the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you, God. I do. Who is this guy? We shall see. He looks all thrilled. Is he a Peckerton detective? Yeah, the guy in the lighting. Well, he does lighting, look familiar, doesn't he? The writing one more wandered off. You actually missed this uh, toxicologist manhandling him. She turned him inside out. Um. Mrs. Griff, what you missed was me having a small seizure. Hell, I was, I, hell, that was, we were headed to head. for me, it was headache territory we were headed for. <coughs> oh, is that, is that Rat Murder? Okay, cool. Oh, it is Rosberg. Okay. Oh, hi. Or not. Welcome back, Cole. Good afternoon. I just hey, want to make one thanks statement for before back. we start. Um, this witness was here already previously. Your handoff uh, a long time on the stand. almost gave me an answer. About five questions. I understand. Well, I have That's what I'm getting at. You gave me the right answer. Croc, you would you like to? Give I appreciate five. that, Judge. Thank um, you. I appreciate it also. Everything. We had already talked about that, right, Detective? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we did. Hours of redirect. Yeah. Are, are you talking about <laughs> the testimony or the actual <laughs> handoff? <laughs> No, the testimony. Oh yeah, no, I watched that. I watched the testimony. I watched a good portion of it. That was insane. Well, apparently, yeah, now biological science is actually yes, this is uh, Julie Johnson's state planner, planner right, that, uh, boys we recovered on December third, nineteen ninety-eight. And I actually opened it up to October fifteenth of um, nineteen ninety-eight. Does that seem right? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I closed it. Okay. Yes, I will say I this, and at risk of getting in trouble, PayPal takes about one and a half percent. Yes, ma'am. And YouTube the first takes appointment 30. for Julie Jensen. So if you would prefer to contribute to the channel through that mechanism, I would appreciate it. And, and did you would be um, know somebody that Julie Jensen was well served knowing Jeff? that more of it's actually not. going to support Do you know uh, Dr. Show. Jeff Sorensen? No, I do not. Okay. YouTube's absolutely going to eat me for that, but, you know, I want to oh, be yeah. honest. They can't. Who donated more? No, me, John. Look, he's not here. <laughs> this is what we call a sausage fest. Detective, I'm just going to show you a few pictures and see if these are the pictures, if you can identify them from the crime scene. AK47, thank you so much for the $10 over on PayPal. I appreciate it immensely. <laughs> thank you so much. And um, as requested, I'm always going to use, this is a deal that I make. What was previously marked as Exhibit 47. I'm going to use <laughs> your YouTube <laughs> handle. Sorry. I will not reveal I'm not to anyone. So if you do, I'm going to try and- And I'm going to talk to you just briefly about Thank this you. glass that I have the cursor on. Yes, ma'am. I know thank we you talked so much about this when you testified the first time. Out. Can you tell us that. if you had a chance to- um, Okay. Recover this item they for take the crime zero percent. Yes. And the liquid inside it. Yes. What was the liquid? I'm going to show you it was previ previously marked as exhibit oh. 38. And that's the inside computer. of the refrigerator. Correct. And that's what it looked like when you guys took these pictures. Yes. So and defense is calling him refrigerator, what as their own witness. Of, um, juice yes. that you see inside. They want to talk What's to depicted on the uh, detective picture. idiot, right? Frankly, there's a mm -hmm. uh, looks like detective a yellow, gloves. Oh, sorry, a red substance. Yeah, detective, some juice yeah, and detective some, uh, I decided to leave the juice, uh, some lemon lime juice <laughs> in there. <laughs> so what you can lot. see on the top looks to be some type of maybe tonic. Yes. Water. Yes. Um, a lemon juice. Yes. Maybe some chocolate milk. Yes. And then maybe cranberry juice. Is that similar yes. to what you see? I would agree. Hey, you know, strangely enough, I actually do not see any orange juice. On paper first. <laughs> I looked at it. It's my God. Yeast. 
I need cookie fair boys just in here. <laughs> By the way, Cole, I did not give a you adequate Detective, credit. Do you recognize you did a fantastic pictures? job this morning, and I really appreciate yes, it. Yes, they appear to be uh, pictures go over we Cole's took on the 3rd, 1998 at the Johnson residence. And, the and pictures he was that you have so kind to the take over the channel this Detective. morning. I really do appreciate it. Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 102. Thank you, sir. Can you tell hey, us and Squirrel, sorry about not being able to send that link, man. That's all right. John Cook probably could have done it. One of the one. closets in the Jensen yeah. home. I'm not worried. Um, and I, I did reach out to Natalie. I had, just haven't um, heard back Mr. yet. Jensen or you know she came on for a little bit, right? Well, from the I, that. I can uh, um, tell you that it was an adult. We got a couple questions there. were females. So it would have been Mr. Jensen or Mrs. Jensen's closet. Do you see female clothing in there? And just I exhibit like. 102, not 103? I do not. Yes, this is a video camera detective. I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit 103. Do you recognize this closet? It appears to be one of the children's closets. Um, you don't know if that's on the last witness? Bedroom? I think it's 50-50. I, I don't know. know that I necessarily and agreed with, with you, Paul. When you were uh, saying there's some uh, huggies, stuff, but I can't then, uh, disagree either. There's quite a it bit of items, a box and some, uh, some ways. socks. And so some I, so my opinion box? got a lot less strong as he went on. Yeah. His, his initial. Uh, yes, please. His initial I thought was pretty biting, but I don't, it's I think that laser jet on it, like any cross, you get in, you do, it's. I can't quite make out the reason, Special but it looks you like get in, HP you do what you got to do when you get out on the box because it's not your witness. Yeah, that's a laser jet, dude. Up just okay, a little bit, please. I can read Absolutely. it. Okay. Yes, I think yes, that as you went on, it is a printer. And ridiculous. when we look at the closet, it appears to have adults' clothing. Oops, I sorry, I took that off for a second. It doesn't look like children's clothing, does it? Yeah, yeah I would say that clarification is fair. Seems to be maybe some dresses on the left-hand side of that closet a little bit longer down here. Can you see that? I can, and that's why so I... So we didn't anyway, go throw yes. all our clothes out it's on the sidewalk. Zoom up a little bit to see the clothing. No. Absolutely. Oh, amazing. Thank you. So there's no orange juice. There's no clothes tossed on the sidewalk. This is a decent discrediting of snitch. Yes. Well, but and, re and other people. There have been yeah. other people that came in and testified that said that they saw clothes. Do you know who purchased Julie Jensen's vehicle after she passed away? No, that is right. I do. <laughs> Would you like to? I one of her brothers. brothers. Was it Patrick oh, yes. Jensen? Do you know? That I don't know. You just remember it was one of her just, brothers. This yes. maybe the person that no Natalie was referring to is going to talk to this morning. Who was um, in the so courtroom? I have a few. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mark Richards, everybody. Yep. This is our esteemed guy from the Rittenhouse trial. I knew he looked familiar. I just couldn't put, I just couldn't, I just did, couldn't remember his name for a minute. I actually Maddie, really like that LNC decided to put the camera on him for a bit. <laughs> That's kind of an F you from LNC. <laughs> I kind of yeah, like that. They, they wanted Rittenhouse to fry. They did. Eh. Oh, L and C. Abram, Abrams wasn't that. Abrams had pretty some good takes on written house. You what's been marked as States Exhibit One Seventeen? I'm going to ask. I you could some be wrong. I could be totally misremembering. Um, I, would, I, would, I, I don't think that Richard's looks right similar to right what now. you were just asked uh, no. about Julie Jensen's Do, day planner. The so, disdain for um, um, John Boy in that community has come through very clearly to me today. Yes. In both the article we read and Natalie's comments. Yeah. So you just uh, had in your hands the actual physical day planner yeah, he's got, uh, for he's Julie got Jensen, a bad which is, uh, for was exhibit 33, correct? Badgering things. I believe it was 33, yes. I was um, so going to... On exhibit Havoc! Havoc! It's in the house. Um, of Julie Jensen. I was going to show Jensen's an article the other night. That? I do. And, and that is, in I fact, decided uh, not to, statement. but about um, so I'm just gonna John show Boy's you, uh, a few past. Oh, great. Not I'm so glad you decided awesome. not to. 
I read that article on your channel. So if we jump to during lunch today, dude. Sorry. I, November, I think it was a... November oh, okay. 2nd. Well, I'm a bit no. sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when you hand over. Oh, uh, but I trust you, and you gave him the are very much yellow, but I don't call you. Well, if you could just make it a little bit bigger, that would be sorry, helpful. John. Yeah, you're good. Okay, do you see the date there? I do. Holy yes. Holy. And so, for, exa for example, I think it was about 11 p.m. Um, that yesterday's stream went back to green. Yes, that is correct. Do you know who Drake is? Drake was the uh, son of uh, Miss Coster. Just, who was uh, John? Just make sure Mark he sues Jensen's me, not you. Sister. It was me that did it. It's all good. Um, and uh, you said her name was Ms. Coster. Is that Laura Coster? That'd be Laura Coster, yes. Um, hey, Rebecca, thank you so much for the donation. Or without saying anything so about kind. Uh, what was said, another $20. You, a, a you guys are all way Laura too kind. Coster but remember, send those super chats to John, Jensen. please. Or the I had a conversation with somebody that identified himself he's so, as Laura he's, Coster. He's doing, and I take it that was by phone. Then. Huge that was by phone. You build my channel, and you have no reason to doubt that it was. We need, we need those funds no to phone it, John. Yo, Cole, we got to get you monetized. That's the goal right now. That's the goal. We got to get you, and so subs, and we gotta get you where, the watch uh, hours, and Julie we're gonna Jensen make that happen. Her calendar, KYF Drake. Yes. Should I wander around with my with, with, with my PayPal link too? Please. <laughs> so we're going back through the we're going back through the notes because they've already been entered, and so the defense has to do something about them. And you see in her calendar. Why here, couldn't they do this on cross? This would be in November. Uh, uh, Julie yeah. Jensen has the book club. They were probably yes, trying. This right now is the prosecution speaking. Yes. Oh, so they just and had to bring him back because of time. The next week, she just yeah. made a marking about. Uh, so the defense, no, no. The, in St. So the, the defense brought him in. Yes. Oh, so this is cross. Videos. This is now cross. This is cross. And then at the very bottom, and the only reason why I know that is the woman asking is snaggle tooth one. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's. I, I try not to be the spirit. Yeah, I remember. But I remember that's how that's I think of it. Actually, I want to make sure we take a look real quick at November 9th. John, why couldn't the um, defense handle what Joe's they did with him? On yes, the I do. Cross? 2 p.m. Yes, and it's circled. Generally speaking, you, you would look like at, to. Uh, what's because marked in front of you, uh, exhibit it's number broader, 17. But they what can't ask show? questions. It's a receipt for, from the Joe's carpet service. This uh, judge doesn't give a crap about Wisconsin that. to the but Jensen home. The video and everything they've asked. I'm sorry, 9002 Lakeshore Drive. The the I don't know there. why they didn't. It's uh, actually 9020 Unless they Lakeshore realized, like, oh shit. We uh, Kenosha, to Wisconsin with her phone number. And, and uh, like it's a receipt for kept. some type of uh, that we didn't think uh, cleaning and with a total yep. amount of 4431. And that is from November 9th, 1998. So like the idea that there was no orange juice in the fridge. Remember, the Jayla snitch came after him. That, you, so that's maybe why. they weren't sure that they were going to go into that. Yep. And, and really, it would only make sense to ask that question after him. Probably. Um, yeah, and from then, a uh, narrative asked some, About some appointments sense. that uh, Julie yeah. had with a Dr. Jeff. That's why they pay you, that. the, yes. why they you, pay you the big that bucks. She apparently has a Mark's appointment for Dr. Jeff here on the 10th. Yes. None of this is none of this is within the scope of direct. Not really. <laughs> now going to um, November eighteenth of that's, that's kind of the risk that you take. Yes. Right? you're also giving. And I'll scroll up and zoom out a little bit. So second crack the There's witness. kind of a lot written on so that. that day. There are things that maybe it is. they forgot so it's to conferences, book fair. Do you see Excuse that? Me. I do. And then it says uh, at 2.20, David and Doug to Dr. Jeff. Yes, it does. And then conferences so again. So you kind of have to weigh that yes. balance. And then this day planner, it goes all the way through the end of the year, correct? That is correct. Yeah, the and day so planner has already been admitted, for, um, but we're getting Jensen's really close to ask and answer territory. Yes, that is correct. Or cumulative. So that answers. includes things like... Uh, there's supposed to be a Stiefel Nicholas Christmas party. Yes. Um, so we can see that on December 11th of 1998. Yes. This is Kay Griff. 
part of the reason is part of the reason why the prosecution is bringing it out is that they are trying to dispel the self um, theory. You you don't plan things information that Douglas was when to daycare, correct? you plan yes. off. Um, and did you actually uh, have a conversation? I don't think that's actually sandwich? true. Yes. But and uh, where is that daycare located? It's located yeah. in downtown Kenosha, not the too the far case. from the courthouse here, uh, and it's in the what we commonly know as the KYF building. It's adjacent to there. Um, and on so Highbury Park. So is that approximately the fifty nine hundred block of Seventh Avenue? Yes, that would be accurate. We, uh, we've seen and this before. Is that, uh, less than ten minutes from in the alleged self deletion cases. Yes. Where they bring in the idea that right, oh, they so had the concert last thing I want to show you for a month after things, um, similar to what we're doing with Julie's day planner. I want to show you some things from Mark Jensen's that is day planner. Some way um, to and try so and you recall seeing the actual defense. physical exhibit for that when you testified <laughs> several days ago? Yes, I did. Okay, so I'm gonna this show one you an is not the best way to go about it, but I have seen it done where it's like, look, why would they have bought tickets for a cruise? Two no, I'm particularly, um, and this is a PDF exhibit, so I'm going to say what page yeah. it is in the PDF. Uh, I'm going to direct you to page 86 of this exhibit. It's something that is colorable. This one. Do you see there uh, at the top an address? I do. Particularly it's powerful. Uh, Are you able to read it from here? Or do you need me to zoom in? Uh, I can. Uh, let's go with 740 Ford Street, Kimberly, Wisconsin, and above that, uh, underlined is Appleton. And again, this was in Mark Jensen's day planner. And it was, we're, yes. We're not, and then you see names for several people. just the beginning right? of the defense I do. case. Including in an Ed Kluge. Examination. Yes, there's Ed Kluge if you have on there, somebody uh, with Bonnie, a bipolar Ron Ruck, and Joan. It's entirely Bill, possible Weiner, that and Stacey. you can All right. also and so, need um, and now, still had you actually create a record to try and screw somebody else over. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. Had you yeah. actually seen yeah. some pages just seems so of Mark Jensen's day planner? Yes. But if you're suffering, you're suffering, suffering from true bipolar, oh, those were pictures that uh, it's Julie not Johnson outside took of the range and, uh, of handed off to us. As I said Ron that, Cosman, I was like, and then myself and Ron Cosman <laughs> if you're suffering the photographs from that. together. Um, and so um, when you actually then seize the day planner as part of the suffering, investigation on December 3rd, um, 1998, even, and I don't even know again, if I could go down the bipolar the route more than the depression route. Yes, I did. If you feel um, like somebody you drove the you in particular of, to the point uh, of no other option in Mark Jensen's day planner, I do, may yes. very well you, bring you may very well building down with you. Yes, that would be the photo from Julie Jensen. Oh, okay. The that's more I think I about this, that's what I observed. Why are we looking over? And so this sticky note, um, which Mark, is on it's not, exhibit, it's not outside the realm of possibility. Um, you didn't Albert, actually find another this example. When you the day planner. Um, it was not in the day planner, and when I seized it on December third, nineteen ninety-eight. Right. All right. So then I just want to direct your attention. No, that's to a, a, that's a really good point tonight. Day yeah. Planner. I didn't even think of that, but yes. We see uh, that and this is on probably page more regularly than something like this. But yeah, this was Julie's planner. It seems like kind of the same mindset. Yes, I do. And it appears in his day planner that he has St. Louis with a star written on September 2nd. Uh, this, no, yes, that is correct. Okay. And then going to okay. page 116. Now we're at September 11th. Part of the problem is that they already admitted the St. Louis Lighthouse and then Picnic Lighthouse. Do you see that? So yes, that's uh, on the dates of uh, the defense September 11th has to do and something September about it. And this guy, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with and now the here at the bottom, how they're past, doing now, September this, 26 of 1990. It's not it's outside of the realm here, of stars. what would be reasonable. I do, yes. And then at the very and last star, do you see he the He is the one that. Yes, that is correct. Brought in through, and they did ask him about it. So, in fairness, the prosecution going to page probably does have the right the to PDF. question him about it. Um, do you see October 1998? I do, yes. And then stars for Appleton for the first, second, and third? Yes. It's uh, Thursday, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd have stars. And then on Friday, October 2nd, 1998 is the word Appleton. 
And then we have uh, the dates of October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th with the letters SIA. Do you see that? Yes, along with some stars or correction on the 23rd and 24th, there's some stars. The 22nd, 23rd, and 24th have the letters SIA. So then if we go to page 124 of the PDF, do we see the uh, stars and then blueprint on the 5th, 6th, and 7th? Yes, that is correct, along with some times on uh, the 5th of November, 1998. All right, now I'm gonna move to page 144 of the PDF. And if we go over to the side here, we see this- I would like night. to add yes, it is. Introduce an objection and, just um, on this day. We see the words. There's a few things written because you could argue that it's outside of the side, scope, but it's not. But at least it's the carpet, flow a little carpet, bit. carpet over weekend. So Natalie said that the jury is absolutely tuned out. I think so to the prosecution. And, and, yes, that is accurate. Um, and she know. Oh, she. So. And that's Natalie, the same day as the I from keep uh, my names. It is that is lately. correct. The um, lead female prosecutor. Yes. Was uh one of Natalie's professors. Now going to the PDF in really? Yep. Fifty-eight. And she says, "Trust me, she's not Some afraid to object." Here. She know Withdrawn she's kids. She, boat, she knows how to object. She's choosing not. To. Chest crying about miscare. You that mean what the lead female defense attorney? The defense attorney, sorry. Yeah, okay. Chat's going to blow up. <laughs> There's a few words on this page, but we see again the reference to crying about miscarriage. You see that? Yeah, everyone's going to freak out. Yes, I do. Right now. And Welcome to my world. Those two pages Do, that I've just in fairness, seen, chat. One of the reasons why I wanted to, see, given to start my own channel is because yes. it drives me nuts when people like me get it asked backwards. So you guys have and then free reign. Make fun of me. That, again, this is one of the reasons why I love the chat is when they tell me I'm wrong and I actually look into it and I am. I love being corrected. I genuinely do. And that is correct. Oh, me it's too. Spelled, uh, C -R -U -S -E. And sometimes I throw a question in the chat and get an answer. Yeah. In yes, Josh seconds. Quip is right below Absolutely. that with a dash in between jobs and Quip. And I heard a little bit of that. That's cool. So then the last question I had. I was, was watching uh, the show while I was driving over to clear what on it April of 1999. You did a fantastic job. Correct. Oh, when Jamboy started his cross, I did. Yes. I was like, "Oh my God, he finally woke up and actually is saying the sort of shit that I would have." Mm -hmm. um, I have no further questions, and I would just move. The only new exhibits are one sixteen and one seventeen. All right, they'll be received. Any um, redirect? Oh, Judge, I moved to um, yes. She and did, and was, was extremely upset. Right, right. they were also received. not saying she shouldn't have been, but. Okay. Well, I think that there is a question. Well documented there. this was. I think there's a question there about whether there might have been some aspect of, if not postpartum depression, and certainly uh, a grieving process that mm -hmm. contributed to her mental state. Dude, Mark Richards is one of my heroes, man. Look at how he just sits back like a. Yeah. He sits back no, like a boss. A video, man. And that's. Um, is it a witness on the list? It's. Uh, it's on the state's witness list, Nathaniel Clanton. Um, I don't have that list right in front of me. I the kind sure the number. The kind somebody on the we'll state's get it witness for you list. In mayor moment. By a video, so kind from two thousand eight. Probably, yeah. Uh... All right, I have it. I thought we said that we weren't going to do videos in the afternoon. Dude, come on. They they completely rolled over that. <laughs> yeah. you know how long it is? Dude, it's amazing talking to someone. I think it's who, 37 minutes. Talking to somebody that talked to somebody who's been in the courtroom changes several of my opinions. Again. Yeah. 
Well, like, let's see what they use this witness for. Knowing that the jury is not on John Boy's side. I I'm think really... he can probably walk out of this pretty quick yeah, with live my testimony. Is. I think that they're doing kind of a belt and suspenders idea. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start this at some um, point you're and then adjust the volume the and then start it so that we don't blow anyone ears. I got a really weird ear question for you. Go ahead. Is it nose piercing? But the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the Whoa. truth. Whoa! Yes. I came in hot. Um, for the record, please state your name and spell your last name. Nathaniel Clarkson, C L A N T O N. And you're presently an inmate in a federal Another correctional inmate. facility? Yes. What are you serving time for right now? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, crack cocaine. When there, we have possession or del possession of intensive delivery or delivery? What? what delivery. Position? Delivery of co crack cocaine? Yes. So, present, um, and how much time do you have left to serve? Have all the fire them up, and I'm going to wait until a little bit of a break and, um, before I answer, but I will so score them, and, and I'll make sure I answer. Yes. How many times? Ten. How many crimes, I should say? Ten. <clears throat> have you been offered anything in exchange for your testimony in this case? No. Have I talked to you about providing anything in exchange for your testimony in this case? No. Have you got any time off your? I don't, why don't I believe term? that? <laughs> no. Have you been offered any time I, off your no. prison term? No. Do I have any authority to provide you any time? I have off some your ideas term? why no. you might. Did not. you write a letter? How is it that? Um, well, do you know a person named Mark Jensen? Yes. Could you point to Mark Jensen if you see him anywhere in this courtroom and describe what he's wearing? Yes. Okay, point to him. Describe what he's wearing. He's wearing a suit. Okay, and there's a table to the left of me, and there's three people at that table. Where is he sitting at that table? In the middle. Okay, you're under custom. Okay, thank you. Thank you. He, he totally um, led him on the, the circumstances on which identification you first came to see or know of I mean, you get a little, I mean, it's, it's you get a little bit of leeway because uh, it's foundational. And, uh, it's not that's County Jail. Uh, no, but he's <laughs> at the table. To the there's months. a table to the left oh, of me. Man. Which one is he? He never said he was one of the people at the table. I, I know it's stupid. Like, no, I think I think the identification is dumb. Okay, who was in J Block first? Anyway, you or him? Mark, Mr. Jensen. So when you first came to J Block, Mr. Jensen was already there. Yes. When you first got to J Block, did you know who Mr. Jensen was? No. And um, once you were in J Block, did you have occasion to speak with him at all? Time, time, not frequently. At the time that you were in J Block with Mr. Jensen, was there a time that uh, Mr. David Thompson came into J Block? Like a month later. Okay, so this later. guy's going to discredit so in J Block with Mr. Jensen for almost a month before Mr. Thompson got there. Yeah, I'm guessing. So in the month before Mr. Thompson got there, he was uh, a state witness in the first Mr. trial. He's a defense witness in the second. Were you able to observe Mr. Jensen? I am Same guessing that they're using, they're using him yeah, to everybody, pretty much. discredit a fight of okay. the invisible and altercation. Did you observe that Mr. Jensen spoke with other inmates guess. in the facility in, the, yep. in J Black? Yes. Um, describe whatever interaction you saw between Mr. Jensen and other inmates in the cell block. Uh, he was he pretty much a, you know, talk about his case with certain And individuals. yes, he was on he the state. his court reports and things like that. Did he ever try to talk to you about his case or show you his court reports? No, I wouldn't want to look at them. Well, I, I, when you say you don't want to look at it, you didn't want to look I, at I it. I wasn't interested. No. So he tried to show them to you? No, you, not offhand. No. He never did. That's where I no. think they're going with this. Um, but Tell us what happened when David Thompson came to the jail. I'm with you. It's the only thing I can uh, think of. Him and uh, Mr. Thompson and uh, Mr. Jensen was... Uh, I don't know, start getting along for what apparent reason. I don't know. They was talking and they start getting, you know, getting to know one another, filling each other out. And what I mean by that, they was knowing each other. You know. What um, I mean by that is knowing each other. They had their moments. Thanks I for guess. clarifying, man. So you saw Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson talking with each other. Yeah. And when you saw Mr. D uh, Jensen and Mr. Thompson talking with each other, do you see other any any other inmates involved in that conversation? Or was it just Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson? Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thomas. And um, did you ever involve yourself in those conversations between okay. Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson? No. Did you hear what Mr. Yeah, Jensen and Mr. Thompson were talking about? 
Not really, no. They Did you get around to it to be that Jensen wasn't going around spouting his story Did you ever to the entire to learn world? Either Mr. Johnson, kind of other, either Mr. Jensen or Mr. Thompson, it. what Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson were talking about. So maybe. Okay, who told you about between it? Between those two. Jensen brought it to my attention first. Okay, tell us about that conversation. Did that occur while Mr. Thompson was still there or had Mr. Thompson left uh, J Block? I think he left J Block. Okay, so tell us what happened after Mr. Thompson left J Block. Um, one day, I, me, and, me and another inmate was in, looking out the window talking, and uh, Mr. Jensen came up and he was asking me about. Uh, about his situation that Thompson, I guess, had made a um oh he's snitching on the snitch offer to him. Mm -hmm. And he had explained to me what it was, and I told me it was stupid for doing it. Okay, what it. what was the offer that oh, Mr. No, so Jensen this is Mark Jensen talking to him. Mr. Thompson had made to Mr. Jensen. Uh he can make one of his witnesses disappear. So the, and this is Mr. Jensen describing this to you. Yes. And did Mr. Jensen say anything more about Why it? is the defense tell bringing me, this in, dude? I exactly don't know what it was that Mr. Jensen said to you about this discussion. He was, uh, Mr. Jensen was explaining to me that him and uh, Mr. Thompson was talking about a witness, a particular witness that was on this case that lived in another, another county outside of Kenosha. And I guess from my understanding that um, the witness had testified against him and um, Got his bond or something. We I have from a couple to come theories as why they would and bring him. He was mad they, about that, and the way he was explaining, like he was a a major factor in his in his case, because if he came, if the individual right. came the first right time, now, he's validating he testified on him, that he'll come again today or whatever. He's validating he Thompson. He's validating Thompson. So I guess I guess he was explaining that to Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson brought an offer to him. Was stating that, well, you give me his name, I don't. State, you know, I'll make something happen. I'll make the idea is they're trying to validate that there was a deal for and statements. After Maybe. that, he left. He had Mr. Thompson had left and went to uh, went to uh, Chicago to take care of his his business. And this is great. And again, we have thirty seconds. So I told me it's about stupid if you do this. I, I think that, that was could cool. very well go you know, south. If you feel you got confidence that you can beat your case fair and square, why would you need somebody to take a witness out? To, you know, to make now did Mr. Jensen respond, if at all, to your, to your if, uh, if there advice? is, right. well, I hope he did. I'm, I'm open um, to the possibility, the but otherwise, I don't know why you run this no. name if the prosecution did. did um, I'm with the chat. You and Mr. Creed, as Creed said. Just, Excuse me, just hold it. There's, there's no doubt it goes south. I have a slight doubt. <clears throat> I'm a little worried, but. But this is part of my problem is like, get out of your own way. Yes. Prosecution already didn't do a great job. I think all of us more or less agree. Yeah. So why set yourself up for the possibility of failure? And hey, by the way, ladies you know, and gentlemen, Mr. Jensen was describing this. Um, I am going to mute the stream because we have a fantastic guest, Miss Natalie Wisco. Hi, That's sorry that I had to leave. I had some office appointments. I thought the first one had stood me up because he was 15 minutes late, but it's because he was biking to my office in the snow because apparently oh that's fun for some people. <laughs> oh, Lord, I can only even freaking imagine it's 60 degrees here in sunny Tampa and I am freezing. So, yeah, it's I'm 65 here. In Floridian. It's 65 here in sunny Arizona. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, we don't have no idea. <laughs> what that's what that yeah. is like, but. I I just popped in. I have no idea what this witness you guys were talking. Why would they call this? I think maybe I don't know. Rule of completeness. Maybe they've got to play the whole thing. I don't know if that's yeah. something that the judge had ruled as if they introduced part of it, they you know had to do the whole thing. There's probably a motion to eliminate about it. And yeah, I uh, I am pausing the uh, trial for the moment. We'll catch up over. 
the afternoon break. But welcome very much. It is Hi. a pleasure to have you on the Shave Robine Show. Thank you. Sorry about last week and me getting the flu, but... No, not at all. I, I'm glad that you're feeling better. I am. So I, I have many, many questions. Mm -hmm. um, I have been losing my mind over the course of the last 10 days of this trial on the lack of objections from the defense. So mm -hmm. I gave a little bit of an out saying that maybe it is a cultural local thing. And by the way, sorry, I let's rewind. Please introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm here. I work in Kenosha. I was could have popped in the trial the cell myself this morning, but I got a protein bar instead. Fair enough. Did, did you see that Mark's in the trial? I did. I saw that. Room? I actually was thinking he probably was going to go in because he has his court down there. I don't think starts until three. And it, I think he left a little early so we could go check it out. I mean, it's something we do frequently. Um, which is, I know people had Mark commented, you know, Corey Shropsey, who also worked on Rittenhouse with us, was there, um, you know, I think last week or the week before. It's more of if you're there and there's something interesting going on, we just pop in and see, see how it's going. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, all right. So to the actual substantive questions, um, I've been losing my mind on the lack of objections by the defense. And obviously, this judge has been denying the objections. Mm. From my perspective, I gave them a little bit of benefit of the doubt because I think that maybe it's a cultural thing. So I am licensed in New York and Florida where you object to absolutely everything to build a record. Is that kind of, am I right that there's just sort of a difference or is it a stylistic thing? Um, I think it's sort of also, a, it is cultural regional in a way that I think, um, at least in my experience, um, with some stuff, um, some stuff, some cases, is that, you know, it's a lot different also when you got multiple attorneys going, because you've got somebody who's always going to be watching the jury. And we do take into consideration jury's reactions as whether or not to, to object to something. You know, um, at least in Wisconsin, we do, is the if nobody's paying attention, you know, just let them run, it would give, let them dig their own hole. That's kind of the thing is there's a lot of with juries, you know, are they paying attention because, you know, and part of this is just, and, and it is a different sort of cultural thing is I think juries in Wisconsin expect, you know, to hear certain things from people. And if you're objecting that you might be trying to keep something out holding something over from them. It depends upon right. what it is. If it's something that's a less substantial type of, you know, that's not what he said, she said, things like that, that's a little bit more a different story. But, you know, a lot of people in Wisconsin are skeptical. Part of it is, you know, I don't really know why, but we are. And it's the, well, what are they trying to hide by keeping something out type of thing? That I think is a lot of more of the atmosphere with it is, you know, sometimes if there's an objection, um, because, you know, some of the things that, you know, you would be, I'm sure, objecting to are not these extended speaking objections. Um, you know, it's stuff that you want to sidebar, you want to get the, the, the jury out of there. And that does, you know, I think sometimes make the jury focus a little bit more on what was happening at the time and what could they have been keeping out, you know. And part of it, you know, strategy wise, um, you know, at least that we did in Rittenhouse was, you know, because that was something that was huge, like, you know, everybody streaming and stuff. We got um, people contacting us all the time being like, you know, why aren't you objecting to these things? And I mean, it's because it didn't matter to the jury. I, I mean, I, I was in a position where I was literally facing the jury the entire time. And, you know, there's stuff that, you know, and it really has to do with the prosecutor you're going up against as well, is that, you know, if the prosecutor you've got coming across as being a bully, you know, a certain extent is let them dig their own grave because that is going to turn people off. And um, I do know with Jamboy himself that um, at least what I've heard through the grapevine, 
um, like trials he's had before is that they found the defendant not guilty just because they didn't like him. <laughs> Why so, am I not surprised? Yeah. And um, there's a specifically um, like this 19, I think it was like 1998 sexual assault case that involved a police officer. And he did read about that. Um, yeah, it was like he was special prosecuting and he comes in and is of the like, I was brought in because I'm the district attorney of Kenosha County and I have all the experience of doing this thing and they needed me here type of stuff. And when you come across with that pompous attitude, at least with, you know, the juries, it doesn't necessarily go across well. And at least in Wisconsin, I think that's something that they one of the first things that they talk about when they go back into the jury room is, you know, what they think of the attorneys that were involved in the case. And, you know, part of it also, you know, I, I get what you were talking about, about preserving the record. Something that makes me think that it's more strategic than it m might appear to you is because of the people who are involved in the case. Um, Jeremy Perry, the, um, the, the male defense attorney used to be the head of the appellate division for the public defender's office in the state. Oh, so wow. he has experience doing these things and he, um, knows what needs to be, you know, and he did it for a long time and he was successful. He was, you know, he's one of the public defenders frequently, you know, get a bad rap, but he is pretty well respected by everybody actually that I, you know, who dealt with, interacted with him because he actually does a really good job. So that makes me feel a little more comfortable seeing them not objecting to things is, you know, that I think he would object to it if it was something that was going to be important. I mean, we do read a lot into the jury and there also is, um, you know, a point that has to be said about, you know, a, the length of time that they're doing things, the state is doing things, stretching things out. And if it's going to be an objection that you've already objected to, it's going to stretch things out and kind of piss the jury off. It, it, it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. I think, you know, just knowing the people who are involved, it's more intentional than it might seem. And like Bridget Krause, the not the female defense attorney who's sitting next to Mark Jensen, the other one, she was an adjunct professor of mine. So I've seen her work as well. And I mean, she is not shy with objections in general, but she also, um, you know, it, it's very much reading the room. And, um, you know, Kevin Matheson, who is the Kenosha County Eye guy is in there. You know, I've heard from him, you know, that people are sleeping and that they're just not having it. So why right. would you like- Why would you, why would you have the point? Yeah, and why do you wake people up if they're just not buying it? Fair. You know, there are certain things for clarity of the record, you know, that Bridget was objecting to, like, no, that's not what it was said. It was a misstatement, things like that. Yep. You know, those are important things to for accuracy of the record, you know, needing to point out. But, um, you know, I think it's it's a bit more intentional. It doesn't, I'm not saying that it's a good, that it's going to be the best strategy. I haven't watched the whole case. I'm not in the room. But, I mean, it's a strategy and I think they're sticking with it. No, I, I think that's absolutely fair. And I think that there is a cultural aspect to it. And there is an interpersonal aspect to it. I just, I came up, I, look, I'm licensed in New York and Florida. Mm -hmm. And the standard that we have is you object to literally everything to the point where in some New York courtrooms, the judge and the lawyers will step out as opposed to removing the jury to not mm -hmm. piss them off. Mm -hmm. if that well, makes sense. And I think it depends upon a lot with the witness too, is if the witness is capable of standing up for themselves, I think it looks better to let them stand up for themselves. Which is what happened with the toxicologist. Yeah. Nearly yeah. happened today. She's very capable. Yeah. Is, you know, that was what it was if, about. Yeah, if the witness is able to stand up for themselves and make the clarification, because I mean, she was firing back at all of that stuff. And it just adds to the atmosphere of, you know, them, the state perhaps being, trying to pull something over their eyes, you know, type of thing. As you know, there is a bit of an appearance sometimes 
of you having to go in and save a witness, you know, why do they need to be saved? That woman did not need to be saved. She was capable of standing up for herself. And I think it was way more effective doing it that way because, you know, it just made him look like a bully. So once again, on the, uh, on the objection side, um, there were certain speaking objections over the course of the last couple of days where they would remove the jury, but they would let the witness sit there and listen to the speaking objection. Is that normal? Because I have not seen that before where the witness is essentially getting coached over the course of the speaking objection. It depends upon what the objection is. And it also depends upon whether or not somebody, um, you know, objects to them being in the room. Um, but if it is talking about something that, you know, the witness needs to know not to testify about or avoid, you know, it is helpful for them to have been instructed. And I, I think that's also just a cultural thing is, you know, I, I see more often than not them being left in the room. Okay. So at least here, I mean, and that's also just what's got to state court is, I mean, like I work in federal court too, and federal court is probably more like what you're used to, um, you know, with, with things in that respect, with them being a little more formal, you know, you object to everything type of stuff. Um, you know, it really depends upon the case and, and the jury too. Okay. And also, uh, so this comes uh, down to never stop, never, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Okay. I mean, unless, unless it depends <laughs> is if it's just like, um, well, and also sometimes people just like, I remember in, like, you remember the Johnny Depp trial, is you know you have to like make the right objection too and yeah. um yeah. otherwise it comes across as you just being like annoying and takes away from your credibility in some oh. instances oh, and i'll even say question. on this one sorry to interrupt you croc but i i'll just say on this one i there were certain circumstances where i think that they were appropriate to object, but maybe did not make the right one, or yeah. they were objecting to hearsay when it was really a speculation or an argumentative objection. And this judge has just nothing, has no patience for that. And I'm curious, without getting yourself in trouble, what is your opinion of this judge? Because I have been not thrilled with many of his rulings. Some of them I have been very happy with. It's been a total mixed bag, at least from my perspective. And I don't want to get you in trouble, but if you can give a little bit of background on have you had experiences with this judge and what are your thoughts on that? So I've actually never had a trial with this judge. Is So, I mean, I've had experience like motion hearings, being in his court, doing pleas, things like that, but judges rotate. And, you know, depending upon what their, their calendars are, things like that. I've worked down here where I'm at, oh, since like 2017. And I think he might be on the first criminal rotation he's had in a while. Mm. So it's more of, I mean, he was in juvenile, civil, things like that. So that's why, you know, like I don't personally have as much experience with him is because since I've been working down here, he's been doing other things. Like Judge Schrader, for example, um, from Rittenhouse was, did a criminal caseload for like 20 years straight. So if you're down there, you know, it, there are sometimes people who are a little more adaptable in their strengths. So they get rotated around a little bit more to, you know, um, be a variety. Um, the chief judge in Kenosha County, Judge Roselle, you know, like he's always been on a criminal caseload since I've been down here. I don't really know how they go about doing those things. Um, you know, how they, how they necessarily determine all of that. But, um, you know, I personally don't have as much experience with Milsauskas just because of where he's been since I've been working down here. Gotcha. All right. So I'm going to open it to my two co-hosts. If you guys have some questions, I still do have, but I would like to be a little bit democratizing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is your channel, but um, so I have a question along the same lines as the last one in, in the written house trial and in this trial, um, I feel like both judges, Schroeder and I just call him this judge because I can't say his last name. No, so I guess, uh, yeah. <laughs> call him Tony. Tony, yeah, Judge Tony. Seem Tony Milosaskis. Like, if, when in doubt, let it in. In terms of rules of evidence. 
Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that's. Is that Wisconsin? I, is that. I, I think that's more of a Kenosha that's thing. Oh, I think like it's more of a Kenosha too. thing, specific thing, is because I can't say that that happens everywhere else with everything. Huh. Um, I think it's more of in big trials that they do that, honestly, is if things are litigated beforehand, you know, it's more likely. It, it really, it, it depends on a lot. I think that it, there is a tendency to let things in, you know, in the bigger trials, especially as, you know, and also I think you have to remember the history of with this case. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. So, um, you know, I had the first trial and stuff and then the appeals. Do you know about like what happened with Judge Kirkman where he yep. just, yeah, ignored the order of the Supreme Court type of thing. And that I think sets a big tone for this is, you know, it's a discretionary decision and it's probably less likely to be overturned if you're letting things in as opposed to keeping them out. If you're thinking about um, just this specific case, maybe. I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with a reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's where it, it is sort of funny. And uh, Cole, I know you have a couple other questions, but uh, no, I, I've been making the joke over the course of this entire trial where Kenosha is where the rules of evidence go to die. Uh, and it's, it's really rough to watch the kind of stuff that should not be in front of the jury, be introduced and allowed. And particularly when it comes to Jamboy, in my opinion, him just straight up reading stuff into the record on direct. And it's it's been really, really rough to watch as somebody who is kind of a stickler for the rules mm -hmm. to watch this all just go through. Well, and I haven't watched all of it, so I can't really say that's like me as I'm, you know, generally just speculating because I'm sure there, because I, I have not had time to watch all of it. Is oh, that's what I would think? Good. Yeah. Is more of when in doubt, let it in. I, I'm more of the when in doubt, keep it out. But yeah, I am a defense attorney. So I think we both kind of think the same way too. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what, like, some of the hearsay that's being allowed in. We've had triple We're just, say just literally allowed. And from from my perspective, and I think Cole, you've probably phrased it best. Apparently we just decided that statement against interest means literally anything the defendant ever said ever. And that's not my understanding of the rules of evidence. That was my next question. So Yeah, I mean it's weird. I can't and see again, this is if I had had I, I know more the other people involved as opposed to Judge Melisauskas. He, um, he, he's, I think, generally like a people pleaser and a pragmatist in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, that's just kind of who he is as a person. Um, I mean, when he beat Jamboy for judge, I mean, how he did it was he basically went around knocking on doors. Yep. Yeah, that was his thing is he is somebody who connects with people and does with I don't know. Um, you know, with his I don't know, this is probably the most high profile trial he's ever dealt with, you know, obviously, and with the biggest history. I don't know. Um, you know, I have no idea how I'd be in that position myself. You know, you, you really do have a very high lens on you. And I'm sure he's getting inundated with people criticizing everything he does regardless. So, um, you know, it's it's a really weird position to be in being involved in the high profile cases because it's a you're damned if you do if you do and you're damned if you don't most of the time. I can't imagine. No, it, that definitely you have a huge focus on you. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's sort of interesting. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the judge beat Jamboy for the judgeship. Yeah. That to me makes it seem a little odd that he is so permissive of Jamboy's coming out of retirement as a special prosecutor for this particular case and seems to almost be going out of his way to try and allow jam boys to a uh, for lack of a better term uh restore his legacy since this got overturned uh 
I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't have a specific question. I'm just curious what your insights are since mm -hmm. you are familiar with kind of yeah. the situation. I, I think Jamboy thinks he's being a lot more effective than he is. But that um, was my take. I, I told you. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, um, I think he's, he thinks he's being more effective than he is. And this is, again, like at his own peril. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a question from the chat for a little bit further back. Uh, do we know the breakdown of the jury by any chance? I do not, but I can ask Kevin. Yeah, because I know Mark Richards was in the courtroom a little while ago. So Yeah, I mean, I can ask him. Let me just hold on. Let me ask. That's funny. Uh, Karak, I was on the same question from the chat. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he came up with it a while ago. I've just been kind of waiting for the right for yep. the right moment to insert myself. Yeah, I don't know exactly. I mean, I'm sure I can find out very quickly. Um, I just messaged someone who's over there, and um, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, real quick, I'm going to pull up $5 Super Chat from Odds and Fathers. Jam Boy is prideful? No. <laughs> no, never. I, the only reason, in my opinion, the only reason I can imagine that he came out of retirement to be special prosecutor is because he thinks he was right the first time. And I don't think he was. And I actually, Judge Schroeder, I think, put it best it probably should not have come in in the first instance. Oh, yeah, that was his thing. He's like, I made the right call the first time. <laughs> yeah. There, there's the five minute clip. But <laughs> yeah, we, we all watched We all watched that together. And that was during the written house trial. Yeah. Yep. It's like, you know, this never should have come in in the first place. They're downstairs arguing it right, right now. <laughs> finally re overturned. Yeah. yeah. So um, just for being in the community. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to. Trying to defend his own honor here, and I don't think he's got it. I think he may have missed the boat on that one. So let me ask you this: uh, If Judge Schrader were on this case, how do you think it might have been different in terms of permissiveness of evidence? And you know, I know you said you don't have. I have more experience with, yeah, more, way more experience when in the trial setting with Schrader, obviously. Um, there, he's, Schrader really does um, know the rules well. Oh, yeah. That's the thing, is he very much lives and breathes the rules. So I think um, relevance objections, things like that, are more likely to have, you know, been sustained um, in specific areas and also just like, do we really need to sit and look at all of his internet history? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. At some no. at some point, like that's but part of it is also, in my opinion, and you can give your thoughts on the defense counsel, is I think that they are very, very good on cross. So far, I think they've been fairly reasonable on direct, mm -hmm. but that's where I still get stuck that they don't object. And in fairness, um, What's the, the gentleman on the defense council? You said Jeremy like, Perry. I think he does a fantastic job mm -hmm. defending an objection. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's it makes he's, sense that since he appeals that was put that together for us. He's yeah, he's amazing he's, at it, and that makes sense why now. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, more of him doing like the expert type of things that they did at the yeah. end. You know, I think that it's more logical because of his experience, things like that. Um, I really don't know the third woman very well, the one who's sitting next to Mark Jensen. I know that she was involved previously, though, so she makes sense. Um, I did see Craig Alby was in there the other day, um, one of uh, Jensen's original attorneys. And, I mean, Craig Alby is phenomenal. He's actually the federal defender now for the state of Wisconsin, oh, wow. um, the actual federal defender. I were, I had an internship there, and he was my boss when I was in law school. He does a really, really good job. Um, and so, I mean, it's, when you're when you're dealing with public servant employees, at least on the defense side, is they've got some of the most like statistically successful people going on. Sure. 
And I mean, I, that sort of I mean, makes taking what you give, I mean, it's, and that's also, you know, they, it's jury, Wisconsin's weird. We're just weird state in general. Um, I mean, uh, somebody who currently resides in Florida. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is just, you know, people, people here don't like to think like they're having the wool pulled in front of their eyes. That's and, and I, and I understand that. I just, I, it is just strange for me from, and again, in fairness, I am from a civil practice perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's way different as well is yeah. Civil <laughs> is, I mean, cause you're dealing with people's money. You're not dealing with their lives. Right. Your malpractice insurance is way more expensive than mine because I only deal with people's lives. <laughs> Fair point. It's a sad reality. Holy on that one. Um, so, I, I, I have, can I butt in here for two seconds? Yeah. Um, what is, do you have any idea what the relevance is behind Jamfoy's issue with the porn stash? <laughs> I, I no. don't see how that's actually relevant to anything. There, there is a remarkable fascination. I don't. I, I would say I, I'm not sure if I even. So he's obsessed with the mustache. No, no, porn no. Stash. Porn stash. Okay. Yes. Oh, porn stash. Like, is a stash? I thought you're talking about like stash. <laughs> no, no, no. This way. We're actually talking about a. Oh yeah, the like a, a large of collection of phallic images. Oh yeah, okay, okay. yeah. That's my well, because when you say porn stash, my thought is like the porny mustache. Yeah, oh, no. yeah. I would instantly went to Ron Jeremy. Give you, give you yeah, I went. That's where my brain went. Is I was like porn stash. It doesn't. I'll give you the that. example when um, they made a huge deal about search of the residence, obviously. Yeah. And what they took away were the Playboy magazines. They did not take away any bottles of liquid that could potentially be poisonous. Mm -hmm. And he, they're making a huge deal about him doodling things in notebooks and stuff, as opposed to actually, in my opinion, direct evidence of, you know, the crime for which you're charged. And it's a strategy. I'm not saying it's a good one, but... Um... I mean, is I that something that would fly because of I don't the think so. jury pool? Or? I mean, I don't know. I don't really understand that personally. I think that it's making a mountain out of a molehill. But I think that might also be like a generational thing, too. I don't know. Um, it seems like he's spending an inordinate amount of time on it. A good chunk of the first, like first yeah, just saying four the or word five games like, almost nothing but. See, and that's the reason why I haven't popped into court is because if I would, I would just have to play the penis game and just, penis! Yeah. You can say it the loudest. <laughs> but, um... But that's basically what we're playing right now is yeah. almost, certainly on the direct, or the prosecution's case in chief, they spent an inordinate amount of time on just the fact that he was obsessed with penises. Okay, and it's cool. like, what does that have to do with I don't know, the crime that he's charged with. It really, I mean, he's, I, I. Hey, Nate, I'll send you a link. Oh, he brought it up on Cross, yes, on Cross for the. Uh, oh, we might got photo chat coming in. Yesterday. Mm -hmm. No, he's in court. I've been working. The, uh, We've been trying yeah, to get. But photo he's on break. So while, to give link. his perspective as well. I, yeah, I, I love like, the fact that y'all are so willing to come in and uh, give the perspective from the local side. Because like I said, I think that practicing law is very different in New York and Florida than it seems to be, at least in Kenosha. Yeah, well, I mean, in Kenosha is different than a lot of other counties is, I mean, Kenosha actually has like the highest, I think, trial rate of any county in the country. Wow. Not right. in the country, in the state, um, is they do more trials. I don't like, they just, I don't know, they just seem to. Um, like the first week of, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say the first week of, there's, you know, only like nine, there's five criminal judges in in Kenosha and like all of them were in trial the first week of this trial. Like they, there's just always trial going on in Kenosha. So um, I don't know, culturally, if that has anything to do with anything, but. 
So that that's sort of where I go back to where I said, do you happen to know, so for instance, um, do you know if Binger actually came up under John Boy? Mm, I don't. Well, because Binger's gone back and forth with being in like the DA's office and leaving for something else then coming back. So I'm not sure if they were there at the same time necessarily. I think um, – because Jamboy, um, I don't think they were there at the same time. I think Jamboy retired, I believe, like, 05. Yeah, I'm then that would have been before. Um, let me check, because I don't I don't see what year Tom yes. graduated law school. I found it genuinely interesting, because if this was the culture at the DA's office in Kenosha, I am not shocked at how um, the prosecution handled the Rittenhouse case. It does not surprise me anymore. Okay. Well, you've answered your own question then. I, I mean, it felt there, there's some similarities between how uh, between Binger and um, John Boy that I just are striking. Mm -hmm. The the persistence. Yeah on objections that ju with judges. Uh, so that is actually a very, very good question that I would like to ask you is uh, when it relates to the state's objections, you saw Banger basically bully Schroeder into borderline agreeing with him when... I No, they've never... They, they weren't at the district attorney's office at the same time. Sorry. Okay. All right. Cool. But... I, at the same time, there is, I think, a culture in this DA's office where they feel like they can bully a judge into their position as it relates to an evidentiary question. And we saw this a little bit during Rittenhouse, where I think there were a couple of circumstances where Binger kind of just wouldn't give up and bullied Schrader into agreeing with the state's position. And we've been seeing John Boy is trying to do the exact same thing, which I've never seen before. If anything, I think a judge, at least in jurisdictions in which I have practiced. You should be, protect the defendant's rights. God, you know, it's almost like you actually understand the Constitution and are a competent attorney. I mean, Isn't I know. Amazing? I, all I, and I, I had one of the reasons, you know, I left, I had back-to-back -back office appointments is, in general, my opinion is that if the criminal justice system worked the way it was supposed to, I wouldn't need to work in it. Fair. And by the way, if human beings actually were good to each other, we wouldn't need civil law. Yep. Well, I mean, and that's the thing is, you know, the best parts of humanity don't make their way into court. Yeah, fair point. And the, the way that I frame it. In, in, in every field, that's the thing. Is I mean, unless you're dealing with like adoption, maybe. Or like. And not even then, considering <laughs> some of the recent news stories. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. If humans it's, were angels, no law would be required. I part think of it. Was, I think that was it, quite <laughs> it might be apocryphal. Part of it's also, you know, Supreme Court stuff and Supreme Court decisions. And, you know, the it's hard for us to win motions here. Anything, you know, it's 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 not just something that's recent is it's kind of, you know, especially the Supreme Court has a big thing to do with it. The, the Wisconsin Supreme Court is it's it's, you know, so talk it's about not a very defend. It's not a defendant friendly state in that respect. It's very much not. So if, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to talk about that, I will give the floor to you. I think that's mm -hmm. really interesting because Florida is not particularly a defendant friendly state, but I think in a different way. I think that there's just been, um, it's hard to articulate. Um, I could write like a dissertation on this. Well, like um, I said, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No. I um, give some comments, you're more than welcome. It's it's just it's an institutionalized thing, and you know I think it's it's been very much um, it was in federal court too. You know the era of defendants' rights when we get 
you know, Miranda and all of these like, you know, instrumental um, criminal cases, you know, the rise in technology, I believe, is a big part of it. And people not understanding technology. Um, we had a lot of boomers, you know, for a long time being the people in charge. And I think that, um, you know, the judicial system in general is re re reticent to accept change with a lot of things. And um, not understanding things, people have a tendency to be more conservative, I think default to conservativeness. And I think that that is, that's part of it is as things have changed over time, you know, defaulting back to something that's just really not applicable anymore. So, you know, like a, a sense of, you know, conservatism and, and different, and I don't, I have, I have a hard time finding the right words because I don't necessarily mean conservatism in like the political sense, sure. but in, you know, like the human being sense is, does that make sense? It it does. It very much does. Is there an example that comes to mind that you would like to give folks? Because it makes sense to me, but I don't know that folks that are unfamiliar with the legal system necessarily quite got the picture. Okay. So let's talk about um, cell site location information, CSLA. So that is something that is... Um, from a defense point of view, something that is, and that's also very poignantly relevant with the Idaho murder stuff that's going on right now, yes. um, is, you know, so cell site location information, um, yes. you know, they say it has to do with like a reasonable expectation of privacy, your privacy and your location and your movement, things like that. Um, let's get in a lot of justifications, things like that are made in decisions of like, well, you're in public, so, you know, you can't expect your location to be confidential. Obviously, of course, that's going to be something that's, you know, um, you know, somebody could follow you on the street, da, 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 da. But the ability to track people over periods of time, maintain proximity, location, things like that is not the same as it was when, you know, some of these seminal cases happened. Um, you know, it's a lot more, it's a lot different when you're like able to track somebody on foot saying that they're in a public location, as opposed to, you know, somebody who is um, like your doctor's office, just like, you know, do we need to necessarily, is there an expectation of location in your doctor's office? You know, I would say yes. You know, you don't necessarily need or want people to know that you're at the doctor or like what type of doctor you're at, things like that. That's protected health information. But, you know, if we can establish through, you know, cell site location information that, you know, you bonk from here to here and we're saying, oh, you went to the doctor's office at this time, you know, so we know that you were there and, um, you know, let's track your location over movements and things, you know, it's getting timelines together, things like that, putting people into locations that just really wasn't even possible when you think about like people being in public and their um, previously and their like ability to be tracked is it's, you know, the technology. It's different having like a personal tracker on your body at all times than it is having somebody follow you around. From a technology yeah. The serve between your doctor's office and, we'll say, your home, where you definitely have an expectation of privacy. It, it, it there's no discernment there. Mm -hmm. So if you wind up with one, if you wind up with uh, with somebody in a specific spot, it doesn't know whether what, you're in a private place or not. Exactly, and that's kind of where I was going with that. I wasn't necessarily being the most articulate. Is that you know. These technolo technological things, you know, it doesn't differentiate between whether you're in a public park or whether you're in a doctor's office. And when I say doctor's office, I'm only like an AIDS clinic or something. Like, you know, that's not necessarily something that people usually want to make known. But just because you're like approximately within a location, you're, you know, you're saying ping off this cell phone tower, you know, it, it, it all, and like GPS information, all of these different things is... 
So I think like from a, all right, let me play a little bit of devil's advocate on that one. Cause I agree with you genuinely. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it helpful to be able to try and relate a signal in order to demonstrate evidence of say a genuine crime? If we have a warrant for it, what would be your standard by which the warrant ought to issue? Because I think that we probably See, would agree. That's the difference is because a lot of this stuff is, ac is accessible without a warrant in a lot of states. As you can get things with subpoenas as opposed to court orders, as opposed to warrants. This is also an issue of depending upon where you're at, um, you know, the ability to get that stuff. And is there any substance any sort of substance related to the location information itself? Is it just sort of statistical information or does it have any value? Like that is something that gets like heavily litigated in these, um, you know, the <coughs> cases like this is, you know, the, is the information in and of itself, does it contain, does it have context? Is there, you know, um, like what does the information in and itself contain and refer to? And it, do, like if you think about the like there's a difference between cell site location information um, standards and, you know, GPS standards in different districts that, you know, you have to have a court or uh, like a warrant as opposed to court order as opposed to a subpoena there. It gets really technical. So let me let me ask you this. So I'm um, I'm familiar with the area. Pretend that I'm not an attorney and I don't know anything. All right. Cell site location information um, just is your cell phone pinging off of something. It doesn't mean that you're using your cell phone. Um, you know, sometimes cell phones, it's this is a place that my cell phone, when it does periodic like check ins with the network, you know, as it does, um, that it used this tower. You all you have to do is be within range of the tower to have it ping on that tower. That doesn't mean that there's not a closer tower. No. It just means that that's the one in in the range. And I very much appreciate that explanation. Absolutely right. Back to my original question. Presume I know nothing. And I have a modicum of understanding of how the bulls of evidence and the law works. How is this different um, how should I say this? So in the rules of evidence, obviously we have things that are hearsay and hearsay exceptions, and we have things that are not hearsay. And so the question is what it is being used for? Yes. Is it, is it, that's a big thing. Is there some sort of crossover there in your mind? I, I'm genuinely curious. Is there sort of, um, Sorry, I just it's not necessarily to... being used for the purpose of litigation. However, it is still a business record. It does get. You, know, you see so, what I'm saying? Like, I, I have a, sorry. I have, a, I have to take the phone call. Can I get back to that in a second? Yeah, of course. Okay, thank you. The other side of that, John, is that you can actually buy access to these databases as a public, as a private individual. So if I got the CLI information for, oh, say, your cell phone, and not to say that I would, I could track you all over town and try and pin you to something that was over there and just hand that information to the police. Yeah, that's called private investigators. Yeah. I could hire somebody to follow you around for the rest of your life. For you wouldn't money. do that because you don't have that kind of money. <laughs> Neither do I. But, yeah, but you know, in you theory, I could. But if I handed that information over to the police, they could use it without a warrant. Yeah. Or a court order or anything else because I go, because this is, this, this is. That, but that's, that's sort of what I'm talking, case. that's sort of what I'm talking about is <laughs> in theory, I could literally just hire somebody to follow you around for the rest of your life. And there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt Natalie. She was doing, she she's doing well. She I was like doing great. Well. I, I love having Natalie here. I think Cole is trying to get photo chat on 
And uh, otherwise, uh, we are going to go back to the court because, you know, everybody else that is super interesting because you and I, in my opinion, are not. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and go back to the court and try and catch up during the afternoon break. <laughs> and turn, we'll go back to that. Thompson had left, and Mr. Jensen was speaking to you. Mm-hmm. What was it about that conversation? What was it about the things that Mr. Jensen said in that? It was really good to have Natalie's commentary and insight. And Mr. Jensen was seriously concerned. Kind of that Thompson. is awesome. Uh, it was pretty much like he uh, he had second doubts about it. About his, about his situation. About the case or yeah, about this the is, About his case. Kind of the funny thing is we have like 400, 500 people on those people covering Mr. Jensen the other trial. Concerning Mr. Nobody Jensen's here. After Mr. Thompson had nobody on YouTube no. has Natalie Wisco's incredible insights. Did you ever see um, Mr. Thompson? Like we do. And we might be able to get photo chat on. I think Mr. that's Jensen? exactly what Cole's no. trying to make did, happen. Right did you have the impression that Mr. Jensen was afraid of Mr. Thompson or anybody else in the cell block? No, not really. I don't think he should have been afraid of nobody. It didn't seem like it at the time. Uh, I heard, I don't know, I heard, but I'm not going to say. Well, if you didn't see something, I can't speak on Yeah, that. Mr. Clinton, I'll just tell you, because in court, if you didn't see it, or if, if you don't have first-hand knowledge, I'm not going to ask you. Um, you guys, so it, from your first-hand knowledge, you're from- I understand the there is a, another Mr. trial Jensen going on right now. Being, um, I get it. Or or but if you want any, any sorts of insights, no. And you you got to be right here. Like a month and a half. And so I appreciate the period of time, did Mr. Jensen strike you as being very reluctant to like I said before, um, if share you would like to support his case our ability to bring on such case. amazing yeah. folks. He was reluctant to do that. He was willing to do that. And give you okay. that sort of an insight. And, um, did, so you, did you see him talking about his case with other inmates? is a great way to yeah, do it. If you don't want to do it, you can, can you tell be us some of the other inmates that you saw him talking to? The PayPal link is in uh, the description. Is the court on the on the chapter break right now? Or? Yes, they were Jews in there. Okay, well, tell us the aliases. If you uh, we, it was one, it's one name. It says we call him Ben Latin because it's the way he looked, which is crazy. But he was sharing his information with him. You know, he'll break out with his with his paperwork and show him, and he'll read. Why is the defense and, bringing know, this up? And he'll, he'll talk about it, and I this ask him doesn't some sound great. And then you have a few questions about They may be going and, back yeah, to, uh, and then he, uh, it was a couple more they, times. They may be going back to what the original testimony was. Just, they just came in like weekend warriors. Either that or now. And they go home. And he was yeah, but you'd bring the person to the stand first. His paperwork and everything with him. If they were trying to use this impeachment evidence. You know what I'm saying? People that was coming in. Do we know who this person is? Okay, thank you. I don't have further questions, Mr. Clinton. All right. Mr. Jim. Mr. Clinton, you indicated that you're serving a federal sentence right now. Yes, I am. I mean, actually, that, that was uh, you were convicted on one count of distribution of crack cocaine, right? Yes. You were charged with another that was dismissed as part of your plea agreement, right? Yes. And they had evidence that you had distributed crack cocaine on a number of other occasions. I mean, is right? it possible yes. that they're building a record of how you have about prosecutions? I think you said twelve rates. years left on your sentence. Yes. Now. My information was that you had been sentenced to 212 months, and that was 17 years. Just about a year ago. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it's trying to discredit the prosecution as opposed to actually be a witness useful. With the time you've done your sentence credit and the the good time, you figure you have 12 left. Yes. But you're hoping not to serve all 12, right? If it's a new system, I mean, this is odd. It's a, uh, hopefully, hopefully, something goes for this crack law thing. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping I can do it. Well, you're also hoping that your testimony in this case will help you go below 12, right? Yes. 
your lawyer, Mr. Lieberman here. Why would the defense be bringing help follow up on that, right? Yes. That. And uh, you've also, why were you in the Kenosha County Jail? Because I had some other federal affairs I had to take care of uh, that pertains to my case. Federal charges against you? Yeah. Yeah. You had other federal charges? No, no, sir. No, I had no other federal, uh, federal charges against me. No. You were, you were in. Sorry, guys. One second. And we do this. All right. Well, in Kenosha, so you can down. cooperate against other people, right? Yes. That, but. And uh, because you know that you can go back to the judge and, and ask him for less time by cooperation, right? Yes. And you want to use that cooperation and the cooperation in this case to try to reduce your sentence, Mr. Klein. Yes. Oh, that's them. That's not me. And you know that the only no. way that you can help yourself is by helping the prosecutor, right? No. Well, if you if you helped Mr. If you helped Mr. Jensen, I couldn't I couldn't go to the judge and ask for less time. That wouldn't get you anything, would it? No. Right? You agree with that? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, you have you have ten prior convictions. Yes. Oh, I know who this is. Your first conviction is for an armed robbery, is that right? Yes. I think I do too, but I don't want to say it. Uh, He's already been on the stand. Cases? Yes. They're, they you are trying any, to uh, impeach the guy that was, they're trying to impeach the guy now. a case involving an Erica Jones, right? Yes. You broke in her door. Yes. You punched her in the nose, breaking her nose. Yes. Alice Jones. Said she was going to call the police, and you said you'd kill her if, you, if she called the police. No, I don't call that one. During that same incident, after you broke the door and broke Erica Jones' nose, you don't recall telling Alice Jones that you'd kill her. No. Are you saying it didn't happen, or you just don't recall? I just don't recall that part. Was Alice Jones there? Yeah, my mom was there. And then uh, Erica Jones' child was there as well, right? Yeah, my son. And uh, uh, and he also was hurt in this incident, right? Not that I know of, no. Well, do you recall kicking a bassinet over and knocking uh, your son to the ground, causing causing some bumps? No. Are you saying that didn't happen, or you just don't recall? It didn't happen. You remember being charged with that, though, right? Yeah. It was the old days when we actually used Manila envelopes. All yeah, right. I miss those days. Not going to say, Melody. And... By the way, when you were sentenced to 212 months by, by Judge Shabazz in Madison? Yes. And the prosecutor was only recommending 188 months, right? Yes. And Judge Shabazz went over what the recommendation was, correct? Yes. And that's something judges can do in the federal system is they can go beyond what the prosecutor recommends, true? Yes. And that's what happened. That's what happened to you, right? Yeah. And then, and then there was a uh, a Lashawn Sheldon. Remember her? Yes. And you beat her too, right? I beat her. No. Well, you remember having an argument about what she was wearing? Yes. Well, let me, let's let's if you want to dress like that, I'll treat you like one. Make their points. Yes. And you grabbed her by the shirt. We go. Right? Yes. Yes. Took her in the bathroom. Yes. Grabbed her on the neck. Yes. Choked her. No, I ain't choking. While choking her, you said, I'll do anything I can to kill you. No. Tried to punch her in the right side of her neck. No, I no. I don't recall all that. That was in your pre-sentence report in the federal case, wasn't it, Mr. Clanton? I didn't I probably didn't read that part. Most of the things in my PSI I didn't even pay attention to. Well, you were asked if there was any corrections you needed to make in that pre-sentence report, right? Yes. And you didn't have any corrections, true? Yes. 
And you had indicated that you went through that with your lawyer. True? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Clanton. Um, I'm inclined to say no, that it's not the same person. Because they Mark could have Jensen called him and used this in a case with other people, right? Yes. And he showed him, but a, I am for example, some police reports, right? Police reports, some of his, his uh, also some uh, documents uh, that to read, that pretty much you can read his file. He had his file in there. He had like stacks of files in his, in his cell, right? Yes. Lots and lots of papers. Yeah, he had two bins full. Welcome papers. back, Natalie. How are you? I'm sorry. I'm trying to like, I mean, like multitask. Put high stacks of paper. Yeah, I mean, I I actually, I think for today, I have to be done because I got a thing to do, but I've got more time tomorrow afternoon. I can pop in again. Any more questions, things like that, if you want to just save them up. Sorry, right. I can't get into baiting CSLI more, but um, I have to do my lawyer job, unfortunately. Yeah, no problem. And uh, guys, please thank Natalie for being so kind as to join us today. And uh, if you do have time tomorrow afternoon, it would be an absolute pleasure to have you yeah. back. They, uh, probably be more towards the end. Well, because I, I don't think they do Friday afternoon. Are they doing court tomorrow afternoon? I believe they are. Okay, that's what I thought. Is because usually Kenosha doesn't do Friday afternoon court unless it's trials. So that's what I was checking. Okay, okay. we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. Yes, thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you so much, Natalie. I appreciate it. Bye, the squirrel. <laughs> okay. All right. So we still might have some photo chat. Yeah, what's it been? But otherwise, uh, I'm just going to let this run. Like a foot tall, foot high. And okay, we'll catch up the over the afternoon break of, of papers. You'll right. see me for a moment. Yes. You could see it. And, uh, and when he'd show people his papers, he'd, he'd say, basically, this is crazy, right? He's playing inside <laughs> side of the situation, yeah. Right. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with telling people you didn't do something or explaining why the reports are messed up, right? You're right, right? Except that it's not very smart to do when you're in a jail, is it? No, it's not smart. Um, and you know that if you talk about your case with people, that someone may use it against you, right? Yes. Yeah. And when you say use it against you, they may take information they get and then twist it and add some lies and then use it against you, right? Yes. You're aware of that ha kind of thing happening? Yes. It happens quite a bit, doesn't it? Yes. And you're also worried about having your papers taken and looked at even if you don't show them to people, right? Um yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah. So, because if somebody reads those police reports and then they know the names of a couple of the witnesses against you, well, all they have to do is just add a couple of little lies to it and it looks like you're confessing to something you didn't do, right? Right. And I think uh, another thing you've mentioned is that, is that you uh, one if you just kind of tick somebody off, they may use the information they got from you against you, right? No, it's, that's yes. his defense attorney. I mean, like, if you, you refuse to share your... Yeah, no, that's the defense attorney. Jim, Blay, you'll see him. They may respond back by over saying, to the prosecution. I'll stick you, right? If you're intimidated by him, yeah, I guess. But <clears throat> you recall telling the... Um, you were you had a recorded interview, right? Yes. Okay. And you recall saying at that time, this is, this is page four. By the way, um, I will take this opportunity... If you don't treat them He's right, treating someone else. This is a show. Whatever. Basically, would be like and viewers like you around, and you ask for something, and you say your no, super chats. Like, okay, you want this. All your right? memberships and, you and kind of all of that is what makes this happen. I and you were just promise you. Ninety-eight percent of down everything, demanding, and I am able may, to earn. They may turn against you. I, is as that, a result right? of your generosity okay. and not no, you. I, I can't agree with that. So you so can do that, is, or you can that, donate through the PayPal link. It's like I have a thing: you should be, you get respect, you get respect back. Now, as far as somebody just like, okay, you don't give me no canteen when I ask for it, or you don't give me none off your tray. Okay, I I got some for you. 
That's stupid. Uh, that's okay. serious because stupid. Well, I'm just looking. This at is why we're able to bring on right. folks like that. Right. 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 And I have nothing but the absolute appreciation for Natalie for doing so. It's fantastic. Oh, this is a this the because I get to keep the lights on. Yeah, Natalie avoided largely the press. I'm sorry, and do you recall saying that about the canteen and you just changed your mind or or you think that she uh, absolutely did. Well, yeah, but she's willing to yeah, come I'm on today and right. she's willing to come back she tomorrow. Yeah, you should be respectfully respect her. <laughs> that is an amazing oh, insight to Kenosha. Taking somebody, it's like you offer somebody to ask like man, you get a clear bar or something. And you tell me no, yeah, okay, no, certainly no. Through it now, and some and some of them don't look at it like that. So you fantastic. There are some people who take a no for canteen with a respond with punch in the face or something. That or or probably like you say, uh write a note in or something. Oh, so they, they may try to set you up for something if you don't We're all behind. Yeah, I, I decided to pause it so that we can have that. Do you think the greater great. danger would be that if you share so share we'll your catch up during the afternoon break. They can use it against you to get themselves a deal. Yes. And so you thought that was pretty stupid of Mr. Jensen to let people look at his stuff. Yes. You indicated, Mr. Clanton, that you did not hear any conversation between Mr. Thompson and Mr. Jensen? No. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Um, did you see Mr. Thompson shove or hit Mr. Jensen? No. I, I think believe it's nine and seven. At some point without you seeing Not it. yet. Yes. But we don't we have an attention to yeah. it. Oh, that situation occurred. Huh? Yeah. AK. That was my understanding. You came in on August 16th, is that right? Yeah. No, I, I don't think and when you came in, confirmation, you but right I, away hear about an altercation that had happened the day before in that tour with J Block. You know, we, need, we, we don't know. We don't know who we're going to be thinking about. Two guys so, beating up Michael Clark. No. Because they don't tell you that ahead of time. Well, actually, not select. I don't, Mr. Thompson. Uh, there for Judge Reader didn't select uh, two weeks. Weeks. There was no uh, selection. In generally general. speaking, well, yeah. I'll say that yes, generally speaking, they don't. My understanding was that to get rid of a witness, uh, Mr. Thompson's offer was $100,000. Yes. And uh, Mr. Jensen never told you he accepted any offer, right? Gonna buy it. That's what he said. He was talking to me. He was on my side. Now we asked Natalie if we got when if he, uh, he could, about the situation. He figure it out. If I was talking to another individual. He was just discussing she other things. Get a chance to respond he on came, it. came, 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 approached me and was asking me about it. Was that other individual there? Yes. Who's that? Thank Bernard Bush. Well, yeah. We'll have Charles an answer tomorrow. Bernard, Bernard. If you tune in once again to the <laughs> Channel. channel. And he simply told you that Mr. Thompson had approached him with an offer, right? Yes. And he hadn't done anything about it, right? Not right then and there, no. Thank you, Dad. Finally, he cleaned yes. out my office and moved back out of my living room. Yeah. I'm in my dining room. Because reasons. Well, it's supposed to be a dining room. <clears throat> It's really not, but me. Eh. Fair enough. This is the place no. where my desk is now. Do you recall what time of day Mr. Thompson came into the cell block? It's like after lunch, like around <coughs> about one thirty, four to two, somewhere around there. CC for a couple days. You make a very good point. Uh, I don't understand to to why they are. And then he came for the day. as hard as they are. I think that a lot of it, and there are times when the defense, 
and then you return build the game off. plan no, and you want on one head, even if you don't need it. Was it a few days before Mr. Thompson and Mr. Thompson? I don't know if that makes sense. After Mr. Thompson arrived? No, I would, I would. That is a fairly like, common like thing that I have seen. Is that that you build okay. All of this time, you spend this energy, you build the defense, Jensen, and you're going to run it regardless of whether the prosecution is dead or not. Yes. I think that might be what's happening here. So after like two weeks' time of watching them, that's when Mr. Jensen told you this? Yes. So if I was Jensen, I'd be feeding every, I'd be feeding those guys a lot of fault. Well, I'm bet, mommy, I'm not gonna pull that up, but you're probably right. Thank you, Mr. Clanton. That's all I have. Yeah, I mentioned that. He I said mentioned that when Mr. Clanton came, came back, um, he was in the next cell block over. I mean, Mr. Thompson. Sorry, Mr. Thompson. You're Mr. Clanton. I'm sorry. When Mr. Thompson came back, he was in the next cell block over. Yes. And what separates the cell block that you were in from the cell block that Mr. Thompson was in? Uh, glass and wall. So you were, able to see Mr. you were able to see Mr. Thompson? Uh, yes. It was my pleasure. Um, did, was is there any way for inmates between the two cell blocks know. to communicate I with each know. other? Yes. To describe the ways that you've seen. I really do. Communicate with each other between those two cell blocks. Uh, you can talk through a heater. They say, like a heater that runs across the wall, under the window. A heater. Yes. Okay. And you can talk. You can talk down to it to hear it and communicate whatever. Or you can write notes and put them on the wall on the window and show them so they can read it. So you've seen inmates do that. Yes. Tell me some of the inmates you've seen do that. Uh, I uh, seen Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson done it. Okay, did you, you, so you saw Mr. Jensen, Mr. Thompson communicate in which way? Either through the heater or by holding up notes on the cell? Holding up notes. Did you see what the notes were or what they were talking about with each other? No, not at all. But you did see Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson communicating with each other. Ruger, you're absolutely right. Each other. Yes. I think that they're trying to run out the day ever, because you hear them their wife would each other by not talking available. through this heater duct that you talked about. No. Which is not super fun for us, and but over also how long not a bad tactic. Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson communicating with each other through the two cell blocks. Uh, it is what it is. Mm, about a week later. Now, the, when the, you had this discussion with Mr. Jensen, when Mr. Jensen started talking to you about this. Um, planned a, a proposed abduction of the witness against him. Yes. Uh, was Mr. Thompson still in the cell block or had he left the cell block? By There's that time? Left the cell no, block. Hey, did Mr. You asked the Jensen questions, I answer them because I'm a little bit Mr. Thompson leery of YouTube apparently eating me. I apologize for right. that. Uh, I genuinely that is not there. my fault. Yeah, if you to me, I'd be very happy to. That's going to go to Alberton. That's going to pick the individual up. There's but take him I would like to still be able to be here with basement the basement like that. <coughs> it's going to keep There's other ways to respond to you. With. This is what Mr. Jensen told you. Yes. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Jensen the feasibility of just holding somebody in the basement of a house until the trial was over? I told him it was the dumbest thing if he ever done. Huh. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. I don't have any further questions. Great but, uh, final question, by the way. Even though this whole that video was relating that is to it was a great Mr. final question. statements, right? Right. That was what Mr. Thompson was proposing, right? Yes. And I'm very happy to answer your questions. And I would be fair to say, Mr. Clinton, that bring up uh, certain things. Many inmates in that J At block on street. talking about Mr. Jensen in this case. Probably who he talks to, yes. Your questions are absolutely you know, talk to us about him <laughs> when you feel like talking to him. Uh, you talk? Excuse me. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I interrupted. Or at least word uh, them differently. When, he, when you feel like talking to select few people, he'll go talk to him. 
But other than that, like people that come on the new, they'll try to, you know, talk to him. He'll talk to him back. Then, you know, he feels he got a friend there and they get to talk to him and things like that. Everybody knew who he was, right? I guess, yes. And what his case is about? Oh, even on redirect, they still pulled the same crap on your e gas city questions. All right. Watch the news. Not Wisconsin news, no way. I was news. watching like Channel 9 news, uh, Channel 7, anything that was Illinois related. The majority of everybody there was from Illinois. And weren't there newspapers in the show? Yeah. That then the Kenosha News? Yes. And people would talk about Mr. Jensen's case being in the news? Oh, you wouldn't get the paper. Yeah, he'll he tear it out before we get the paper. Whatever he had in there. Yeah, you because he was the only one getting the paper. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yo, my he man. Right? Photoshop. Not the paper. Not his newspaper. I'm gonna pop in the newspaper, he'll let you read the paper. You're more than welcome. Then people would read it. Then people would read it. Right. I don't know. That's I think cool. that uh, I thought Mr. that I had a slide jump people and Mr. Jensen would talk to the cell block when you were there. Yes. But yeah, the we're we're folks uh, and sun jump. Mr. Bush. Uh, he's been, Bernard we, Bush. We, yes, we're sir. of the opinion that he's, he's annoying the jury so as well. So would you say that he spoke to Bernard Bush more? They put their notes the way we did. By the way, if you want to shoot me a DM directly, I will give you a link in a heartbeat. While you were locked up on the same block with Mr. Jensen, which inmate did Mr. Jensen talk more to than any other inmate? You let me know. Mr. Thompson. All right, I'm going to wander off for a few minutes. Which inmate did right. Mr. Did I work, I Jensen speak with back. second most often besides, or most often besides David uh, Thompson? This guy is not helping me. Uh, Mr. This will be over soon enough. Okay. And which inmate did Mr. You're going to run this until 415. Which inmates, if any, did Mr. And Jensen at which speak point to besides the judge is going to send everyone for the night bush? Me. That's my guess. But that's no. okay. Aside from I those would. three persons, David Thompson and Bernard Bush and yourself, did you ever see Mr. Jensen talk to any other inmate in the facility? No. But that seriously, Photoshop, hit me a DM. Everybody that was there before. It, I mean, it, it, that block changed, you know, like every couple of days. And the ones was there. Yes, you see me. But Mr. Jensen, hit me up. Bush, and myself, we were there the, the longest. And then new people started coming in. Did you ever see Mr. Jensen speaking to the new people about his case? Yes. So he did speak to other inmates. Yes, he did. If was not, if any you want to come on today, to that's fine. Basis, but if you, you want to come on and give your commentary, I would absolutely uh, love to hear it. I don't, I don't know their last names, though. But yeah, it was. It was a couple more. Do you remember which cell number you were in while you were in that in the cell block? One. Do you remember what cell block Mark Jensen was in when he was in that cell block? He was in cell block two at first when I first got there. And then they moved him to cell, cell six. You remember what uh, cell David Thompson was in? Four. Do you remember what cell number Bernard Bush was in? Four. Thank you, Henry, for the questions. Ah, uh, fair point. Well, probably, I think he is in the class. Basically, you're saying he talked to a whole lot of people. Yes. New people, right? Mm-hmm. Yourself, Mr. Bush, Mr. Thompson, right? Yeah, yes, it's in Laden. Fairly good point. Yes. Uh, is that is that Mr. But Romero? if you want to yeah. hop in yes. during the uh, morning Mr. break, Campbell. lunch break, or whatever tomorrow when you first arrive, you're more than more than welcome. No. Yeah. But you know, you wouldn't recall everybody's name from the time you were there. That'd be fair to say. Pretty much. I mean, you're talking about new guys who come in or go. If somebody was there just the first week you were there, you may not remember that, right? Right. Yes. And I take it you weren't, you didn't have a timer or anything. Good morning, Chelsea. Talking to from you most Earth of what's going on, right? Pleasure to see you. Timer. 
Uh, full handled the yeah. first half of the morning. You noticed because this I had time. I take care of. Talking to you were thinking we are right. doing all right. Yeah, I was thinking worse than that though. But yes, pleasure to see you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, very foolish to, sh to share what he had with people, right? Yes. All right. Thanks. All right, so right now it is four o'clock, almost four o'clock. I think he's giving them their afternoon break, or is he? He's not closing for the day because he didn't give the admonishment. My man. Cool, clear water. Thank you for the $10 super chat. In recovery, everything went well. Uh, thanks from the entire Jordan's family for your support. My friend, I am so glad to hear that. And you guys, try to break up please, uh, your prayers and hopes meant the world. Um, our really good friends in the channel went through a pretty major surgery, and I am so glad that it worked out as well. That it worked out well. That is awesome, and it is good to see you again. Your granddaughters have been doing an incredible job holding down the fort, so you have a lot to be proud of. Thank you very much for the for the super chat, and I'm just so happy that everything went well. All right, so they're on their break. I don't actually know what to take away from that video. Um, I wish I did. All right, well, that makes it a little easy. My opinion, some of the jurors are starting to look at Jam Boy as a bully. Say that because when Jim Boy starts his rant and starts to raise his voice, some of the jurors shake their heads. Fair. This is our friend of the channel, although I have not been able to get him to actually come on. This is everybody's friend, Photo Chad, who is a genuinely good soul. And I cannot thank you enough for being here this evening. And a really, really honest viewer of everything. I, this is the guy that called out Binger and just awesome, awesome, awesome human being. The jury are taking a lot of notes. That's interesting to me. Um, can I ask you, were they taking a lot of notes during the prior few days? Because I know that we saw you a little bit in the gallery. Because that would be really interesting to me to see when they're engaged and when they're not. Yeah, it is CCW, absolutely. It is so cool to be able to get a report from the courtroom. It really is, and it makes a huge difference. Yeah, if you remember, you know, I've had cases where I decided to just go down to the courthouse and report live and there is nothing like being able to get a 
watch on the jurors. That's like half the job of a second chair attorney. Can everyone else hear me? Hello? Or is it that you guys are in like a Zoom call? I can hear you, John. All right. I think that Trial Junkie is, uh, or Cole, is doing the best that he can to try and organize an opportunity tomorrow for Photo Chat to join us. Cool. So that'll be really neat to see somebody who's been watching this trial. So are they done yet now or no? Because it should, it should be about time. I mean, it's 4.04 .04 there, 4.05 now. Um, I think that this is supposed to be the mid-afternoon break, but I don't think that they were really clear. I think they might have said that they have a very short witness for the afternoon. So they were taking a short break. The 30-second witness? God, that would be nice. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, that that the other witness was short too, and it wound up being you know uh, two hours of jam boys just screaming at it, screaming at the guy. All right. Now we don't talk about what happened with uh, that poor toxicologist. Hey. <laughs> I guess you got some family uh, around you. No, we got pup. I got, I got. That was a pair of puppy dogs, actually. One That's all right. Is, one of them is going back to her original owner this afternoon. That's all right. Oh shoot! You're absolutely right, guys. I can fast forward through this. Yes, you can. Oh, there we go. Click. <laughs> Welcome I'm back to you. the continuing trial of Mark Jensen. Witness, Mr. Perry. Judge, well, before we do that, I, I want to put on the record. Um, Thank you for reminding me that, that I was Daniel behind. Klein's testimony has been added to Defense Exhibit 104 along with the transcript, and I've moved that into evidence. All right, that will be received then as part of 104. The, yeah, um, the, that was the defense, the that made the defense's call. next witness Stop. is another video. I, honest to God, uh, I forgot. Join Wise. That. That I had paused what for a while while Natalie nose? was here. Oh, goody, a second video. How far back are we? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. 32. All right. And, Judge, we have two videos, but they're both short. And by short, I say 15 minutes. What's your definition of short? I think they're about 15 minutes. That is a good definition. <laughs> right, good. Let's do the first one. This one looks like it's 1456. Thank you. All right, well, and here we go. Your name and spell your name for the court. John Wise. Wise is W-I-S-E. Ms. Wise, what do you do for a living? I'm retired now. Oh, oh good. You're retired. Retired. You what is your occupation? Yeah. Um, I work for Secure Insurance. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you I work for Secure Insurance. How long had you been with Secure Insurance? Five years. And was that approximately, what, 2001 or 2002? 2002, November 2002 till November 2007. Yeah. So you, you just retired a couple months ago. Right. Um, <coughs> do you know a man named Ed Klug? Yes. Did you ever work with Mr. Klug? Are they yes, I worked using... with Ed for 10 years from November of 1991 to May of 2001. Where were you working with Mr. Klug in November of 1991? Robert Baird. 
How long did you work at Robert Baird with Mr. Clue? Ruger, if it were just me, Seven I would. So from 1991 until 1998? I don't need to to everybody. Uh, what was your relationship to Mr. Clue in terms of his, uh, working? He was a stockbroker and I was his assistant. You personally were his assistant? Yes. For that entire seven years? Yes. While you were at uh, Baird, did you also work with a man named Ron Ruck? Yes, I did. Did you also work with a Stacy Bauer? Yes, I did. In 1998, uh, did you have a change in your career path? <laughs> October 1st of 1998, we left Baird and we went to open an office of Stiefel Nicholas. And, and where, well, first of all, where were you working in Baird? What city? Yeah, uh, I don't want to do it. Exactly. Where was the office for Stiefel Nicholas that you opened in October? I don't want to do it. It was in Kimberly. That's not what we do here. The sort of suburban Appleton. Yes. <laughs> if it were me personally, I probably would, but cool. I'm not cool. going to join the, the uh, Stephen Nicholas firm from Robert W. Baird. Uh, myself, Stacy Bauer, Bonnie LeClaire, Ed Klug, and Ronald Ruck. Who is in charge of that office there in Appleton? Ed was going to be the manager, but Mark Jensen was our manager until Ed got licensed. How long did that last? I don't recall. A couple months, maybe. A, a short period of time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, was was Mr. Klug the, the branch you, manager himself? If you prefer, or, uh, both Ronald Ruck and Ed Klug were co-managers. Uh, did you did you ever meet Mr. Jensen? Yes, I did. How many times? <laughs> Once. All right, thank you for the deal. When, that? when we this is went Wendy. to open up our office, he no came to help the afternoon. Ed and Ron with the transition. Uh, yeah, well, from we there to clearly Steve have Nichols. not been following that. <laughs> Would that, have been, would that have been like the first week that you opened up the office in Kimberly? It was the first day. So after Mr. Jensen was there the first day, you never saw him. Pat, you were most welcome. Like so you, he wasn't I, fair to say he was not much of a hands-on yes. manager for those couple months? Um, if it were just me, that he was the but manager I won't by until probably, the hearing but I'm not going to my attention. I remember that we had to right. mail forms for him to sign. On a day-to-day -day basis, you know, that's the rules uh, that Ed and Ron Ruck make the decisions as run. I don't know what they what their decisions were and what decisions they had to go to Mark for. Okay. At, at the time, were you uh, aware of Mr. Jensen participating at all, other than signing some paperwork? I knew that he was just going to be the manager until Ed got licensed. I now while you were while I'm you were there, leave that up there. That is what was your work relationship with Mr. Very, Fried very good to see you. I was his assistant. Like I said. And were you did you remain your as assistant from October nineteen ninety eight until you left in two thousand and one? May of two thousand one. So then so you were Mr. Klug's assistant for about ten years total. That's correct. Okay. Um, did you ever have any conversations um, with Mr. Klug about Mr. Jensen? Do you want that money? Um, no, I, guess I, I just it's, didn't remember. It's okay. One got conversation. Okay, what was the conversation? That I'm not speed um, this. A couple months after we opened up the office, he came out into the area where all the assistants sat. And he said that yes, um, we just heard from I think that Stiefel Nicholas in St. Louis that Mark Jensen's day. wife had died and that she had committed that is suicide. Point. And I think that that's he, you were talking what about Mr. Clue. Mr. Clue, yes. Did he announce that to your entire staff? Everybody but Stacy, because Stacy was think the receptionist and she was and even these flying time until their witnesses were available. We worked in the center. Okay, so he announced this to all the people who were in the center of the office. Yes, Monty and myself, yes. Um, did he say anything else about Mr. Jensen and his wife at that time? 
not to me, no. Um, did you ever hear yeah. him say anything about Mr. Jensen and his you. wife at any other time? Not that I recall. I appreciate Mr. that very much. Did anything to you about Mr. Jensen talking Can you to imagine, him though, being Mr. Jensen in wanting to kill his wife? The jury box and never told having me that, watched no. this. Is that something that you would have remembered if you... If you <laughs> Absolutely. It's a problem. And no such conversation ever took place? No. Now, uh, did you ever receive a telephone call from a Detective Ratsford? Yes. Did you? Uh, uh, all right. I think, think it's a. Sure I'm correct. Did you talk, did you talk to him on the phone? Yes. Did you ever meet with him? It's a little sketchy. I, I, I understand, understand you asked you if they ever, ever had a conversation. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Mr. Klug about Mr. Jensen. If them finishing early, they kind of screw over the time of the defense. Well, did it relate to Mr. Yes. Jensen? Yes. Nothing wrong with screwing yeah. over. Uh, did you did you tell him uh, that you didn't recall? It's any sketchy, but it's not about Mr. Jensen lying to kill his wife. Actionable. Yeah, that's correct. That's what I told him. And that was truthful when you told him that, yes. correct? I'll put it this way. It's unsports. Did you tell him that there was another person? Or unsportsmanlike? What is the appropriate yes, term? I, told him, I don't know. Um, uh, conduct. A gentleman by the name of Santo right. had it's left a illegal. message on my answering machine. Yeah. And, he, and then the... But that is a really, said, really good insight, Kara. Okay, did so he... I didn't call him back. So you didn't call, you didn't call Santo back? That's correct. Uh, and that was based on the policeman's advice? Yes. Did you ultimately talk to Santo? Yes, he delivered a subpoena to my house for the hearing. And did you have a chance to speak with him at that yes, time? Yes, I did. Uh, have you spoken with him since that time? Yes, he's just told, kept me informed on when I would need to come to the trial. And is, is, is his name Santo Galati? Yes. Yeah. And has Mr. Like said, Galati been pleasant not with you? Absolutely. Wrong per se. If they intended to do it that way, then yes, it is unsportsmanlike like conduct. And it's unprofessional, in my opinion. So you're saying the reason that you didn't call Mr. Galati back yeah. before you Trials came to the subpoena was because of the advice of the There should That's not great. be any surprise when you actually now, get during the, uh, during those 10 years, you worked as Mr. Clinton's assistant. they went out of their way. Pretty well? Yes. Uh, if they went out of their way to actually uh, Mr. Clue's timing for honesty. Yes. And, uh, That's what was your opinion as to his character for honesty? In my opinion. Um, he wasn't very truthful. I'm not and sure that during, that, that during those yeah, 10 years yeah, that you worked with him, were you aware of what his reputation in the office was uh, as to his honesty? Way longer. Yes, <laughs> That's my opinion. And, uh, would you characterize Mr. Klug as an attention seeker? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Well, Wise. That's all that pretty good about Ms. Wise. Uh, just about everything. Mr. Klug, good night uh, to you. And one it's point a pleasure having you here. The time you worked there we required you to go to anger management counseling. Is that correct? That's correct. And then ultimately he fired you. That's correct. And uh, did that make you feel angry or resentful toward him? Um, a little bit at the time, yes. Now, um, <coughs> do you remember where you were located? Do you remember, dude, my man? How can I ask you? Can you meet yourself? Been arrested yeah, and charged please. with the murder of Julie Jackson. I think the first I heard of it was when <coughs> the policeman called me. You don't recall um, Ron Ruck and Ed Klug discussing this in the office after Mark had been arrested in front of. All the ladies that worked in the office? No, I don't recall that. Do you recall Ron Ruck ever telling Ed Klug in the presence of uh, the clerical staff that was assembled there that if he knows anything about the death of Julie Jensen, he should come forward and tell the police about it? No, I don't remember. I don't recall ever hearing that. Ruck, you know I love you to death. You say that, I'm um, going to have to be you. If... However, Ed Clue coming out and announcing to you and to the other clerical staff blowing my ears that out, uh, Julie yeah. Jensen was dead, that she committed suicide? Yes, he had just received a call from the home office in St. Louis of Steeple Nicholas. Do you remember Stacy Bauer's reaction to that news? 
like I said, Stacy wasn't in the area I was. She sat up front. So he, after he announced it to us, he went up to front, up to the front of the office to talk to Stacy. And of course, I sat in the back by his office. So I don't know what he said to Stacy. Oh well, I didn't. I, I, you didn't say that here. So you said it some other way. I didn't know about that. Okay. So um, you and Stacy Bauer sat in different places. Absolutely. What about Bonnie LeClaire? Where did she sit? She sat right in front of me. So if uh, Bonnie LeClaire, you and Bonnie LeClaire would have been told at one point and Stacey Bauer would have been told at a different point? Yes. Now, would have that have been the case also when uh, Ed God. Clue came back from That was uh, the, the days when you would wear a mustard yellow shirt. 1998? Would, would, would have been with the right. I, I wish I had actual legal commentary. Yes. 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 So, uh, and and I don't a, understand why Stacey they're made a specific point to come back by you two, or you two have made a specific point to come up by Stacy. Uh, otherwise, any conversation that Clue would be having with you, Stacy Bauer would ordinarily not hear it. That's correct. But Bonnie LeClaire probably would. Yes, because he would stand right between Bonnie and I. Now, you said that you were present when uh, Mark Jensen came down in order to assist in uh, opening up the Stiefel Nicholas office? That's correct. Do you remember Kelly Levante being there as well? Yes, she was somebody that was sent to us from St. Louis to help the girls transition into the office. Now, was did you have any impression as to how much uh, I don't help or how much work uh, Mark Jensen and Kelly Levante actually provided to you during the transition period of time? <laughs> um, they helped us with forms. You know, we had a big mailing to do. Other than that, I don't know what Mark helped the gentleman with. Did you uh, notice anything going on between Mark Jensen and Kelly Levante? It was pretty obvious. Okay, what did you what did you see, and what uh, th that caused you to come to this rather obvious conclusion? Um, looks, um, time spent together. We went and got the food for us when we had to eat. So your impression was that they were having some kind of a relationship? Here's my question to you guys. Way. I didn't Specifically, discuss it with anybody, but why is the defense introducing this testimony? <coughs> Dude, my man, <coughs> Ron, honestly. Can I talk to you about Sorry. the circumstances surrounding Julie Jensen's death? Not that I recall. Uh, I, I and you don't recall Ron Ruck and Ed Klug ever sitting, standing in front of you and Bonnie LeClaire and Ron Rock telling Ed Klug, if you know something about this, you should come forward and tell the police about it. No, I'm, I don't recall that. Oh, here we go. All I right. The fact that the announcement there was uh, the announcement in question by mm -hmm. Ed Klug was that the, uh, it's that the victim had created her own deceits. Okay. I don't need further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ruger, thank you very much for the $2 super chat. Thanks for uh, the invitation. It is my pleasure. And honestly, Mr. guys, Mr. Clint, if you have not already, to, please go over uh, to Cole's channel. Other employees and after I, Mr. Jensen was charged. You recall I am that. infinitely uh, grateful. Mr. Jensen or him going out of his way to take care of the show this morning. Were you working at I Stiefel can't Nicholas even tell you how much no, that it was super me helpful. Of 2001. So it'd be pretty unlikely to hear a conversation. If you guys can show him some love, that would be exactly. awesome. Um, and here he is. Why did, why did I heard my name. Fire you. He did. Speak the devil and he shall he, appear. Mad. I um, had an abscess to hey, sorry, I had to go get the kids, but I didn't want to interrupt to see the doctor to I chat with Natalie. So. But before I had a chance to go into that appointment in the middle of the night, my tooth acted up. So I called in sick. Why are they playing these videos, the man? They're not helpful to them to at all. Um, free to call um, me in whenever well, he could get me in. We did get the clue and that Mr. Clue wanted me to come into the office. This. Uh, and he called me like four times that day that. saying you have to come yeah. in. Yeah, we have to vacation days coming. This is definitely on the to some and extent. Then about three yeah, this one, because she said he was a tension seeker. Be coming back in here. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't know if it's as uh, effective as I think it might be. Mr. Klug was oh. not a truthful person. Correct. That's correct. Uh, oh, was that your opinion you before you were fired? Yes, it was. Did that oh, there we go. All right. Fired? 
Yes. I at least understand why it's sure. happening. Any across? No, you're right. you just Thank you. And the prosecution decided not to cross. Probably having the same thought. So Kara has a good question. So Cole, this is a question to you, and I'll also pose it to Krog. I answered already. Your Honor, while you're did. standing, I do want to ask I was it, going with uh, Jefferson and uh, evidence Hancock. that was the letter from. Yeah, I said Madison and Jay. That was testified about yesterday. What do you got, mm. Cole? Probably Jefferson. Was that with uh, when his staff member was here? Correct. All right, it'll, it'll come in. Thank you. Who's our next witness, Mr. Come Cole? on, you got to do better than that, Cole. And I don't know, let me think about it. Did you get time to think? Oh, yeah, I took a day to think about it. Okay, I'm going to think about it. He bugged me. I said Madison right out of the gate, and then it took me until the next day to say a mix of Madison and Jay. You give us one now, you can add to it tomorrow. Justice, what let me here. ask you what you do for a living. I'm a retired uh, uh, wizard surgeon. You're a, a pastor? Yes. Uh, where did you grow up, uh, Pastor Eckler? In Kenosha. Where did you, where were you a, a, a pastor? Where was your career? Uh, I graduated from Northwestern Theological Seminary in Minneapolis, and my first call in 1961 was to Two Rivers. Well, the nice thing is that we have about 15 minutes left, and this St. will Paul's probably be church. the end. How long I spent were you? 29 and a half years in there. You were at St. Paul's Lutheran Church for 29 and a half years? Yes. Thank you. What did you, and did you retire at that point? I retired in 1995. I do think I to some extent they did stand back to the past, resting church. early. What else have you done since your retirement? Uh, basically, you worked uh, I, as, yeah. as an interim That's ministry, interim ministry part of the business in, we're in. Uh, in Kenosha and Wind Lake. And in Kenosha again, different churches there. Do you know Mark Jensen? Yes, I do. By the do way, you know while we're Jensen's watching, family? yes, I do. Kind of BS. Yes. How do you know the uh, Let me Mark ask Jensen the and his family? Well, um, which founding father Mark's would you most identify with? I was called. And Fire so away. At, uh, Daniel Jensen at that time, back in 1965, and then came to Kenosha and. Um, uh, the Jensen's um, used to pick up my children to take them to Sunday school because we only had one car at the time. And uh, so it was, I got to know them no, quite well. You certainly are not weird. You said that Mr. Jensen, Dan Jensen. I have uh, maybe six yes, copies of the call in this call department committee. right call now. Call committee is a group of uh, men <laughs> and women who um, will go to a church and uh, I have one to, in my office. Or, or to interview the pastor of that church, which happened to be me at the time in Two Rivers to see if they would want to call me to their church in Kenosha. And so it's a group of men, that, who are women and women that- uh, When I first are, went to law school, uh, that will go to I was given a magic ball at a copy of the Constitution by, by what a, my the sort of the hiring committee for the yes. church. We call that a hiring committee. Uh, and the attorney you is like, you know, the, look, the Jensen's would take your kids start to here, school the Constitution, because you, were otherwise you can't find it there. Yes, this is an alternative. Okay, we're getting to Kenosha. We're going to Kenosha in 1965, January 1966. So did you meet Mark Jensen around that period of time? Yes, I did. How old was he at then? Mm, let's see, about uh, seven, six or seven. Well, I think about seven years old. Does uh, Mr. Jensen have a sister? Yes, he does. Who is that? Laura. Laura um, Kasser. Did you know both Mark and Laura as they grew up then? Yes, I did. Did you know uh, Julie Jensen? Yes, I did. When did you meet uh, Julie Jensen? Probably about the same time, or shortly thereafter, in, 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 during the early part of 1966. 
how is it? And I take it Julie Jensen also would have been a, she would have been a young girl at the time. Yes, yes she was. How is it that you came to know uh, Julie Jensen? We were neighbors. We lived, our, our, our house was almost abutted on the back. Your backyards were against each other? Not, not really. At least they, she was a little bit west of our backyard, but it was an open field at the time. Was her, was her name at the time Julie Griffin? Yes, it was. Did you know the Griffin family? Yes, I did. And because they were neighbors? Yes. And that, because we uh, did things through PTA. I mean, we, we tend to PTA meetings and things together. Were your children that, uh, that, that's similar not ages to the me. Griffin uh, kids? Pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, Nor fairly for me, Julie, John. I think was one year old and my uh, one daughter. And, and uh, Kara, I am not surprised were, at all. The youngest boy, I think, is about the same age as my oldest, my youngest son. <laughs> um, so they're, they're comparable ages, maybe yeah. a year or two off. But <clears throat> Did you, Were you aware of any particular problems within the Griffin family? It is kind oh, of a little older brother, uh, or older brother uh, before we got there. At some point, you realize that Mark, Mark, and Mark Jensen and Julie Griffin uh, were close. Yes. At some point, you learned that they were going to be married. Yes. Uh, did they ask you to preside over that? Yes, they did. Do you recall when that was, Pastor Eckler? The nineteen eighty. 1980? 1981? Right. It was, uh, As the late, I have the, the, the 1980s. No, it's not a date. I have no idea. Are you saying the early 1980s? Yes. Was young. And did you, in fact, sort of like a Myers-Briggs test? Did you attend the rehearsal dinner? Yes, I did. Uh, was there anything notable about the rehearsal dinner? Mrs. Mrs. Griffin got sick. Okay, and, and can you tell me what happened? She uh, she sort of passed out or, or went into convulsions and was taken to the hospital. Was that the night before the wedding? Yes, it was. Were you aware of what that was caused by? It was from alcohol. The, um, <clears throat> did you, uh, did Mrs. Griffin attend the wedding? No, she did not. Did you see her on the wedding day? Yes, I did. I went to the hospital to visit with her. And who else uh, accompanied you? Just myself. Did you see um, Mark and Julie on occasion during the period of time they were married? Yes, I did. Did you ever have any occasion to counsel them during the period of their marriage? Yes, I did. And uh, what brought on that, that counseling and, and when? It was in 1980. And 1980, by the way, folks, yeah. we are probably reaching the end of 1990. Oh, no, no, no. no. And she had the. I would have never said Franklin. When I was called by her. <laughs> and what prompted uh, Julie Jensen? I would never have said Franklin for myself. There's problems in marriage. Uh, Franklin wanted to. What was happening at that time? Not at that time. And how did you handle the counseling issue? Talked with the, both of them, and then I suggested. You go back to the actual papers. Them when Adams to to joined Franklin counsel. over in Versailles. Why did you refer he's like, to? You've a, been a doing counsel. what this whole time? Um, because I felt they should have further counseling and something that I could not provide for them. I knew my limitations, and I decided that they should go on. Were you aware of any affair at that time? Yes. Yeah, Applesaw is probably and not a bad one. know about that? So, Andrew, I respect that. That she had seen another man. That's fair. Was that one of the issues that related to the counseling? Yes. It was a little effed up when it came to... Pastor Eckler, you... I have my history at correct. Some point that Julie I'm a little left up at the right? in the north yeah, I did. in England. Can you tell me but... how, you, how you learned of her passing? I received, oh, I received a phone call from Florence Jensen. Uh, saying, that's, that's We're talking about Irishmen, obviously. I'm going Julie with Brian Peru. And would I come over? Was that on the day of her death? Oh. That was on the day, evening of her death, the day of her death. But if we're talking oh, about what did, you, what did you do then? I went to the house and... Uh, 
talked with them and uh, stayed with them till probably 10 o'clock. Yeah, who's house did you work here? Is that uh, Florence and Dan Jensen's home? Just because you didn't write the declaration. Do you know what time you arrived at the home? I would say I got there around 6. He's not considered yeah. one, though, is he? Who was at, at Florence and Dan Jensen's home that evening? Um, Florence and Dan, um, Mark, um, the um, Laura was there, her husband. And I think the children, if I remember right, the children were there, too. Did you have a, a chance to observe Mark's demeanor that evening? Yes, I did. And how would you describe that? He was very upset uh, and I feel distraught and con concerned as to what happened. Concerned that he couldn't get home. Andrew, he, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're referring to Athelstan for the district right? attorney was at the house. Or Northumbria. Um, there was just a number of things that it's been a long time uh, since they that I, uh, that were covered British uh, history. This, uh, yeah, I think it's Northumbria. Uh, Don't quote me on that. It was Northumbria. Uh, it was concerned to him. Did you offer him counseling? I can look. We talked for a while, but why not it's been a long time more. since I've done my did you, early. Did you see him great. again during the course of the next several days? I yes, I did. Up, up, up Could you tell me about that? I saw him on the day of the of the uh, with the wake on that Sunday, and got there prior to visitation yeah. with the I'm family. Sure, Andrew, will let me know together. exactly why I'm wrong. And, and I don't stayed know what through the, the about. Here's the, a really uh, good way of the wake that evening. So, the visitation that evening. So you met with Mark at the at the funeral home Mark prior to the time that the, the wake began? Yes. Do you know how long you spent with him that day? Prior, let, let me say prior to the, the wake? Probably about 20 minutes. And we, had, who, we had a little prayer service together. And then who was there? The immediate family, uh, which would have been the Jensen's and the, if I remember right, the Green, were there. I, I believe you're probably right. What was Mark's demeanor at that time? I, I think that the reason why they're playing videos is because grieving. they don't have the live witnesses available right uh, now. Over the loss of his wife. Because That's I think they man. expected the state not to And did you have a chance to observe Mark at the wake? Yes, I did. <laughs> did you believe that he was acting appropriately For, there? Uh, I don't think he was acting appropriately. Everyone acts differently, but so what is appropriate at a wake? But I, I thought he was actually does a, kind of screw with yeah, there appropriately. At any time, did you see him act in a way that you thought was inconsistent with grieving? You have to, not that I noticed, have at least some degree and of it, was there any occasion in which you saw him in reality you recall in which he was, was laughing? And so, if they didn't, again, they're public defenders, so it's not like they have a ton of resources. Um, they could have no. been, but I don't remember. They're doing laughing. the best they can. Okay. And if there had been some laughing, they're doing you okay. View that as as inconsistent with the grieving process. No. Now, I take it that a regular part of your role as a pastor over the many years that you've that you've been a minister is to oh, help people. Right. I'm uh, going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yes. Yes. On this. But You've been involved in in my personal opinion, yeah, probably, about, uh, probably about probably right nine or nine hundred two thousand. Woodrow Wilson was the worst uh, is that period how many president services period you think you ever yes. in yes. this country. And even sometimes you when you're not presiding this country. a funeral service, they'll come to you for so, support. <laughs> At times, yes. I'm going to give you the benefit uh, of the doubt. I do not believe in generational uh, guilt. Uh, as a minister, is, yeah. are you? Often the first person that uh, will be seen to to look for support. Many times, yes. And during those those nine hundred to a thousand funerals that you believe you've presided over, is uh, sometimes is there laughter? Yes. Well, why why is that? Is is that not inconsistent with grieving? I don't believe it's inconsistent with grieving. I, I think there is times when. 
something comes up and you laugh about uh, something you did together or, so, or a person brings up a memory. Okay, so I understand why they're bringing the priest. You laugh about it and it's not They're saying that, that people breathe in different ways. And so him not is, necessarily is process. showing. Um, Do you ever try to include some levity or humor in the an absolute words and speech, emotional the you give at a funeral service? Yes, they do. Is perfectly reasonable. Do you believe that that's somehow some measure of disrespect for the person who's passed away? No. And and why would you why would you put humor in a service like that? Well, it, 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 it's not a good taste. I think it, it helps it helps release some of the tension of the funeral. It's not. It's we, not it's not ridiculous to play in this a, video. In a funeral where a, a good friend. It's, it's not. Of, uh, go out of their way to suggest that because a, a he was person whose spouse has passed away. Oh yeah, they, uh, I, I, release I see tension that. on their own by telling a joke or remembering some. I mean, look. Have you ever been to an Irish wake? Nope. Those things are hilarious. I have a feeling you have. I was at my own father's wake. Yeah, um, and yeah. everybody's freaking yeah. having a good time. People grieve in different ways. Based on your and experience, part of that is cultural, uh, part of that is with, just with many how you individually people, process it. Do you feel that there's a single way in but, which people grieve? Yeah, my father's wake no, I don't. was a party. There's a variety of ways that I <coughs> elaborate so I want a party when I go. Oh, young boy. Yeah. 12 year old died of cancer. Never heard of uh, Finnegan's Week? A couple of years. One of the at the funeral at the church, we started off with because he had a piano player, a pianist that he that knew. Uh, oh he my God, I said penis. Okay. <laughs> and we're back. He said penis, like <laughs> Which, and piano. Uh, because he was a, he was a fan and sorry folks, I gotta he, go. He, he got to go to <laughs> the funeral a number of times by my grandfather. And, and so we, we started the service with that, which some people may think would be set religious, but but I felt it was a good way for the family to to be able to um, grieve a little bit easier that we could do that. The whole thing is, it, at, it, all at times, least in an Irish uh, week, it is a party for celebrating the life of the person at his parents' house on the night of his wife's death, and then and we'll and mourn their death at the wake yep. and service. You felt was appropriate. Yes. There's nothing that you recall that you thought in any way was any measure of disrespect for his wife, Julie. No. Thank you, Pastor Eichler. Mr. Jamwick. <clears throat> and oftentimes, uh, Pastor Eckler, when we're talking about a funeral or a wake, really you try to transform it into a celebration of the decedent's life, isn't that? Many it? times you do, yes. And um, Watch Jam Boys did Mr. Up. Did Mark Jensen talk to you about ways that maybe you could transform Watch him get this mad. wake or this uh, funeral into a celebration of Julie's life? We talked about what we were going to do at the funeral uh, in the service. Did, did he discuss with you the advisability of bringing his Shut up! To the Let wife? him answer the no, fucking did question. Did you God really have a in the months I'm preceding jacked. his wife's death? No, I did not. Oh. Did um, he ever, did you ever meet Kelly Jensen, the woman who became Kelly Jensen? Yes. Did you preside over their married wedding as well? Kara, I think I'm going to need to have to drink a I bottle of They had a blessing of their marriage. So did either Mark or Kelly tell you when they met? No. Did they tell you that they met when Kelly was engaged to Mark Creeman? No. no. These, these questions are irrelevant as to uh, this witness. I, I'm not sure that this witness is, uh, these are other than argumentative with this with this witness. They're not going to they're not going to uncover and something. I'm going to start ever. right now. See, and this is why I like Schroeder better. Yeah. That's a fair point. Go ahead. So, Thank you. Here's to you all. This is Wishke Tabatha, the water of life. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Don't do that. What happened with the circumstances? Object. The argument is not relevant as to this witness. Sustain. No further questions. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. No, 
Is that an exhibit number we can move in now? We're going to add it to exhibit. <laughs> I will wait until Cole, and then we will have it to together. Add videos to that exhibit, and we don't have any other witnesses today, Judge. Oh, no more witnesses. And that's what our last video. that? So. <laughs> For, Our the, last video. for the day? No, that's the last video <laughs> at all. Thank you. As of right Thanks. now, all the rest of our witnesses are live. No. <laughs> but they won't be here till tomorrow. Let's all right. I, I take it then no, we don't have any more turn. witnesses today, correct? That's correct, Judge. All right. 830, folks. Don't talk about the case. Have a good evening. Hey, so chat. Nate was uh because YouTube hates you. There's Nate taking pictures right now. Sorry. Nate was chatting with you guys while he was sitting in the court for a minute. He was chatting in court. It was so cool, and I would love to see if we can find a time during maybe the lunch break tomorrow. Or maybe let's say, make sure you have your notifications on. Yeah. Because we. Might have an early surprise. That could be the case. You want me to? I'm holding the jury break? for a few minutes. What's I just that? want to discuss. Um, Text me if you want me to. Does the defense have their witness yeah, list in front of them? Come on and hang out for. All right, I'm looking at. Yeah, let's uh, uh, in the back seat. Number up. 18 yeah. witness, Ann Lynch. She was called by the state. You're not going to recall it, right? But if you are not subscribed and you do not have the 31, David Wilkinson, you're not going to recall him then, right? Correct. All right. So tomorrow, give me the number. Uh, which number of witnesses are you going to call? Right now, the plan is to call three witnesses, and I will try to find their numbers. All right. How long Lindsay Thomas will take? She's going to be the first witness, Judge. And what number is she? Number 28? Do we know who that is? I do not. It is number 28. What number? 28. 28. So she'll be first. Yes. And then we plan on calling Laura Coster, and she's number 16. 16. And we right now intend on calling Ronald Rock. He's number 33. So the only expert tomorrow you're going to have is Dr. Lindsay Thomas, right? Correct. And we're going to start out with her. Yes. Okay. And then on Monday, just so the court knows, um, we have um, Pam Dreyer. Uh, let me She's get number the... eight. Monday. Okay. And then we have um, Miss uh, the expert, um, Dr. Sarah West. She's number 30. 30. Okay. And then David Jensen is number 13. Unfortunately, they couldn't change their travel plan. So Monday's as soon as I can get them, Judge. Okay. So, Judge, um, we're almost certainly going right. to have some rebuttals. So we're preparing to have that Monday afternoon if those witnesses are done or Tuesday. All right. We're going faster than expected here. It's going to depend on how it long. Depends how long the attorneys <laughs> ask. We questions. might actually be done by the end. <laughs> and I'm not making any. I wouldn't answer that question. I'm not making any representations. All right. Today. Nobody thinks you're funny, yeah, John Boy. <laughs> no, I don't think he's funny. Do you? No, he thinks he's funny. He certainly did, even in the videos from years ago. He thinks he has like that, like down home charm. So I am the, going to. I go ahead. No, no, it's fun. Um, I was just gonna say he feels he thinks he has that down home charm, right? Like, but he doesn't. But he doesn't. He does not have the charisma to bring that home. But he thinks he does, and clearly. Look, let's be honest. This was an elected prosecutor for a period of time. So, yeah. you know, it clearly didn't fail him, at least in a Kenosha election. I just, I don't know what this guy. I don't know what to do with him. He's nuts, dude. He's crazy. He's a hothead. All right. We interrupted something. 
We did. So let us do this. Cole, it has been my absolute honor to have you host the stream for the morning. It has been my absolute privilege to have you take your time out to do so. Everybody who has not already done so, please subscribe to Cole's channel. He does amazing work. And now here's to a toast. Classic Irish toast. All right. To abundance. All right. May your glass ever be full. May the roof of your head be always strong. And may you be in heaven half an hour before the devil knows you're dead. And <laughs> may us all never have to deal with additional video evidence over the course of the rest of this trial. Cilantro. Here, here. Oh God. I this I'm so glad we are finally freaking done with video evidence. Me too. Maybe we can actually Maybe. hold a retrial. So we know that that was just filler now. Like they pretty much admitted it. Yep. Which in fairness, that's not their fault. No, because the prosecution went faster than expected, right? My understanding was that the expectation would be that the prosecution would rest somewhere around middle of the day yesterday. Mm -hmm. They did that a day early. Yep. And frankly, to the defense's credit, they had some live witnesses that they were able to make happen. So yep. that's well. I mean, you, you're paid experts. You should be able to get there a day early. Do you know how expensive that is? Like you're just at a public defender's office. Yeah, that's true. So hang on. Sorry, let me close that. Uh, you're talking about a public defender's office. They don't have the resources to post somebody up in a hotel for two days. Uh, yeah. Do you but know it, would just be changing, it would just be changing a plane ticket. Let me ask you a real quick question, and you can guess whatever you'd like. Do you know what a toxicology expert costs per hour to read records? 400? Yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. 350, 400, 450, depending upon where they're from. And... 10 times that is what they do for a day of testimony. Yep. So do you know what that time would look like in terms of the books? If you had to post them up in a hotel for a day I, not working? You just change the flight. Fly them in a day early. Fly. So it's the same do you know amount what that costs these days? Southwest is still free, bro. Yeah, I'm not. You can't send your experts by Southwest. <laughs> American, I think American is still free too. I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it this way. Dude, there I change plates all the time. Experts that are going to go fly Spirit for you. No, no, but I mean, I've changed plates all the time. It's not that big of a deal. We live in a very different world now, my friend. Dude, I changed my kids' flight the other like last week because their tournament ended earlier. Right, but the inconvenience, and yeah. remember, all of these experts have pre-written agreements with the attorneys. Yeah. Well, and they also might have actual other stuff scheduled too. And they might actually have, like, for instance, another trial. Oh, yes, that's the problem. So it's a problem. And all right, so I want to go a little bit back to the morning because I don't know that we necessarily had a chance to go through all of yeah. it. Um, I made the point, I thought it was really fantastic. So I was listening in the morning, uh, while I was driving out to the other attorney's office, you really woke up when Jamboy's got onto his cross. 
That was yeah. so cool to watch. <laughs> it's nice to see me wake up in the morning. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I mean that honestly. It was like it was night and day because I was watching a little bit right when I was leaving, and then when I was on my way back, I got to see a little bit of the Jam Boys Cross, and you were there. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Everything that I would have said and started screaming about you got there. That was so cool nice. to see. <laughs> so let me ask you, what is your opinion of uh, the toxicologist in the morning? I, so, I mean, after listening to Natalie, I it's kind of hard to have that very objective opinion because I was not as high on her. Um, but I thought she, she, did, I thought she did a good Bending job. Herself. And the whole time I was like, she's doing a good job. I wish she would have defended herself harder, faster. Earlier into the... Uh, yeah. She let them go. Is that a criticism of the witness or is that a criticism of the direct examination? Well, I mean... So what I was getting frustrated with is she was kind of like conceding yes that what a witness said was true and by by default by omission by not saying not pushing back and saying well if what he said is actually true well so what my frustration was cuz it's not really her job to do that because right. i as a lawyer and you as a legal scholar it, no i it's, it's the defense team's job to do it first they have to do that for her it's not oh, yeah. her job to do that yeah i just got past the point that they're not they weren't going to do that so then i was like you do it i, I was refreshingly surprised that she did push back i i was when she got there, mad she got car, literally screaming you're literally making the objections for the defense yeah. because they won't they just won't but when they did, they almost got ridiculed. Yeah. It was hurting them. And I'm sure they could see the jury, like, perk up. And I think Natalie made a very good point. And that's where I took a step back. And I was like, you know, look, this is not a jurisdiction that I practice in. Right. Maybe I should just eat a little bit of crow and say that this is not the way that things are done here. That could be the case. I think that's true. I mean, I think, well, but to, let's be fair to you and to me. We were both saying this is probably just a cultural thing from the very beginning. Yeah. Absolutely. And by the way, what the hell was it with Chamboy going over a dinner with her, I was like, that was weird. And he didn't even strange. really get. It. He, he he thinks he has this down home charm. He thought that was like working with the jury, man. Like I he thought, he, like he, he, it is. According to Natalie, it's not. It certainly wasn't according to Natalie, and it certainly according wasn't to Court TV, TV it's not. I Court TV has reporters saying as soon as he gets up, the jury puts their notebooks down. That's not good. No. That actually suggests to me. So you said Court TV. When he gets up, they put their notebooks down? A reporter from Court TV said that. That is really interesting to me because that almost makes me think that the jury has their mind made up. And yeah. maybe the defense doesn't have to actually work that hard. Maybe not. And sometimes... How do I phrase this carefully? Even though as a matter of law, a summary judgment was perhaps not warranted, and I'm giving the judge the benefit of the doubt, you still have a live jury in front of you. So even if as a matter of law, the case isn't over, if you know the case is over, don't fight so hard and Dude, I don't I, think that they need to 
one thing I wanted to ask Natalie is like, what's the um, community opinion of Mark Sanchez? Like, do they still remember the '98 case? Does it's everyone still think he did it? What's that? It's got to be garbage. Yeah. Sorry, I, did, that, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no. So no, but if it's garbage, it seems really hard for me to believe a jury just got to a summary judgment of acquittal. That's prosecution's case. But it was bad. It was a bad case. Let me ask you, if you, in your heart of hearts, okay? And again, I'm saying, so summary judgment is as a matter of law, and I can understand the judge not granting that. Oh, yeah. Why? I mean, this has been appealed too many times. <laughs> like, yeah. So the question then becomes... You have a jury of 16 people, 12 who are ultimately going to decide this. Mm -hmm. How hard do you think that you need to push reasonable doubt at this stage of the game? And I'll, I'll ask your opinion first before I give mine. So I would push to discredit because that that brings the jury back to reasonable doubt, right? To discredit, make sure you're discrediting the jailhouse uh, people. You have to discredit Klug to really bring the reasonable doubt into people's minds. Beyond that, I don't know if you have to do much. I don't think the jury gives a crap about the male pictures. Right. Well, and that's sort of my point is that if the jury is literally putting their notebooks down and don't actually want to hear what Jam Boys have to say, it's like, take the win. Yeah. Am I totally off base on that? I just, I don't know. I, I This is why I like having your opinion because... I. I I think I'm the more you from a purely legal perspective, you can like, bring. I would do it a little. I mean, I would put on a little bit of a case, but I'd be real. Like I, those videos, like they had to put filler in. That I doesn't help them. No, that doesn't help them. Um. Now the jury is walking. I, I, you might have been able to, to you, be bored. You might have been able to end it with your medical expert. I think they have to do a little bit more than just that. But what else do they have to do? they have to discredit they have to discredit some of these very suspect witnesses anyway. I mean, in my opinion, from if we're talking about a jury verdict, do they actually have to discredit anything? The answer is legally no. Legally no. But at the same time, what is the kind of thing that you would like to see? And you made the perfect point. And when I say discredit, it's put reasonable doubt in. But keep going, sorry. No, but you made the perfect point. Is you actually said it in as the ombudsman for the jury and the average person. You need to discredit clue. Okay. So pinpoint on. Those couple things that the jury might still be thinking about throw more uh, discreditation, for lack of a yeah. better term, into their minds. It's almost like, I hate to use the term, but it's like throw shade on them. Yeah. yeah have, have the defense, uh, have the jury saying he might have been telling the truth, but he might not have. Well, that's reasonable doubt. And that's on what you do. And that's exactly how you draft a close. Mm -hmm. Is if you have the way that you draft a close, technically the legal standard standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you have doubt, if you have ideas about mul this is where I go back to the prosecution presented multiple theories. If you're not sure which one of those it is then the state hasn't met its burden. Yeah. 
that's you don't need a whole lot more than that. Yeah, well, and from like that witness is um, the doctor. I wish I knew the doctor's last name. I suck. Do you? A chance? I need to start using my handy dandy notebook. Um, I was. I was. You were driving. <laughs> um, we're talking about the Emmy from day two. No, today's. Um, Dude, today's I wasn't here for that. I wasn't here yeah. for that. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Um, I mean, when when he made that chart and said could be this and could be that. And he had things on both oh, sides. Dude, when, when and she he, was like, that's reasonable doubt, bro. <laughs> that was pretty good. You missed it because I think you stepped away. But my background is I was four credits shy of an economics degree. And I ended up going with poli sci because Cal 2 screwed me over. When he started trying to compare a well, I medical was, to chart economic, I was listening. to supply and demand curves, I literally wanted to lose my mind. I have a bit. Uh, my my, my uh, undergrad is in business marketing from one of the best business schools in the country. <laughs> I was a little bit like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> Wait, you went to the UPenn? I said one of them. <laughs> All right. But no, so Emory, I think, is the second best business school in the country. It's, it's not always. It's like a top 20. But I took... I, gonna, I took No, Emory, Emory actually is a uh, top five. No, I meant my school is like a top 20. It's not really no. the best. Emory uh, uh, actually didn't beat Harvard when I was going to school there. Cool. But I was doing business there. All right, let me uh, get Kara's but, super. But it's real. economics 101. So, like, we've all taken that economics class. And yes, what he was explaining like, from economics was pretty much right. That is, that is, but it has nothing to do with. <laughs> that is microeconomics 101. Yeah, that's all that was. So, Kara, thank you very much for the $5 super chat. Word for the wise. Dance as if nobody is watching. Actually, you know what? If you have a little bit more liquor, I think this is a toast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do I need to go get more liquor? All right. One more. It's tequila, so I can only have one more, but I'll go do it real quick. That's fair. <laughs> I'll be right back. But this is a toast. And Kara, thank you very much. While Cole goes and receives his alcohol, thank you very much. This is absolutely a toast. All right, and Kara, let's do this. I actually do like this. Dance as if nobody is watching. Email as if it will definitely be read aloud in disposition of court. In disposition. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Dude, how do you only have tequila? That's all I have in my house right now. Dude, the Jensen's had a better wet bar than you do. Yeah, I have a better looking wet bar. <laughs> they had better dash. I gotta go to Costco, man. I just haven't been to Costco. Um, all right. So to go back to the original point, and once again, thank you, Car. Thank you, Car. That was, that's a pretty good quote. And I think that it is an interesting and still resounding case that they have as it relates to trying to prove the actual course of the decedent's demise. They have not gotten there. They haven't. So it, but it's crazy because if I if I just look at it from like take our like take any knowledge of the law out of it and I just look at it like I'm watching a twenty twenty documentary, this dude freaking did it. Every circumstance points to him. 
But they couldn't get there. But, but you can't get, get there. And I don't know what, if it's their fault. Though. What would you, like, given the facts you know, what would you have done to get there? I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have charged the case. You wouldn't have charged it because you can't. You would have been like, you got away with murder, bro. What is the title of the freaking video? I know. I know. It's. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding about this. And, I, and it's kind of like you got away with murder by being an idiot. Yeah. It's not like it was super sophisticated. He didn't get away with murder by being an idiot. He got away with murder because he did it in the right jurisdiction. Okay, so what would have been different if he would have done and, the exact same thing in a diff- in a better jurisdiction? I, for one, the medical examiner might have had an actual scale to yep. weigh the body. <laughs> okay, yep. The police, a good detective team would have probably been able to connect him to some antifreeze. You would think so. They probably wouldn't have grabbed the Playboys. They probably would have grabbed the bottles of antifreeze. They got so hung up on sex so quick, dude. Like, And, and it's not was, just one of them. So it's that weird. was one of the interesting things that Natalie was saying is because it is a relatively uh, culturally conservative jury pool, mm-hmm. they thought that was enough. That's what it is. Okay. I mean, Kenosha, Wisconsin's not as conservative as it was in 1998. I'll tell you that. Well, and that's part of what I'm saying is that the retrial, I think that Jamboys is still speaking to a 2008 or... Uh, still, 2008. I keep saying 98, but the trial was in 2008. You're right. He's still speaking to a th- 2008 jury when that's not what your jury pool is anymore. No. And I'm wondering if that's the misstep that he's making. If you if you wanted, and people ask, like... Just by his jokes, I think you're right. The way he thinks he's talking to people, it probably worked back in the day. Although he did get beat out in elections and stuff, too, so I don't know. No, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that he was fantastic the first time around, either. But... I think he genuinely believes that he's still talking to a 2000 jury, or at the very least, whenever he retired, which I think was like 2010 or some odd. Bro, Luke, Luke's been here for like every minute of this damn trial. My man, (laughs) I am so sorry that you missed Wisco. She was here and she will be here, or at least she said she will be here tomorrow. So hopefully you'll be able to get your questions in because I know you have plenty of questions and she would love to answer them. And I'm pretty sure she was the hurdle or the the help that I needed to get over the hurdle that I've been having of getting Nate on. I think we're at photo chat on now too. But you think that's going to happen tomorrow? I'm pretty confident in that. All I right. don't know if tomorrow. Um, well, maybe I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's kind of his reason, but. I think we're having him on. And I, it, it very well could be tomorrow. Well, that was my whole thought is that when you uh, went dark, my thought was that you were getting in touch with him and trying to coordinate that. I was, but also picking up my kids at the same time. Well, I mean, you know, potato, potato. <laughs> you know, get somebody out on YouTube and make sure my kids aren't stranded. We Priorities. Natalie was fantastic. I don't think she really knows how good she is on. I YouTube. don't. I I agree with you. She is absolutely fantastic, and she is above and beyond. Because look, if you had asked me six months ago, I had said this before. I'll say it again. I am generally speaking an introvert. I do not like being in front of people. Public speaking is not necessarily my problem, but if you had asked me six months ago that I'd be doing a YouTube channel, I would have told you you were out of your fucking mind. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Um, 
So I'm I'm to the point where I'm confident in saying Photo Chad will be on with us at some point in the next couple of days of this trial. Mm-hmm. Right. There's a very good chance it will be tomorrow as well. So if it's tomorrow or if it's uh, in the days to come, we got time. But I am not I mean, I'd like to speak to him sooner and later because he's the one watching the jury. Natalie has people inside giving her information. I want his opinion on how the jury's responding to the case because he's been there literally from the beginning. And so he can see how the jury received the prosecution's case. I would love that perspective. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I trust him way more than a court TV reporter. Yeah, I, I, I have no idea how to extract that other than through him. So that yeah. would be fantastic because it would give a whole new color to the commentary that we're giving. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the it, I'm literally guessing based upon whether they pick up or put down their books, their notebooks, depending upon whether it's the direct or cross when it comes to these witnesses. And by the way, if somebody is putting down their books for a cross, in a lot of circumstances, your answer is they might have made up their mind. Yeah. So I don't know what to do with that. So I'll kick it back over to you. What are you looking forward to in the next few days? Or whatever you want to say. I'm looking forward to no more videos. Um, I, I don't know what else I need to hear from the defense. I, I, I have this weird feeling that like they have one more expert. Is this one more expert going to come on and say it was suicide, period, end of story? I So I'll put it oh, from I said the perspective. I'm hoping that the final expert is you going that. to be... A psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. I'm. That's what I'm hoping. But they brought her psychiatrist on already. Psychologist. Her psychologist from '91. But again, psychologist. That's a psychologist. There is a difference. There's a difference. Besides, I, trust me, I go to both. <laughs> uh, well, that is more information than anyone needed to know. <laughs> I'm hoping they bring on the psychiatrist. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Because they brought on her psychologist who... And the Ouroboros. Because they set it up very nicely. The psychologist and this is the family psychologist talked about the family situation, talked about the talk therapy situation. I am hoping they bring the psychiatrist in to speak to the medical effect of the materials she was prescribed. Yeah. And that would, yeah, you have to do that. That would close the loop. And I know I keep, I I I keep using that um, aphorism, but they have not done that so well before. That's what I would like to see. No, I 100% with you. So, um, yeah, because yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm actually not shy about it. I take mental health meds and my psychiatrist works very hard to make sure that I don't have a combination that's going to cause a problem. And it would be very interesting to hear somebody talk about that. Yeah, and I, I think that's what you need. I, I talked the other day about the triad of mental health care. Mm-hmm. At least in a perfect circumstance, you have the psychologist, psychiatrist, and the social worker all working together to bring somebody to a functional state. Yeah. And that is, in a perfect world, the way that it works. Unfortunately, in multiple medical systems that I am familiar with, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, it almost becomes like a fight over who gets the biggest piece of that pie. That's and interesting. We, we, can, we need to talk about that more at some point. You Well, you lose sight of the patient. I mean, I'll tell you that psychologists and psychiatrists absolutely fight over that. Oh, yeah, they do. To a certain point where psychologists are telling Unless the right what to prescribe. And it's like, hey, hang on. You never actually went to med school. So slow your roll. But unless you get the right thing. Happens. And then but you also have you have some psychologists out there that are like anti med. Yeah. So it can go both ways. And, and you have psychiatrists out there that are like meds are the only way um that you don't do they don't they don't see a triad and i think that's the pie you're talking about like right there well that's that's exactly why the triad is important but yes there it is and i've actually seen that from a uh, legal perspective where you have psychologists testifying about medications and it's like hey hang on you yeah. don't actually have the right to prescribe so shut up and go away hey you don't even have the right to prescribe let let alone the expertise to do it precisely and no it's not necessarily a function of big pharma it really is an actual expertise because the difference between psychology and psychiatry is not small. We're not talking about a fine line. The difference is one is an academic profession. The other is a medical profession. Psychiatrists actually do go through all of the same medical training that every other specialist in medicine does. That's my what gives them the right to prescribe. My psychiatrist is MD, straight up. Yes, every psychiatrist by definition, it has to be an MD. Be an MD, like they or still a VA, potentially, but yeah, we don't need to go down that route. They they just chose an easier. <laughs> they chose the easiest residency. But <laughs> my point is that yes, every psychiatrist actually has to have a medical degree. No. Not every psychologist does. In fact, very many of them do not. Oh no. They... I mean, most of them still, like, even if they're a doctor, it's because they have a PhD. It's not because they have a MD. Well, so that creates its own issue. And this is kind of a little bit of a fun conversation because uh, I'm getting close to the last cigarette of the night. Um, but I'll throw it out there. Uh, it is interesting. If you have a PhD in psychology and you were operating in a clinical environment can you be called doctor yeah sure now let me ask you a question i am a doctor of jurisprudence mm -hmm. i have a professional higher level education degree can i present myself as doctor um, no. So, but let me take this a little step further. My brother's a pediatric oncologist. He would never, ever introduce himself as Dr. Hickman to anybody. It's just weird. <laughs> it's like, like most MDs don't go around calling themselves doctor. The people that do aren't actually doctors, <laughs> aren't medical doctors. I don't necessarily disagree with you. And I, look, as in common parlance, obviously I wouldn't. But I will tell you that the American Bar Association says that I can. Because oh, I absolutely do actually good. have a doctoral you degree. Have a, you have a JD. You're a doctor. Now, the weird I'm a thing, doctor though, of jurisprudence. The weird thing for you, though, is you get your J. You would still have to go back to get a master's. That would be a right? deal. Yeah. So like, the, like lawyers kind of have it backwards. They get the doctorate before the master's degree. 
So my point is um, the way that so the ADA describes it, it, and if I recall correctly, is if you don't use it in a format which would be confusing to potential client or patient, then that's okay. So technically, I am Dr. John O'Brien, but I would never do that. Instead, we use Esquire. Esquire, yeah. So it, it is really weird. And, and you use it at the end. Go ahead. You use Esquire at the end. Absolutely. It's a suffix. As it's most professionals it. should. So it was interesting. I was talking to Jay Michael when we did stream on that subject. And we were discussing this matter because you have folks that are doctors of nursing practice. Mm -hmm. Nurse practitioners, right? Not necessarily, but, you know. In or the they could be teachers. Way. They could be the academic side too, though, right? But they have PhDs in nursing. Mm -hmm. And they present themselves as doctors in a clinical setting. Oh, they absolutely do. Now, that does not make you a medical doctor. It doesn't. So we need to either do something about that to differentiate it, because that can absolutely confuse a patient. Well, but it's not. So I'm going to put. And I would say bit. specifically so in the mental health environment, when somebody comports themselves as I'm doctor so and so. Do they know that they have a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Probably not, particularly when they're in a mentally uh, compromised situation. But most PhDs of psychology aren't actually out practicing. You want to bet? You think they are? I've seen it. Huh. Literally. I've I thought, dealt with I cases were, associated. I thought they were all teaching. Interesting. But so no. let me play devil's advocate on this doctor thing real quick. Yeah, go ahead. And it is, it, it, I genuinely, genu genuinely agree with you. But let me play devil's advocate. It's actually not the academic structure's fault that someone who got a doctorate in medicine became colloquially called a doctor. That's why. If and therefore, if every noticed, other doctorate gets screwed. If you've ever noticed on my channel, when I refer to a medical doctor, I refer to them as a physician. Yeah. I also, I just say. I don't refer to them as doctors. I just, yeah, I just also say MD. Oh, there's, that's fair. But if you notice, I am very that's careful good. when we're talking about medical practitioners who have gone through medical school and have received their doctorate in medical science, I refer to them as physicians. I don't refer to them as doctors. Because it's not like the medical profession came up with doctor and then academia came in and stole it no, for their all. highest level. It's the opposite. Well, that's well, not really the opposite, but that's why I am careful about how I refer to folks. There is a difference between, so for instance, there was a great example this morning, and I wish I was here for this. So the toxicologist is actually a physician. Yeah, she is. She, but she's an ER doc. Yes. And see, yeah. I just used a very colloquial term, but. That's what she is. But here's the thing is you don't actually have to be a physician to be a coroner no. in many jurisdictions. Because what what are you going to do? You're going to screw Save up and undead life. them? Yeah. <laughs> do I no mean, harm. <laughs> at that point, we're just going to call you a necromancer. I mean, do they have to live by like the do no harm <laughs> principle? Neither do actual physicians anymore, unfortunately. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath? No, no, sorry. Hippocratic Oath, right? Hippocratic Oath. My brother, and I mean, my brother still takes that shit so seriously. You don't actually have to do that in white lab ceremonies anymore. 
Like he did. He's old though, so good for him. He's he's almost as old as me, so maybe that's why. Yeah, good for him. But uh, apparently, they do not require the Hippocratic Oath in the white coat ceremony. And the for those who don't know, would you like to explain? Because it's your brother. Yeah. So the white coat ceremony is more like um, kind of like a cult ceremony. No, it's it's so when you're in medical school, um, when you actually enroll in medical school. Oh God, I don't. You might you explain it because I don't even know the reason why they're actually allowed to wear white coats at the point they are. So I've always been confused by that. You you explain it, John. Sure. No. So the whole idea is that in the same way where I refer to folks as physicians as opposed to doctors when they're in the medical capacity is the white coat is very similar to in law school, where when you graduate, you get a licensure and you get... Right, but they get the... Originally, it was the order of the quaff, but that now became an honorific for people over a certain title. But the whole idea is that there is some sort of garb that is associated with your having graduated from a certain professional school. first year it goes back to first, the guild, your it, first year of medical it goes school back to the guild system that's the part that i've never understood is they get it after their first year of medical school yeah it goes back to the guild system we've invited you and we've accepted you into the guild okay and by the way not for nothing there's a reason why there is a separation between clinical medicine and surgery because medics or uh, physics, physicians, which were physics at the time, whatever. That goes back to the Hippocratic Oath, because one of the rules of the Hippocratic Oath is that I will never cut to the stone. So it was actually the Guild of Barbary, which is where we get our current barbers from, that actually practiced surgery. It was not physicians. Yeah. Look, words change, man. So one side of the industry operated in physics, which were... Yeah, physics. Yeah. Where we're dealing with medicine. We're not dealing with actually cutting people open because it was actually against the oath under the original idea of physics. <laughs> or at least this is the way this was interpreted. You're exactly right. Because my brother had to make my brother had to make a huge choice of studying tumors for the rest of his life or being able to cut. That right. Is, that's how he phrases it. And he decided to study tumors because that's what he really loves. But he also really wanted to cut. <laughs> but he can't ever. Well, this is exactly why we have the separation between physics and surgery. And it all goes back to an entirely medieval theory of medicine. But we still use it because it works. It does work. And that is fair. I mean, what is one of the strangest forms of... Uh, non-invasive medicine is probably uh, anesthesia because you are literally bringing somebody to the brink of death using medicine so that the barber or the surgeon can do what they need to do. I might not understand anesthesia as well as I thought I did because I don't... How are you bringing them to the brink of death? That's exactly what, what do you think anesthesia is? Like you're just, I don't We're administering a poison to bring you to the brink of death. And then we know that we have the ability to bring you back. Okay, I guess. But I mean, I guess we could say going out and getting drunk is the same thing. Yeah, and by the way, battlefield medicine, if you go back to Civil War age, they would give you a couple shots of whiskey and then saw your leg off. Yep. That was the that's, basis of anesthesia. 
I mean, what do you think the basis of dentistry was? Much. Medieval yeah, interrogations. <laughs> you freaking, you paid attention to school, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is why people come and watch. You read too many and, books. <laughs> I, I know things. You know what things. was the old uh, Tyrion Lannister? I drink and I know things. I drink but, and I know things. I drink and think I know things. But no, the entire basis of dentistry was originally a form of torture. And they're like, oh, shit, this might help. <laughs> they're like, we tortured the crap out of the guy, and now his teeth are straight. <laughs> but, by the way, not for nothing, uh, when you look at, next time you go to the barbershop, blue, red, and white. White was yep. for shaving. Blue was for... Uh, hair cutting and red was for bloodletting. For blood Bar blood the, the Barber's Guild was the original surgeons of the medieval world. world. Holy moly. So they cut hair and saved lives? So they did. They probably didn't save that many lives, but they at least attempted to. Um, and Kara, you make a very interesting point. <gasps> My dad had that happen to him. It is actually not uncommon that people wake up during anesthesia, and you know what you do? You put them back under, and nine times out of ten, they just forget that they ever woke up in the first place. Yeah, my dad remembers it. It's crazy. It is a very weird world that we live in, and so this is why it's fun to have the conversation with you all. You want to know my weird world? Christmas Fire. this year Fire away. was at in in Iowa at a pediatric oncologist's house. My brother and the family that came in were my parents and my two aunts. They're married, one of whom is an anesthesi anesthesiologist. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of medical in my family. Hi. I'm. Not and the other one's a nurse practitioner. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Dude, if this is you after two shots of tequila, my man, I'm we gotta know. get a drink at some point. <laughs> my face is red. I I drink a lot. It's just the tequila's getting me. Uh, no, go good. ahead. No, let's do that last cigarette so I don't embarrass myself. Yeah, finish your thought, and I will light the last cigarette. So, no, I was just saying, like, my Christmas is full, it was full of medical people, and you all brought up. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, last cigarette. So, to those who are still here this evening, this is the last cigarette. We have Cole a little bit drunk. He has been so kind. Oh, that, okay, that's a stretch, but <laughs> maybe um, wasn't. Shut up. <laughs> He has been so kind to cover stream this morning. So with Cole's permission, I am going to apply the same rules that I always have. As long as this is within relatively decent conversation and within our ability to answer, the floor is open to you. And I will, at that point, let Cole... Please answer the rest of that story. Well, I think I told the story. There wasn't much of a story. It was just a stupid comment. <laughs> I have a lot of medical people in my family. Like You guys brought up anesthesiology. I'm like, well, I know an anesthesiologist. By the way, I also know a cardiologist and a rhythmist. I know, yeah. Well, you worked in... Med mal, man. <laughs> I have a PI lawyer that would absolutely love to come on at some point if it was appropriate. Yeah, I do that. Hey, guys, this is the whole point. I'm lighting it right now.
This is your opportunity to ask anything that you would like. And if not, we'll just have our own conversation. I'll just talk more <laughs> randomness. So oh, cool. <laughs> what a, what would you like to see tomorrow? Because clearly, I think that they have an expert coming in as it relates to Monday. I'm hoping that is psychiatry expert to try and prove what they were suggesting about self deletion. So what we're starting. We're starting tomorrow morning with an expert. We are. Yep. So uh, do we know who she is? No, I certainly don't. I you've convinced me. I want to, I want a psychiatrist on the stand. I do too. And I'm wondering who this ringer is going to be. And I'm actually wondering if maybe they might wrap by Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. I think they said they would at the very end today. They were kind of going over schedule. And it sounded like it could be as early as Monday, probably Tuesday. That's what I'm genuinely wondering because I don't think that they need to do a whole lot. And then the prosecution said their rebuttal case is going to be short, which is crazy to me because I feel like if they bring on a psychiatrist, if the defense brings on a psychiatrist, the state should have to would need to bring on a psychiatrist to rebut. Uh, not necessarily, but yes, generally speaking, that would be appropriate practice. Um, give me Did one second, sweet. John Boy just thinks he's smart enough to like. He really thinks he can cross experts as an expert. Like, he's, it's wild. all right. So, are we yellow or green? We are. Man, let me. We are yellow. However, I would like to point out to you all that every single stream that we have done this entire trial has been turned back to green. So I have no idea what the hell is going on with YouTube. Um, and it's probably going to go back to green the second that I turn it over the other way. The second that he gets my face off the screen, it'll go green. I always thought it was me because we were green entirely until I joined. So when you were running the channel, nobody had a problem, apparently. Well, I did something you decided not to do. I feel terrible about that. That felt good. Um, let's see. What do we get? All right, I'm going to go back forward. Uh, yeah, Anthony, I think you're absolutely right that it's a small firm. It's a small creator issue. And they're just making it difficult. Unfortunately, yeah, I've heard that too. But you know what the flip side is? Is that they flip it back on Almost the minute that I say that the stream, the broadcast is over. And so there's got to be something else going on there. I just don't know what. I You brought up a very technological explanation maybe a week ago when we were texting. And I still think that might be it. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, I know how to run bots and... That actually made a very made a lot of sense. So CCW, ladies, it is a pleasure always to see you. As every time it's Mr. John, I know it's one of Hanar Jill. Yeah. Um if the defense could only address one last most important issue to make their case, what do you think it would be? That is a beautifully phrased and really good argument. Um, I'm going to toss it to both of you guys before I give my answer. because I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm still in your answer. Psychiatrists to show that this combination of drugs was very much bound for a self-deletion result. 
Krak, you want to weigh in? I'm going to take that as a no. Yeah, you still may answer. I I'm mean, sorry. No. when you make great arguments, I can't, like, make a stupid argument <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not criticizing you for that. Um, if I were to give another argument, yeah, they started with the self-deletion theory in the opening. So I'm a little bit stuck with that. I am too. So if I were to give an alternative to what Cole said. Or maybe an add-on. I think what I would like to see is a really, really strong, robust argument on the basis of beyond a reasonable doubt. I would like them to actually go through that in this way. But if you're asking in a purely factual context, I don't think that the prosecution did a darn thing to actually disprove that theory of the case. And I would like the prosecution to demonstrate that the prosecution has been reaching over and over and over again to create three different theories of how the decedent uh, left this earth. Well, somebody's not happy with you. I told her she could come on and say hi, and she decided to the wave of garbage can big over. Yeah, no, I think you're right on that. I think you're right on that. So that was the last smoke of the evening. Uh, we hey, I don't know if back. this was H or J, though. It's supposed to be Dr. John. No, this is definitely <laughs> H and J because Mr. John is always one of the girls. H and J, he goes by Dr. John. He's a doctor of jurisprudence. Only kidding. Great job, girls. You guys asked a great question. And I'm only kidding about that. And they are, they are for their ages, they are absolutely brilliant. Yep. I wouldn't expect anything else from CCW Street, though. No, that's fair. That is a very good point. All right, folks. So that was the end of my last smoke. Um, oh, man. Yeah, I don't know if you're still here. Yes, I am still here. Would you like to plug yourself, and then I'm going to let Cole do it, and then I'm going to give my goodbye for the evening. Okay, I am Lord Crocus Squirrel. You can find me at the YouTube channel of the same name, or at Crocus Squirrel on Twitter. Um, drop by for live streams, hang out every once in a while. We do that at least twice a week. We'll, we might get one. We might have one sometime here soon over there. Well, we talk about all kinds of stuff over there, not just the video games. So, <coughs> and once I've had a chance to go over my notes, I might actually have something to say about the Jensen trial too. I'll invite, I, you know, you two are actually welcome to drop in every once in a while if you want to. Anytime you want to fire over a link, I'm happy to drop in. Obviously, well, I'm kind of locked in this one for now, but certainly over the weekend. I'd be happy. I'm to. not the one that uses StreamYards. I use Discord. So, um, yeah. All right. We'll get. I, we'll I'm get there. Ask you how to use Discord. <laughs> huh? That's interesting. I literally. It took me a month and a, it took me two and a half months to set up a PayPal. So. <laughs> yeah, I set the PayPal up in ten minutes. Yeah. I can set you up with Streamlabs in less time. Your Discord. We'll get to that. <laughs> All right, so Cole, please uh, plug yourself. Yep. Uh, if you are all here, all of you all that are still here know who I am. I appreciate you all. Thanks for being here all day with me, and we'll see you guys tomorrow morning. That's my plug. They've, they've already that was, subscribed. That was really those, that, those that are here have already subscribed. Probably. but And I thank yeah. you all for it. If right, you folks. want to. Head on over to Trial Junkie. Anthony just dropped the link in the chat. 
go do it. All right, folks, from my perspective, thank you all for hanging around while we had the uh, after hours conversation on the Jensen trial. And thank you for being here. We know that there's another trial ongoing and there are another there are a number of other law tubers that are handling that. It is a pleasure to see you here every time and for always. Thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow morning, hopefully with Cole and Croc. You're always welcome. Okay. Um, Just send me a link. I'll drop in. All right. And we will see you guys tomorrow. I apologize that I was not available this morning, but I always will be here. And it is a pleasure to see each and every one of you. And we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Peace. Bye, everyone.